State Postal Inspector Service, uh, Rupert Wilson from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. I am Kevin Blake, will be live streaming in through Zoom, and Mr. Michael Gorey is running late, so I'm making apologies for him, but he will be joining us during the course of the discussion. Uh, just a reminder to panelists, uh, once you're finished speaking, please turn off your mics. Only two pan mics can be on at the same time. For audience members, I'm going to ask that you wait until the panelists have finished presenting to ask your questions and to keep your questions short and to the point, please. And given the nature of the panel, please try to refrain from asking questions that might be too sensitive for them to answer. Thank you. Mr. Greenwich. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dolan Greenwich. I'm the country attache for the Drug Enforcement Administration, Kingston Country Office. Um, to give you a little bit of my background, um, I've been a criminal investigator with the Drug Enforcement Administration for 23 years. I spent six years in our Washington Division office, four years here as one of um, five agents from 2006 to 2010. Um, I was reassigned to our Baltimore District office where I um, promoted and I was a supervisor from 2010 to 2017. And then I got the opportunity to come back here as a supervisor for the office here. And I've been here for the last five years as a country attache. Good, one, good morning, everyone. My name is Dominic Riley. I'm the country attache for the United States Postal Inspection Service. Just a little bit about my background. I started my career in federal law enforcement with the United States Secret Service as a special agent assigned to the U.S. President. Uh, I transferred over to the U.S. Postal Inspection Service in 2007, and I've been a postal inspector since that time. I've been in Jamaica since 2017 as the country attache, um, and I am here focused on lottery scams. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Rupert Wilson. I'm the uh, RCMP liaison officer for uh, Jamaica and uh, the Cayman Islands. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to take part in this uh, discussion this morning. Um, I'm just going to try to keep my comments brief so it, it opens more time for questions and discussions. Um, as I mentioned, um, for those of you who don't know, the RCMP in Canada is the federal police force, and we play uh, two primary roles, one of frontline policing, and then the second of is to enforce federal mandates uh, uh, in Canada, for example, the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. The uh, uh, international policing uh, falls within the federal mandate. Number of five and um, so the RCMP international policing program addresses the transnational scope of crime by building relationships with inter international policing partners and by participating in Interpol and Europol uh, global information sharing networks. Uh, as the liaison officer here in Jamaica, I work in partnerships with Jamaican law enforcement agencies and other international uh, enforcement agencies based in Jamaica. Uh, my role is to be a link between uh, law enforcement agencies in Canada and Jamaica uh, in order to facilitate bilateral cooperation to advance criminal matters and uh, that have a Canadian or Jamaican uh, nexus. Uh, some, of my, some of my functions include uh, to facilitate um, major Canadian investigative inquiries that involve Jamaica, uh, to develop, maintain, and exchange criminal intelligence between the RCMP uh, Jamaican law enforcement agencies, uh, to provide assistance to Jamaican agencies' investigations that affect Canada, uh, cooperate and assist Canadian law enforcement employees traveling to Jamaica on uh, official business. Um, also to help coordinate training and uh, capacity building initiatives. And finally, to deliver operational results in line with the RCMP strategic uh, investigational priorities. And I just want to touch on that in regards to the transnational crime. The RCMP has designated 
uh, four priorities as its strategic priorities. The first being focus on serious and organized crime. Um, so, for example, uh, targeting um, drug trafficking organizations, upon motorcycle gangs, traditional organized crime, uh, human trafficking, and illegal migration. Uh, the second focus would be uh, financial integrity, which looks at uh, money laundering. Uh, third, cyber threats. And then finally, uh, national security, which looks at uh, high-risk travelers, foreign fighters, and radicalizations. So that's just kind of a, an overview in terms of my role and our, as the RCP, our strategic uh, priorities. Um, and I'll just leave it there for now. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Blake. Uh, you can go ahead and introduce yourself, please. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Unfortunately, I couldn't join live. I'm out of country on vacation. However, I'm very um, I'm excited to be here and be able to participate in this conference. Um, <clears throat> I'm Kevin Blake, Dr. Kevin Blake. I have a PhD in um, technology in sustainable development with a um, focus on technology and law enforcement. I've been serving the Jamaica Constable Air Force for 20 years. I'm a Deputy Commissioner of Police with a responsibility on our force development and transformation, basically, of the Jamaica Constable Air Force and also technology. Um, I've worked in the past, significant, I've done significant work in the past with um, building out um, collaborative relationship with different um, um, countries and law enforcement agencies um, in different countries. We have worked significantly in preparing the region for critical work up in 2007, where we have um, provided uh, significant support in the area of technology and intelligence and information sharing. Um, I have some amount of experience understanding of the global space and law enforcement and security as it as it changes within the global space. I hope that um, I can contribute to this um, discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, when Mr. Gore comes, I'll just have him do a brief introduction of himself. However, I'm just going to get into it. I'm going to ask each of the panelists uh, what trends or and evolutions have you seen in your respective portfolios over the year as it relates to the transnational crime that affects both the U.S. and Jamaica? I, um, back in 2015, the Colombian government had signed a peace agreement with the FARC. That was the um, leftist group that they were at war with for the past 30 years. One of the stipulations um, in the peace agreement was that they were going to stop doing aerial eradication of the coca plant and they will give farmers who would traditionally, traditionally grow coca leaves um, the opportunity to grow um, other produce. Um, when they signed that agreement, um, the Colombian government was not able to follow through in compensating the farmers of give, or giving them um, alternatives to growing the coca leaves. Since then, 2015, there has been a record amount of coca and cocaine being produced over the last seven years. Each year, there has been a record amount of cocaine. Um, if you look at some of the trends globally, you'll see record um, cocaine seizures. Um, it's impacting Jamaica. When I got here in 2017, the price of a kilo of cocaine, which is 2.2 pounds of powder, was 10,000 US. Right now, today, cocaine on the market in Jamaica, a kilo of coke is going for 6,000. For me, that's an indicator of the amount of cocaine that's flooding the island and flooding the region. Um, based on some of the, um, the trends in the intel that I'm seeing, there's a number of Colombian cells that have set up um, in Jamaica. Uh, when I was here during my first tour, um, working closely with um, the Jamaican government, especially those that have a narcotics portfolio, we were very effective in dismantling some of those cocaine um, Colombian cells, moved them off the island, but they're back. 
Also in 2015, um, the Jamaican government has suspended um, their support of eradication of marijuana. Um, I believe, if I'm correct, when I checked, um, Jamaica grows over 15,000 hectares of marijuana annually. Um, the trend that we're seeing is um, transnational criminal organizations that did not have the monetary capital to actually get in the drug trade have accessible amounts of marijuana. Uh, Haiti, to the Bahamas, to um, Costa Rica. We see boat to boat transfers with Honduras as well as Colombia. For us, um, we see that crime is cyclical. So it goes in cycles. It, you see, we used to see the criminals getting money in the mail, which is how the U.S. Postal Inspection Service got involved in lottery scamming investigations. And then we would were able to stop that in, in a sense, and then it moved to green dot cards. And then we were able to stop that in a sense, and then it moved to the remittance companies. And then it started going to money muling, and it went from money muling into putting it into containers, shipping containers, and it, and it went to other things, and it just keeps going in a cycle. Criminals are always ahead of law enforcement. They're always ahead of the laws that are put in place. So it's hard for us to to stop everything that we're trying to do because criminals don't have any bounds. They don't have to worry about making sure that the laws are followed and making sure that we have the evidence to do what we need to do. So that's part of our problem. Um, those are some of the trends that we see, and we just try to stay ahead of the game or, or catch up to the game. Uh, the money game in, in Jamaica is strong, and we just have to keep fighting. Uh, I would just like to follow on uh, with both uh, my colleagues have uh, talked about. Um, I know for us, we see a lot more collaboration between uh, organized crime groups. Uh, historically, in the past, uh, uh, organized groups would work uh, individually amongst their their own, but now we see a collaboration of of uh, different groups working together um, to uh, increase profit, specifically when it comes to uh, drug trafficking. Um, as Dolan mentioned, you have Colombia, uh, Colombians working with Mexicans who in turn work with cells in, in, in uh, Canada and the U.S. and all across the world uh, to facilitate uh, the movement of narcotics uh, to the various markets around the world. Um, so as law enforcement, that's, we need to also, again, work together, uh, collaborate, because um, uh, as Dominic says, the, the criminal uh, organizations, they're not bound by borders or legislation. Um, so if for us to keep up and stay pace with them, we need to uh, collaborate, share information in terms of current trends, uh, just to be able to keep pace with uh, the, uh, these criminal organizations. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Blake, I'm going to pose it slightly, the question slightly different to you, um, especially given your background in IT. Uh, I know cybercrime is also a huge transnational crime that is uh, evolving right now, but from the Jamaican perspective, uh, what are you seeing from the trans on the transnational front? Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, if you would permit me, though, I just want to weigh in on the discussion. I think it's interesting. Um, I, um, with respect to trends, I just want to pull us back a little, a few, um, at least actually two decades ago. Um, between the decade 20, 2001 to 2010, um, with the collaboration and the effort between our narcotics division of the Jamaica Conservative Air Force and the US DEA, we have um, significantly disrupted the, the flow of narcotics through our country. Um, this has been uh, was held by also the establishment of our counter narcotics and major crime task force operation team, which most people know it as that. Uh, <clears throat> and so what we're seeing is a trend moving away from through the Caribbean into um, the, the actual Mexican border. And so, likewise, there was a, a formation within Operation Kingfish called Operation Musketeer that had 
particular responsibility around illegal arms and ammunition. And significant work has gone down, um, and we have seen um, effective um, um, disruption through our control ports. And, and this was through collaboration with various um, law enforcement agencies within, particularly within Florida, places like the FDLE, ATF, DEA, and all um, facilitated through our consulate general office um, back then. And so when <clears throat> we have done all of that, we have seen a shift from our control ports where people utilize places like the mail and our shipping companies coming through our wars to our un uncontrolled ports, which is our sea, um, um, our coastline. What this has, has done is open up um, a realization of the opportunity um, that exists uh, between some other countries outside of the United States or getting weapons into the country through this. And I can go on and on. The, the, the point I'm making is, is that, as um, was mentioned earlier, the, the, the agility that is demonstrated by these um, organized crime groups requires similar type of agility from law enforcement. And so we have collaborated in the past, and we have seen significant um, successes, but the sustainability of these type of collaboration and these strategies that were put in place um, seems to need to be looked at. And our, our, our um, responsive we are in dealing with these types. And especially given the fact that, um, as, as one person mentioned this morning, that as soon as we tackle one particular type of um, crime, or transnational crime, something else emerged. Right? So we found a lot of scam emerging after um, the, the, the drug trade um, became less lucrative in the country. And so the challenge with these types of um, um, contemporary type transnational criminal activity is that they have usually have low barriers to entry, facilitated significantly by technology. And so persons, and it, and it poses significant challenge to law enforcement, um, um, even beyond the other types of traditional crime. Um, to establish a drug network or to be a drug kingpin, it requires some effort on the part of it. The, the, the players um, to become a lot of scammer, you need a phone and an accent and a will, and you operate from anywhere. And so, policing these spaces become far more um, more difficult. Um, the same is can be said for for cyber crime, um, as we the techno as we utilize technology more and more in what we do, which is a very important and necessary part of law enforcement, critical role and the advantages of using technology is 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 um, cannot be questioned. However, comes with it also is the vulnerability um, and also opportunities for criminal activities. We have long realized this as a as a um, an organization and as a country, and have made significant investment in not only looking at cybercrime investigation, but also cyber defense. Because as we move more and more into um, establishing technology um, apparatus and structure, we now need to protect that um, technology and stuff. So, and we have seen various, and as innovative as the um, traditional um, criminal operations are, you multiply that 10 times over, and that is the level of innovation when you touch things like cybercrime. And so it, it becomes far more um, difficult and, and hence requires a lot more investment on our part, um, which we are, um, we, we have um, um, taken very seriously and are looking at. In terms of collaboration with respect to cyber security, again, it provides, it, it requires it, 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 really, it emphasizes even more so the need for collaboration between law enforcement agencies because the ease at which crimes occur initiated in one country but effected in another country is far greater than the other types of traditional um, um, criminal activities. For example, um, um, cocaine and uh, drug trafficking, they have to physically move something. 
from one country to the next across borders with several obstacles for the, on the part of the criminals that they are getting through. And with cyber crime, everything happens in cyberspace. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I am going to open up the floor to questions before I pose my next question to the panelists. Does anybody have any questions right now? Okay, <laughs> Dr. Thorber. <laughs> Can I ask my 10 questions now or should I just ask one at a time? All right, so I'm going to go to Mr. Greenwich first. Um, the narrative we've been accustomed to about how the transnational drug trade is structured in Jamaica is uh, done of gangs in communities, uh, like the local uh, control center, and they work with Colombian cells or other transnational actors to basically run the business. But the work that Capri did on gangs a couple of years ago, and just my growing sense of the situation is that things are shifting or things have shifted. Um, and my impression is that the local gangs are less involved than they may have been, certainly up to I want to call it the benchmark of the end of Dudus. And I'm wondering what, how best do we understand what the structure is of the, how local actors uh, interact with the transnational actors. And then also, where is the U.S. in this? Because you talk about Jamaica, Colombia, Honduras, Costa Rica, Haiti. But I didn't hear where the U.S. comes into that structure, how they, how it's operated. So that's one. And then two, I promise I'll leave the others for later. Um, <laughs> how does the decriminalization of marijuana in Jamaica and the growing commercialization of the sector play into this new constellation and this new structure of the, of how drugs are being moved and how it's affecting also violent crime slash criminal violence, both here and in the U.S.? Two excellent questions. Um, there's a misconception that gangs in Jamaica controls the drug trade. It's a total misconception. A Colombian cartel member is not going to put 500 kilos of cocaine on a boat destined to Jamaica for a gang member. Always use the terminology of someone wearing skinny jeans with a bunch of tattoos. That's not how it works. Um, the drug trade in Jamaica is based on tiers. Your tier one cocaine traffickers are older, sophisticated men, businessmen. Some of them, some of them have done federal time and have made connections. Um, it takes a lot of coordination, a lot of contacts to reach out to Colombia, have a boatload of cocaine shipped to Jamaica. The infrastructure to bring it into Jamaica and then the infrastructure in place to target Canadian, U.S., and European markets. Gang members don't have that type of influence. They don't have that type of capital. Um, they don't have that type of organizational skills. Violence is bad for business. And so you will find, based on the intel and, and, and um, the time I've spent here, um, your, your average um, um, tier one cocaine dealer is 40 and older, um, much more disciplined, much more um, has influence to move drugs in and out of the country. Gang members, I consider them tier two traffickers. So when a big load comes in and it gets broken down, the intel that we see is you may find um, some of the gangs buying anywhere from five to 10 kilos of coke cane. Um, they tend to recruit couriers to get on commercial airplanes to move anywhere from a couple of ounces to a kilo to half a kilo. 
Um, there's no way in the world a Colombian organization is going to send 100 keys to Jamaica and wait for you or wait for an organization to smurf um, a quarter key of um, cocaine at a time into the United States. Um, the traffickers that I tend to target, that I mandate to target, they're not big producers of violence. Actually, they shy away from violence. Um, violence is necessary if you lose a load or someone get arrested or they suspect that someone is cooperating. But your tier one traffickers are your everyday businessmen that have the connections and mostly live a low-key lifestyle um, into construction. They own shopping plazas, many homes. Um, and so the trend that we've seen with gang members, um, gang members have, have capitalized on the guns for ganja trade. We see the boats that are headed, um, heading to either Haiti or to Colombia, um, trading marijuana for mm -hmm. um, firearms and ammunition, because basically it's the gang, um, the gangs itself that drives the market for firearms and ammunition. So there is a separation when it comes to um, whether or not the top tier cocaine traffickers are responsible for a lot of the um, the violence that you see, and we, we just we just don't see that from the intel um, um, that we're gathering here. As far as the decriminalization of of of, of marijuana, again, um, in 2015, I believe the um, we had this operation called Operation Buccaneer. It's an eradication program that I think goes back to um, the 1970s and the 1980s. Um, a collaboration between the United States government, DEA in particular, with the Jamaica Defense Force and the, and the Jamaican Constabulary Force, where we identify fields and mangroves that are growing marijuana illegally and do our best to eradicate as much as possible. Um, in 2015, when marijuana was decriminalized, um, I believe the Jamaica Defense Force has suspended their um, participation and uh, marijuana eradication. Um, the JCF had continued up until August of last year when um, the eradication team had a confrontation with one of the, um, the leaders of the Maroon. And since August of, of, of last year, the JCF has halted or suspended their um, um, support of eradicating. Um, for me, it, it makes a huge difference Again, with the availability of marijuana that can be traded for cocaine, for weapons, um, for ammunition. Again, for the people that don't have the monetary capital to actually buy a load of, of cocaine, they can put together 2,000 pounds easily and trade that for a couple of kilos or for some weapons and ammunition. As far as where um, the U.S. is or the DEA is in the, in, in the midst of this, I always tell people that um, the Drug Enforcement Administration was established in 1973 by President Richard Nixon. The Kingston, Jamaica country office for the DEA was opened in 1974. So we've always had a presence here working very closely with um, the law enforcement and the intel community. Thank you, Mr. Greenwich. That was a very thorough answer. Um, Ms. Satchel, do you have a question? Morning. You're, yeah, no, you're hearing me. I'm Nicola Satchel. I'm a Fulbright Scholar at the Binghamton University and lecturer at the University of the West Indies. I have two questions. The first, I've recently been uh, studying the dark web, and I noticed that we've had some ransomware uh, attacks in Jamaica, how prepared are we and how are the effective are the current mutual assistance program to actually deal with uh, the increase in attacks via the dark web? 
And secondly, uh, given some of the discussion and that question that was asked, how important is it that we think through legislation dealing with the production and distribution um, of marijuana? Since we are, we have decriminalized, uh, how important is it that we uh, tackle that end of the spectrum? Okay, I'm going to pose the first question to Dr. Blake. I think that's more appropriate for you. Okay, all right, thanks very much. Um, how prepared are we? Uh, things like like um, cybercrime, ransomware, stuff like that. Uh, these things are extremely dynamic. They change it. You have new um, um, types of viruses um, developing every day. Um, in terms of treating with it, we have to look at our our cyber defense capability. And I can assure you that in over the past um, couple of years, we have been embarking on some significant investment in establishing our security operation centers and our cyber defense, and um, huge investment in um, protecting our network uh, and stuff like that. Notwithstanding, I know there have been um, challenges, and you, will, you would have seen um, some of these breaches taking place. I can tell you, though, that um, from the perspective of the Jamaica Constabulary Force, um, we have a pretty significant capacity to quickly detect um, these things and to um, treat with them. And we have had um, several um, experiences in the past um, where uh, attempts have been made to, to breach um, our security. We also are investing significantly in the investigation capacity. Um, of, of um, these cyber cyber breaches, and so the, the, the tools that we use like um, are um, world class state of the art um, tools, uh, and so but the vulnerability still exists because, as I said before, in the field of um, cyber, it's extremely dynamic and something that it requires consistent learning, new version, new tools being developed. Um, and stuff like that, but um, significant attention is being placed on it. Again, I just want to make a point as well that because no agency is a silo, no sector, and especially in cyber, uh, the vulnerability of one agency may affect another. And so part of the effort is, is um, it's ensure that we have communication and collaboration and try to assist in strengthening other agencies that work Procedures and not necessarily government agencies, but also private sector, the banks, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and and things. So, um, yes, we are as prepared as we can be, and we continue to improve. Um, but notwithstanding, we there's still some amount of vulnerability, and there's always some vulnerability when it comes to cyber security. Thank you. Uh, while we're on that, I'm going to play devil's advocate, uh, Dr. Blake to have the kind of specialists that we need to maintain Jamaica's infrastructure and security as it relates to preventing cybercrime, making sure our entities are protected. Uh, we're losing a lot of our IT professionals to better paying jobs overseas, so how do we really address that brain gap that is occurring when we're losing those persons who we need to actually help us to secure our infrastructure? And, and you're perfectly correct. Um, people with the expertise in these fields are usually quite attractive um, to other entities and more lucrative um, sometimes um, offers and stuff. However, what we've done is, uh, let me first in the state that internally, where the JCF is concerned, I wish I could speak uh, more broadly on Jamaica because the issue of cyber cannot be spoken about um, around a single agency. Um, but we have an awesome responsibility um, in terms of investigation and defense. And, um, and so let me just speak with the Jamaica, uh, the Jamaica Constable, of course, um, for now. We do have highly skilled, very qualified individuals um, within our needs who have been serving the organization for many years. Um, we also work very closely with some of the world leading um, companies in the provision of these type of technology. In terms of maintaining and administering these technologies and the investigative component, yes, we do have people. 
one of the things that we do is to consistently um, do training and development of these persons and um, up to the certification, um, certific international certification levels. But we also have embarked on developing trainers internally. And that's one of the challenges that we faced um, um, some time ago with our, our CSCD. Uh, a number of our members left because we fell down slightly on developing our own internal training capacity um, to, to move these people, uh, to elevate and, and prepare other persons and things. So this is an environment and it is a reality that we face and that we have to live with. People will go uh, when one sometimes when invested, but we do have persons who have remained and we do have the requisite um, skill set to, to manage our infrastructure. Um, and much of what we do and much of what we have is 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 done by, or we have probably one of the most sophisticated network in the region, and all of this is administered and maintained by our own officers, and has been so for a um, number of years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Greenidge, I think the, um, Ms. Satchel's second question on legislation, but I'm going to pose it uh, in various forms to our three, our three panelists. Um, so after Mr. Greenwich responds to Ms. Satchel's question, uh, Mr. Ryle, I'm going to ask what legislation do you think needs addressing uh, to assist in addressing lottery scamming? And Mr. Wilson, yourself as well, what legislation would you want to see addressed to address any issues that Canada is having? Um, when it comes to legislating um, marijuana as a deterrent, um, we even see in the United States that it's no longer a priority. So I, I, it would be unfair for me to say that um, Jamaica can legislate its way out of the issue when it comes to prosecuting marijuana cases because even the United States, um, you know, federal prosecutors um, are not prosecuting marijuana cases. Um, you know, we have a number of states that have um, legalized um, marijuana. Um, it's, it's a multi-pronged approach. Um, strong legislation, um, solid prosecution, solid cases. You know, me as an investigator, I always say that it's a fancy term, but I'm just an evidence collector. My job is to collect enough evidence for a successful prosecution. So when I do my job, I turn it over to the prosecutor. The prosecutor's job is to take all the evidence I collected and get a conviction, and then it's up to a judge to um, pose a stiff enough sentence to um, be a deterrent on the macro or the micro level. Um, but again, as far as marijuana is, is, is concerned, I think globally the, the perception of marijuana as a dangerous drug has um, changed. Um, there are far more um, dangerous drugs out there that's consuming um, most of the globe, mainly the United States. Um, again, I, I, I wouldn't sit here and say that Jamaica can legislate um, its way um, out of making um, marijuana trafficking a deterrent. Um, but I do believe a multi-pronged approach in eradication and um, aggressive, aggressive um, enforcement for those that traffic marijuana. I want to first start off by giving a success story. So July of 2021, Jamaica instituted extradition reform. That took extradition from a two to three year process to a 90 day process, which has been a huge benefit to not only prosecutions in the U.S., but to Jamaica, because now you have criminals who are coming off the island within a matter of 90 days. Um, that is an example of what legislative action can do. The one thing that I would say that we would need in addition to extradition reform is, as Dolan was speaking about, is evidence. So we need to make sure that we have the best evidence that we can to prosecute the cases 
and actually prosecute the cases, not just bring them before the courts, but prosecute them, which is key. And in that, I would say the Interception of Communications Act is something that we could look at reforming because at, at the current state that it's in, there are three people who sign off on whether or not we can get telephone records or IP addresses, and that's the Commissioner of Police, the Director General of MOCA, and then the Head of Narcotics. Um, so when you have that higher level of authority, your lower level officers and detectives, they're not willing to put in the paperwork in order to go to that, that high. So that we need someone delegated a little lower so that we could get that information back from the telephone companies, mostly Flow and Digicel. What, how does that affect us? So let's just say we're looking at a lottery scammer and they're using, we know they're using an 876 number which affects everyone because now it tarnishes the reputation of an 876 number. So we need to know who is that phone, what, what phone is that, that, that phone subscribed to, who's that person that is behind the phone, who has the IP addresses. And that's something that we get on a daily basis in the U.S. through the telephone companies, through our legislation. So that's one that I would personally want to, to target is the Interception of Communications Act. Um, I will just start off in, in regards to lottery scamming in, in Canada. Um, I would say that it is a um, emerging trend. trend. Uh, traditionally, uh, historically, it, it was um, mostly uh, the victims were being mostly targeted in the U.S., but uh, since my time here in uh, Jamaica, I'm seeing that uh, it is becoming more of an issue in, in, in Canada. So. One of the problems that relates to legislation is is we need to increase the awareness of, of this um, offense to bring it to make it a priority for investigation for um, various law enforcement agencies. Uh, as far as legislation that would help, and I think this doesn't this doesn't apply just to again proceeding with lottery scamming investigations, but all other some other investigations uh, is. When my colleagues mentioned obtaining evidence, one of the barriers we face is uh, certain evidence that is obtained in Jamaica is not admissible in courts in Canada for prosecution. So the MLAT treaties or the legislations need to be amended so that we're able not only to share that, share intelligence and evidence, but we're able to utilize it in prosecution in the court system uh, in Canada. Um, and again, in regards to uh, lottery scamming, I think just coming up with some new and creative ideas. I know that um, in the Caribbean countries, uh, unexplained wealth uh, orders uh, are some of the uh, considerations that are being looked at because the main, one of the main, I feel, deterrents to affect uh, these criminal organizations is to go after the illicit uh, profits that they generate. And... Um, uh, to do that if there's legislation in place that allows law enforcement to seize properties, uh, illicit funds, I feel in addition to uh, stronger sentences or access to deterrent, taking their, their proceeds has a significant impact uh, on these organizations uh, because they're unable to uh, fund other criminal activities and again, it, it's, it, it acts as a strong deterrent. Thank you very much, Dr. Thor. When you said you had 10 questions, I only gave you two, so I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask for another couple. <laughs> Uh, that Canada has for its national security in terms of threats emanating from Jamaica. So we know for the U.S., it's quite clear that it's drugs, it's scamming. I mean, not represented here would be the gun trafficking element, the human trafficking element. Um, and Dr. Wilson, I'm going to put you on alert for a question I have for you with this question that I'm about to ask, Mr. Wilson, which is, 
you know, my understanding, and again, this comes from the research that Capri has been doing in this space, is that there is a, um, there's a strong connection between local gangs and their counterparts in North America, US and Canada. And it seems to me that that's more of a disruptive element for us than it is for you, you broadly speaking. Um, but I wonder to what extent that is a factor in the work that you're doing here, that relationship. And then what are the other issues, main issues, Jamaican issues that are affecting Canada's national security that, that we're not quite understanding very well in terms of the broader discussion of Jamaica's transnational security issues? Um, in regards to your questions about the, the gangs and their affiliates in, in Canada, um, part of my role here is to um, understand, identify the dynamics of the various gangs in Jamaica uh, and to try to identify their uh, affiliations in, in Canada and to work with uh, partner agencies in Jamaica and Canada to um, see how, what kind of enforcement action we can take uh, to disrupt the activities uh, of these gangs. I, from what we're seeing, what I'm seeing is the associates um, in Canada play more of a role in, in financing um, the criminal activities here in Jamaica, be that, as I mentioned, the uh, funds coming from, um, for example, lottery scamming that's going on in, um, in Canada. Um, so we're looking, you know, to see how we can disrupt that, be it um, uh, laying charges in Canada or if uh, the mechanisms are available to have those individuals uh, deported um, back to, to Jamaica to be dealt with by uh, Jamaican law enforcement. Um, sorry, I'm trying to blank on your second question. <laughs> um, can you remind me? What are the other security issues? Right, right. So uh, from the Jama Jamaican perspective, I believe, I mean, and I, 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 don't, I wouldn't say this is just uh, related to Jamaica, but just the um, importation uh, drug trafficking from uh, Jamaica to, uh, to Canada. Um, Jamaica is a transshipment point from drugs coming from the south, and um, the uh, internal corruption at the airports in Jamaica and in Canada is a significant threat. It's one of our main priorities. Um, uh, one of the ways to, uh, for the uh, ability for drugs to get into Canada is to various methods, but one that particularly pertains to Jamaica is the uh, coming through the airports. And, I, and it's an issue that needs to be addressed uh, on both sides. I mean, on the Canadian side, obviously, you have the um, uh, associates who are able to uh, infiltrate the airport and remove the drugs uh, from the airport. And then, obviously, on the Jamaican side, there's uh, criminal gangs who are utilizing aircrafts to uh, export um, drugs uh, to, to Canada. So that is a, a significant area of threat for us. It's one of our main priorities. And um, uh, that's, uh, like I said, one of my main focus uh, and one of the main uh, focus for the RCP in uh, Jamaica. Thank you. Uh, Rear Admiral Lewin, you have a question? Thank you. Um, Dr. Blake mentioned Kingfish, and thank you for that. Um, Kingfish was a task force, um, and it was designed for one purpose. The singular purpose was to go after the big men of cocaine. And it was extremely successful, so much so that the waters in and around Jamaica and the territory of Jamaica was pretty much hostile to cocaine traffickers. They moved farther east, farther west, but never through. 
Now, so it was very good. It was resourced, it was focused. Now, given the intel I'm hearing about the resurgence of the movement of cocaine, I'm just wondering aloud if we need to have a resurrection of a Kingfish style um, task force to treat with it. We have the model, we have the template, might need a little tweaking. So the first question is, are we at that point? Um, secondly, to what extent could we apply that same model to guns? Um, just like to hear your thoughts on that. And um, my last question um, concerns terrorism. To the extent that this panel might be able to give us a feel, we know the jugs are going, etc., etc. And when I hear jugs are moving, what I see, uh, somebody once said, we live in a dangerous neighborhood. Caribbean Basin, Southern North America, South America, etc. And um, terrorism seems to have fallen off the order paper. The only time we hear it is when gunmen shoot up a community and we say they're terrorizing the community. Um, but if drugs are moving successfully, we run the risk of having someone with other intentions, a terrorist, using these same trafficking routes, methodologies, to carry a nasty bomb, for instance, or whatever they want. Um, and so I'd just like to get a feel, if you can, um, what the view is on terrorism within this um, dangerous space we live in. Uh, I guess I'll just open it up to any of the panelists who want to take a shot at that. No takers? Um, I'll, I'll start off. Um, just in regards to the, uh, the terrorism uh, aspect, um, yeah, you're quite correct. And going back to uh, my uh, discussions earlier about the use of uh, air transportation to secrete um, uh, narcotics uh, for export overseas, you're quite right. Those same um, opportunities exist for a terrorist organiza organizations to utilize those opportunities to, like, as you say, um, conduct a terrorist uh, operation on a plane and so forth. So that is um, uh, at the foref forefront of our discussions, not only in regards to dealing with it primarily from a, looking at it from a drug enforcement perspective, but as a secondary um, uh, thought is the, is the prospect of that uh, the terrorists could take advantage of that situation. Um, as far as terrorism in in the Caribbean area, and again, I, this is not a, a, an area where I, I know a whole lot. I'm still learning about that. I guess I would say that um, uh, social media is 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 a is a, uh, a critical tool in terms of uh, it allows. Uh, it allows uh, terrorist organizations to share their ideology throughout the world, and that can result in radicalizing uh, individuals um, at various parts um, around the world. Um, I think so far in the Caribbean region, has ten, the, the, that has not been a significant issue per se, but I don't think we should um, dis discount that it's a possibility. Because um, uh, like social media, you can have radicalization that results in uh, individuals that uh, perpetrate uh, lone wolf uh, incidents, uh, or you can have groups that identify with uh, terrorist groups overseas and adopt their ideologies and look for opportunities to, uh, to conduct terrorist uh, activities in this region. But like I said, so far... Uh, and this is not an area I don't know a whole lot, but I think in this region so far it's been uh, minimal. So I'm actually going to take a shot at that. I haven't done <laughs> research on terrorism on social media while I was in my master's. So it's a very real thing. The reality is that Trinidad has a base of uh, 
Islamic followers who have been radicalized, especially through social media, and they have gone on to the Middle East to engage in jihadi operations. And so it's a very real thing because we have an open border with um, with Trinidad where our CARICOM citizens travel back and forth quite freely. So it is a very real possibility and a very real concern. It is something that should be addressed by the CARICOM impact office. Um, and us, and us working with our partners who are seeing that kind of activity in their countries just to make sure that we put protocols in place that can actually prevent or uh, reduce the opportunities for terrorism in that respect. Um, Mr. Greenwich, I'm going to pose the second question that hard to do and hard feeling in terms of Kingfish. Um. I was fortunate enough to on my first tour from 2006 to 2010 to actually um, work um, closely with um, Kingfish targeting, again, some of the upper echelon drug traffickers. I totally agree with you that um, that we, we need everyone that has a narcotics portfolio here in Jamaica. There are ongoing talks about collaborating. Um, sometimes we have a tendency, so after Kingfish, um, and we were successful at targeting and extraditing um, a lot of those traffickers. Things had quieted down, and I guess over time, um, Kingfish was dismantled. Um, but I can tell you 100% certainty, some of those same traffickers that Kingfish was successful at dismantling and sending them to the U.S. are back. And much older, but very much active. And so there's definitely a need to um, create another task force, or at least intel sharing, pooling our resources to actually target, as I call it, threat areas or threat organizations. Um, so those talks are in place, and I agree, we definitely need a task force similar to Kingfish to address some of the, um, the challenges um, with some of the um, transnational criminal organizations that are well-funded, um, much more well-experienced, um, who are well-versed at um, what they do. I've been doing this 23 years. Some of these guys have been doing work in their craft for 30 or 40 years. And so, um, yes, I, I agree. Uh, just for those of you who may not be um, have the context, Operation Kingfish was a multilateral law enforcement operation that took place um, quite a few years ago, and it targeted significant drug traffickers uh, operating in the hemisphere. I see someone has a question. Go ahead, ma'am. Just give your name, please. Dr. Rodin Trader, Coppin State University, Baltimore, Maryland. Do you have any information about if there is a correlation? Let me start over. Over the last years, there have been several deportees, particularly from Great Britain, sent back to Jamaica. I've seen reports of busloads of people coming in. Have you found in your line of work any relationship or correlation between deportees who have returned to the island and the number of guns, the marijuana, the cocaine, the criminal violence, the escalation of it that is happening on the island. We've got displaced persons who perhaps have been separated from the island for decades older, fitting the profile perhaps of the age group you're talking about, who have been sent from a country where they have adopted to come back to the country of their birth, how is that playing into the intelligence and the intel and the violence that we're seeing across the island? Um, is that specific, well, Mr. Greenidge, or would, can Dr. Bake answer that question in the local context? Whomever feels more appropriately alive. Uh, Dr. Bake, I'm going to pose that question to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to weigh in on the first two questions. Um, you know, <clears throat> there have always been 
their anecdote um, of the, about the involvement of, of uh, deportees in, in crime. We do not have a recent study on that. Um, however, as members um, in law enforcement and practitioners, we have indeed seen incidents, uh, evidence of involvement. To the extent that it is pervasive, um, I really can't say. What I will do, however, is refer to a study that was done by former Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of National Security when she was doing her PhD, which is Dr. Anne Barnes, and she did her research around this very same area that actually did not support um, the argument about the deportees' involvement. Whether or not that has changed, I think it is time, timely that we do a new study to, to assess um, the, the threat posed by these individuals. Bear in mind also that when that study was done, um, when that um, study was done, um, the environment was, was quite different. Um, the poor entering many, there are many um, things that have been put in place in crossing the border, particularly in the United States, that wasn't in existence um, some time ago. Um, certainly from the data that she collected then. And so, you know, we sometimes um, jokingly um, refer to deportees as, um, as career deportees. We have seen in our databases um, individuals deported several times, meaning that they have ways and means of getting back into the country. And so um, uh, it, it was theorized that many of these persons that we believe are here committing these offenses um, are sometimes back um, into the country from where they were deported. And so, but it's a very good question and one that requires um, more empirical um, research and study to, to assess. Uh, but we'll look at that. Um, if I may, just to quickly weigh in on the, the questions posed by um, Rear Admiral, <coughs> you're, you're perfectly correct, sir. Uh, you know, one of the lessons I want us to take from this is, is even yesterday in the discussion, the key, one of the key points that has been, in one of the panel discussion, one of the key points that has been consistently made is, is the fact that, and, and it was supported, I think you, um, Rear Admiral mentioned it to the study, studies done by Herbert Gale that spoke to the, the relatively small number of persons involved and the huge impact they have on the, 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 the overall um, security environment. And this is the lesson that comes out of Kingfish, specifically targeting these persons and persons who matter. When you have limited resources, um, it is very important that you understand the environment within which you work. You understand the main players, and you learn how to optimize to get the most, the most out of um, the um, limited, um, or, or, or get the most out of the least. Um, um, effort. And so that was what Kingfish did. And if that lesson, if that was, was relevant, then it is still relevant today. And so the question, the answer to you is that yes, we do need to have some focused effort similar to what we did um, back then um, during Operation Kingfish uh, because the situation hasn't changed um, significantly. Uh, you meant you asked about weapons, um, similar model for Kingfish. There was indeed um, Operation Musketeer, which is a unit within Kingfish. I headed that um, formation, actually established it, and headed that formation for a number of years that looked specifically at um, illegal firearms, both mopping up what is here in the country and stemming the flow coming into the country. And as I mentioned in my earlier um, opening remark, it's it led to sig some significant collaboration and some joint effort between ourselves and, and several law enforcement agencies in Florida. Again, it is still under it was still under Operation Kingfish, and, and much of the security apparatus and structure that exists now in our control ports were. Um, as a result of recommendation coming out of this unit and vulnerabilities that we've seen and stuff. Um, um, unfortunately, it gave rise to a, 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 an emergence of, of weapons coming through our uncontrolled ports, which, was, uh, which is still happening today. And it ties right back in 
to the discussion around marijuana because these weapons are traded for marijuana. So we have the, the term drugs of trade that is, has been in existence for, for quite some time and still seem to be very lucrative. And as uh, Mr. Greenidge mentioned, the, the abundance of marijuana, the decriminalization of it, um, does have with it the disadvantage of having the availability of marijuana to trade for illegal arms and ammunition. And finally, I know I'm taking up a lot of time, but the issue of terrorism, I just want us to just to recalibrate our mind around the issue of terrorism. Um, <clears throat> we sometimes, as law enforcement, are not as agile, as I've mentioned, even in our definition of some things that happen to us. We have incidents where people, we sometimes take weeks to decide whether or not this was a terrorist act or a criminal act. Um, and so the definition of what terrorism is, um, runs secondary to the actual incident itself. A act of terrorism is a crime somewhere. And so it requires the, the, the shoring up of our law enforcement or security response in dealing with that. And it is more important, um, um, and the previous um, um, member asked the question, well, asked the question about the court, forgive me, I forgot the name. Um, you, you spoke about um, Sorry, I lost my train of thought. But anyway, um, oh yes, you spoke about the the the, the um, terrorism. Sorry, it's not the moderator. You mentioned in your study um, terrorism and and Islam and Trinidad and and what is happening here and there and stuff like that. I, I just want to weigh in on that a little bit. A number of the persons who went from Trinidad to to um, to Syria to fight, when interviewed, had I had no idea what the ideology, which is a key element in the definition of terrorism, what the ideology was, what is it that they were there fighting for, or what was it. And so, and so but the, most of them had um, some criminal antecedents. And, and so the point I'm making is that more and more the, the, the definition, the, 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 the ideology is being removed from the definition of criminal, of terrorism. And the more that happens, the more the terrorist act resembles crime, regular crime that happens. A man with an AK-47 that, that opens fire in a crowd and kills eight persons, um, in somewhere in Clarendon, uh, is the same act that can take place on, at one of our borders, like a cruise ship or at the airport. And so, why is it the same act? The definition may be different because we may not look at it as a terrorist act as opposed to a criminal act. And, and so, we need to now look at security, uh, crime itself, because if that definition is changed, if we're moving away from the reliance on this ideology to define terrorism, then what you, if we actually are moving away from that, what you find happening is that terrorism um, and criminology, there will become a convergence. And uh, let me just remind us that our region will be um, even more frightening than it is now, being one of the most murderous regions on earth, Caribbean and Latin America, um, and where Jamaica is a main um, player in that. And so it is very important, and we talk about agility, how quick do we respond to the changing environment? We as practitioners have to start thinking along that line whilst we sit down and try to define whether or not this thing that just occurred was terrorism or crime. We have to have established mechanism and structure to, to, to treat with that. And in doing so, we have to start recalibrating our mind around this idea called terrorism. Thank you. Dr. Blake, um, I feel like we don't have enough panels to discuss all this. Is that need discussing? Because we don't have a terrorism panel on the schedule. Um, but that's something to keep in mind. Uh, Will, let me have a question. Mr. Greenidge, you mentioned earlier the drugs for guns trade between Jamaica and Colombia. Um, is there any evidence for a substantial flow of guns legally purchased in the U.S. coming to Jamaica? It's not my wheelhouse. I try to stay away from speaking <laughs> on the, the at least weapons. I consider the, the guns for ganja trade um, part of my portfolio. We do target um, vessels leaving Jamaica, heading to Haiti or Colombia with large loads of, of, of marijuana um, that's going to be traded for weapons 
and um, ammunition. Um, so it's definitely on my radar. Um, speaking to my ATF counterpart, because I have a tendency to speak to, you know, all of my U.S. law enforcement um, colleagues um, to get an idea of um, what their portfolio is and whether it, it, it leads over to, there's an interconnection with everything for the most part. And if I'm correct, 77% um, of the guns that are, that are seized in Jamaica have a U.S. nexus. And um, I'll leave it there because, again, I, I just don't want to delve too, too deep in, in a lane that's just not mine. Okay, thank you. Uh, Admiral Lewin again. Um, the matter was raised about the extent to which the Portis contribute to criminal, well, violence, mainly murders. I'm afraid it was a subject that got caught up in, how should I say, uh, geo, geopolitics. A study was done which came to one conclusion, and in fact, another study was ordered to come to a different conclusion. I remember when this was presented at the Terran Hoover. We have to be careful about the question we ask. You may get a different answer. If the question is asked about the Portis murdering people, to what extent they do, the answer is going to be hardly ever. And that's a fact. You don't find a deportee returning home actually pulling a trigger and shooting people. But look at the other side. If you ask the question, do they, their return contribute to homicides? You get a different answer. When I'm over there in Britain or the United States and I'm working my butt off, sending money back to the gang here and so on, thing. I do my 20 years, I come home, I want to go to the position of ascendancy, the local guy says no, the gang split, 10 homicides, intra-gang, caused by what? The return of that deportee. So be careful of the question we ask. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Barber. <laughs> This issue that I was trying to get Mr. Wilson to talk about a little bit more about the financing of gangs hair by their counterparts in the U.S. Um, there isn't a lot of understanding of how that, that works and how you, meaning the JCS, is working with that. Um, you know, are there established connections? Is it an ad hoc set of relationships. So basically I'm asking if you can give us a little bit of an outline of, of kind of what that scenario is between North American and I imagine UK gangs as well and how they finance uh, operations here. We hear it a lot, you know, well we can't go after so and so because the source of funding is out of our jurisdiction, is one of the things that we hear, for example. And then to Mr. Riley, yesterday, one of the themes that came out of the discussion was who is benefiting. That that question needs to be answered if we're going to understand what is driving criminal violence slash violent crime in Jamaica, is that there are many people in the Jamaican society who are benefiting from this. And I imagine, or I I think that that is also a factor in the lottery scamming problem. I mean, the criminals are always going to be a step ahead of you in being ahead of, uh, you catch them doing this, they're going to move to that, the technology, and so on. But none of that would matter if the broader, what do you want to call it, acceptance or condoning or looking away of the enterprise didn't exist. Um, so I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that kind of macro factor of how Jamaica approaches lottery scamming, and not just law enforcement, but you know, Jamaica as a whole, Jamaica as a society, and how you um, are dealing with that aspect of the lottery scamming problem. Dr. Blake, you first. Um, um, sorry, I, I caught the last um, part of, I lost my audio, I literally got the first part, but I, I, I 
I think the question um, to us is how Jamaica is dealing with the lottery scamming. Um, um, let me just extend, re, uh, rephrase her question for you. It's basically uh, in terms of accounting for the financing um, by the international criminal counterparts, but their counterparts here in Jamaica. So what kind, what does the picture look like for JCF in terms of addressing international funding that is fueling violence and gangs in Jamaica? Um, okay, well, I know Mr. Bailey, um, who is far more qualified um, to respond to that than I am. I know we spoke about it um, yesterday in terms of um, efforts made against tackling organized crime networks, both locally and through um, collaboration with our international partners, especially the United States, in dealing with, um, with some of these. The lottery scamming is one such that has been given significant um, significant attention. Um, there is going to be uh, that nexus. There will always be that nexus. I mean, we probably have more Jamaicans in other countries than we do have in Jamaica. And so um, usually when persons leave um, the country uh, or migrate, they usually go to places where um, people of um, similar um, um, characteristics and stuff like that. And so you have that network naturally establishing, not just for criminals, but for persons in general. And so we're going to, we are indeed are going to find um, um, that type of, 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 of synergy. What we've seen on the street, and I, I leave a more in-depth response to Mr. Bailey at some point in time, or, um, so he's far more qualified. But what we've seen a lot is, is this low-level street crime um, a, a lot of involvement and support of that type of criminal activity coming from um, associates, Jamaican associates, particularly in the United States. Right? We find um, persons making the effort um, to, to get the weapons into the country to these, these members. Many of those persons who actually pull the trigger um, are, are, are not able to even afford um, these weapons, but are supported. And intelligence have um, pointed us to a number of these individuals. Uh, I I can assure you that there is a lot of work, and we have gotten significant support. And we have had significant arrests um, also in the United States. Um, um, many years ago it may be, but um, a few that I have been personally involved with, where we have gotten support. And, and it, it was possible because of the sure enough information between um, law enforcement agencies across the two states um, so that we can understand the picture much better. So yes, there is indeed that, 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 that play. In terms of the high-level strategic um, um, or the, 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 the major uh, movers and shakers are, 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 as the theme mentioned, who benefits, the persons who benefit, I, I would leave that to someone more qualified to to speak on. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Blake. Mr. Greenwich, you want to add two sentences to that? Yeah, I, um, last year, um, um, Commissioner Anderson and um, Deputy Commissioner of Police, um, Mr. Bailey, had came to the U.S. Embassy and they met with all of the law enforcement um, agencies within the embassy and they gave us a very comprehensive list of individuals that they have identified that's living in the United States but that are controlling and influencing gangs down here. Um, so that list was shared, um, and I know that you know all of the entities are actively working on the issue of individuals living abroad but influencing gangs here in Jamaica. Thank you very much, Mr. Greenidge. Uh, Mr. Riley, your response to the Dr. Thorburn? Okay, so the question was who benefits? And I will say that it's everyone. Um, lottery scamming is based on money. So you have an influx of cash. So your gyms, your car dealerships, your, your construction companies, the lumber company, the hardware store down the street, the gas stations, the, the parties, everyone benefits because it's cash. Is money, um, and that makes it even more difficult because when someone is struggling, 
and you have a person who's getting in illegal funds and they provide those funds, it's almost like a Robin Hood-esque uh, mentality. So you have people who are struggling and, and they look the other way. But then it comes back to bite you because now your neighborhoods are not safe enough to keep your doors unlocked or, you know, you can't walk down the street without fear of retribution. And um, that's the problem with with the lottery scamming and the money. Um, but the, to answer your question, it benefits everyone. It benefits everyone in the fact that that, that cash is being circulated in society. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Riley. Uh, definitely one of the things when Capri did its study, um, it showed that, you know, the tolerance for scamming, especially in the communities, um, they would benefit from the influx of cash. And uh, definitely some questions have been raised along the line by many stakeholders as to the number of construction sites going up. Uh, who's buying these uh, uh, condos and apartments when they go up, right? Uh, how are they being afforded? So definitely, um, and I think that's going to come back now to the unexplained wealth order. I'm just going to pose that question to Dr. Blake in terms of the unexplained wealth order. I know there is a legislative agenda right now that is being funneled, um, that is being pushed by stakeholders. Uh, how soon or what is the outlook for something like unexplained wealth order coming on the books so that the evidence needed to address persons who are benefiting from wealth can be addressed? Um, I would love to get the answer to that in terms of it. <laughs> soon that will be there. One thing I can say, though, I, and I don't know, I sound like a scratch record when I speak about our agility. I think that's one of the areas in which we have not done very well as a nation, and it is in developing or, or, prepare, or, or making available the tools necessary to treat with these at the pace at which these emergent um, criminal um, um, activities are, 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 are coming up. And so, you know, you know, many of the legislations that we have asked for take, you know, forever to come um, forward. I know this is something that we have been talking about, unexplained wealth and the weakness in our poker over many, many years. I'm very hand though that it is give, it's been given uh, among, uh, uh, along with other legislations that we have been um, consistently asking for, have been given some serious attention um, in recent time. With respect to when it will be available, I really, honestly, don't know. But I, I, I am, I am hoping that it is sooner than later. And and this is one of the greatest weaknesses. Mr. Bailey spoke um, on it yesterday, and it is in its manner the, the, the challenges that we have as law enforcement, with all the information that we have, the intelligence that we have, the evidence that we can produce, but but the absence of the tool to go beyond that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have four minutes remaining, and what I'm going to do, um, based on my reading in the media recently, a national organized crime strategy is currently being developed. I'm going to ask each of the panelists, give you one minute uh, to wrap up. What would you think needs to be considered for Jamaica um, to formally address, to formally place inside that strategy that needs to address the crimes and challenges that we're having right now uh, for transnational organized crime in that strategy. <laughs> Can I start? <laughs> yeah, go go right ahead, Dr. Blake. I think everybody is seated in the floor too. Right. So, so a national organized crime strategy. Um, there are certain key elements, and much of those elements have been discussed over, since, over the last two days. Um, it is, it is the, the main um, aspect to it is collaboration. You know, we have to collaborate as, as, as um, states and law enforcement entities, and we have, to, we have to collaborate so that we understand what it is that we're up against. And if we, if we approach a strategy from that perspective, we have, we, 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 the likelihood of a, of a successful strategy emerging is much greater. Um, we have to learn, as Admiral 
quite um, rightfully mentioned, we have to learn from lessons from the past. Um, and so whatever strategy that we put in place to treat with that um, must benefit from what has worked before. And within any strategy that we put forward, we have to, we have to ensure that there are mechanisms to, 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 to guarantee sustainability. Um, Operation Kingfish again, and there are many others that we can mention of, but I mean, this is a topical one that we've been talking about this morning. But Operation Kingfish, um, as was described by uh, Mr. Greenwich, you know, after this month, then, you know, things petered out somewhat, and then we go back, we get back to where we were before. And so, and so these are some critical elements and knowledge, understanding, and we can only do that through the collaboration and the sharing of information. Um, two, our agility in responding. We can't take three, four, five years um, to have a tool that is necessary to fight ag against some criminal trend that is emerging um, by the week. And so we have to uh, I know there are difficulties and challenges in our bureaucracy and our processes, but we create them. And so we have to refine them. We have to make them work um, um, and, and thing. And then the third element of any such strategy must be the element of sustainability. These must change, but not change because someone is tired of it or because an administration changed. They must change because we find a better way or, or we find a ref or we can refine them, but not to just stop in media. So we have to build within um, what we do, whatever strategy we embark on, um, the element of sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bake. Uh, Mr. Wilson, I'm just going to come down the line, so 30 seconds quickly to, for any suggestions of what needs to be contained in that organized crime strategy. Um, yeah, I would uh, echo uh, Dr. Blake's comments. Uh, collaboration is key. As I mentioned uh, in my opening remarks, organized crime groups are working together, and uh, law enforcement need to collaborate uh, and work together. Um, and also, um, the strategies in place need to be able to ad adapt to changes. Uh, technology is, is evolving and having a significant impact on how criminals do business. So I think the strategy employed by law enforcement also needs to uh, be flexible and adjustable so that we're able to ad adapt with the changing technology. Uh, I will say collaboration. I think that there needs to be some type of fusion center type model where you have all of your agencies in one room talking to one another so that you don't miss anything. And, and the U.S. is not immune to this. We have the same issue where you have so many agencies, but no one's really talking about what's going on. So you miss a lot of information that could be shared. So you have, you have all of your agencies in one room all the time are, you know, representatives of those agencies in the room all the time talking about the major cases and major issues that are going on in the country and have honest sharing, not just lip service sharing, but honest sharing of the information that, that you have so that you can tackle the problem that's before you. I echo the same. I just want to reiterate, um, I spent four years here as an investigator, five years here as a supervisor. Jamaica has the capabilities. Um, I work with some of the most talented, hardworking, honest police officers, um, intelligence officers. Um, it's not the fact that we don't know what's going on. We, we know who are the influencers of violence. We know who are bringing in the large loads of, of, of drugs, um, who are the area dons. Um, so definitely collaboration. I'm a big advocate for the talent that's that's here within the JCF and within the JDF. Thank you very much. Uh, that brings us to the conclusion of panel one. I'd like to thank Mr. Greenwich, Mr. Riley, Mr. Wilson, and Dr. Blake for participating.
Uh, panel two, I'm going to ask you to stand by. Uh, our moderator will be Javon Nelson, Frederick Elfeld from the uh, European Union, Ms. Sharon Webber from the British High Commission, and Mr. Kevin Gilholy from the Canadian High Commission. We'll be taking a coffee break for 10 minutes, um, and I'd like to thank everybody for participating as much as you can. Uh, panelists, please don't quite disappear yet. We're going to take pictures <laughs> before you leave and start interacting with everybody else. Thank you.
he unfortunately got called away at a last minute meeting that he had to attend. I would like to recognize some persons who were not present to be recognized earlier. Uh, Ms. Judith Slato, our British High Commissioner to Jamaica. Uh, Mr. Frederick Eckfeld, who you'll be hearing from shortly, at charge of their affairs for the European Union. And Mrs. Beverly Manley, thank you all for joining us. Uh, Mr. Nelson, I'll turn your panel over to you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Can be a little bit more spirited than that. <laughs> All right, so this panel, the International Donor Partners um, panel, talking about the impact on citizen security policy and programs. I promise it will be a very, very good one and spiritful, spirited discussion. So today we'll be talking with some of our main donors around how they support the Jamaican um, government in terms of their efforts to improve citizen security beyond law enforcement um, collaboration by contributing material and other resources to policies and programs in non-policing, anti-crime intervention, security policy, design and implementation, and justice reform. And so for this panel, we really want to ascertain from our donor partners what are some of the aims and objectives of the work that they're doing to support the government in terms of citizen security and justice um, pro initiatives. Today we have three panelists. As was said, unfortunately, Major General Anthony Anderson is is unable to make it. And so our panelists today are um, Frederick Eckfeld, who is the Charter Affairs of the European Union to Jamaica, Belize, the Bahamas, Turks and Caicos, and Cayman Islands. Sharon Weber, who is the Governance Advisor for the Caribbean Development Team at the British High Commission. And Kevin Gilhuli, who is the Program Manager of the Foreign, Political and Diplomatic Services Division at the Canadian High Commission. And so we are going to have quick presentations today. So the floor will be a presentation from each of our panelists for about seven to 10 minutes. And then we will open up for um, discussion. So please um, make note of your questions um, right afterwards. So let's start with you, Mr. Eckfeld. Good morning. It's, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here today. Um, issues related to transnational organized crime uh, are uh, very important to me. I've been working previously uh, quite extensively with the subject. Um, I've been here for four years in Jamaica. I'm coming, unfortunately, to the end of my tour here. Uh, and uh, had the privilege a little bit to look back over my four years uh, now and then when we have the discussion in a panel. Uh, I will maybe be a little bit more generous with my comments um, uh, since uh, I have the privilege of leaving here. So my, um, let us see. <coughs> I'm looking forward to the discussions. <coughs> so um, unfortunately, every day, um, reading newspapers, listening to news here in Jamaica, we have the cries for sustainable uh, crime prevention strategies uh, that will allow citizens uh, to live in peace without fear of violence and for the country to effectively pursue its growth and development objectives. <clears throat> I use this opportunity to highlight an important component of the strong and long-standing partnership between the European Union and the government of Jamaica in the form of uh, a citizen security program, which has been allocated 20 million euros, or 3.5 billion Jamaican dollars, over four years. The high levels of violence with this negative impact on economic performance affect human security in the most vulnerable communities and impose a hardship on people in these communities, but not only. It has repercussions throughout the whole island. And it's worth uh, remembering that there have been international studies made about the negative impact on this country's GDP uh, when it relates to, uh, to violence, to, to, to criminal uh, violent crime. But it's also worth highlighting the other um, causality, and that is that socio-economic development 
addressing socioeconomic inequalities has also a major impact on the reduction of crime. The high levels uh, of, uh, of violence that we see is thus not just something that should remain in the newspapers and that people in affluent parts of uh, Jamaican cities uh, can keep a certain distance to. It is something that is urgently, must urgently be addressed. In terms of program design, we always engage uh, with the Planning Institute of uh, Jamaica and all relevant players in a push to craft interventions that will be sustainable beyond the funding cycle. This is why uh, our uh, citizen security program is seeking to reform the approach to crime and violence through coordinated all of government interventions informed by evidence-based data with special focus on prevention. And that's why I'm extremely pleased also to see that Capri is here today, with whom we are working very, very closely and uh, is uh, contributing in Teralia to uh, providing well-informed uh, papers. The European Union support is threefold and um, involves, one, providing financial assistance in the form of budget support to assist government agencies to deliver core social services and initiatives in the most vulnerable communities. Two, we also provide highly specialized technical assistance in the form of experts, research and training to improve delivery mechanisms, coordination, quality and effectiveness of the interventions to the targeted populations in the vulnerable communities. Importantly also, third point, the European Union provides funds to support civil society participation in the implementation of citizen security initiatives that have a deeper reach to beneficiaries. So Jamaican civil society organizations are uh, close to our hearts. Uh, we admire the work that they are doing and we certainly would like to continue partnering with them as an important contribution to the fight against crime in the country. We would like to flag a few examples of the um, uh, citizen security program. Uh, so um, it is uh, assisting the government uh, with the 25 schools strategy led by the Ministry of National Security and the Ministry of Education. This program, the 25 school strategy, aims to provide assessments, recommendations, interventions and support to children who display maladaptive behavior in the selected schools. These students will participate in a behavior modification program over a three-year uh, period. The EU lobbied for also the establishment of an oversight mechanism, the so-called Crime Monitoring and Oversight Committee, CMOC, to monitor progress related to citizen security as part of the bipartisan national consensus of crime which was signed in August 2020. I know that um, my ambassador and I, we met several times the head of uh, CMOC, and uh, we must say that uh, they uh, have, uh, through the short period of time that they've been active, uh, provided uh, very good input. The citizen security program is taking shape, so it's hard to speak um, to uh, the impact at this point, of course. But we are encouraged by the increased coordination across government ministries, uh, departments and agencies. Eliminating violence against women is also a key component of any effort to bolster citizen security. The EU-funded program, uh, which is implemented by the UN, the Spotlight Initiative, is allocated uh, 8 million euros. And this initiative uh, aims to eliminate all forms of family violence uh, in a sustainable way. Um, in the vulnerable communities of Jamaica, we know that um, unfortunately family violence is a, um, a, 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 a scarily, at scarily high levels. And um, the, the security and the, the levels of violence that is used in crime can't be addressed 
if women and girls are not feeling safe. So these programs go hand in hand with one another. Spotlight is not the first program related to eliminating gender-based violence in Jamaica. However, Spotlight stands out based on this multidimensional approach with first focused on laws and policies, strengthening institutions, prevention, improving services, data collection, and women's movements. The key is the results. There are some real tangible deliverables here. And that is uh, two national shelters for victims of domestic violence. They are now operational and um, uh, open across uh, the island. Uh, Spotlight is moving to change the way nurses, uh, police officers, and justice system personnel think about and respond to gender-based violence through training programs. And notably, the Spotlight team also contributed to the Sexual Harassment Act that is now in place. Projects and programs by themselves do not solve problems. They are useful tools in the hands of politicians, officials, and civil society organizations, of course. This citizen security program, therefore, cannot succeed in its monumental task without a strong social pact that brings together the citizens in all sectors of the society in the fight against crime and insecurity. Everyone needs to be involved. So uh, this is uh, coming to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for giving me time to uh, present this. Um, and I'm looking forward to discussions. All right, thank you so much, Frederick. Um, Frederick, so we know the EU provides billions of dollars of support to the government of Jamaica as well as civil society organizations through financial assistance or um, budget support. And importantly, there are a number of different citizenship, um, citizen security initiatives that are being supported, including the 25 school strategy to support students with maladaptive behavior. And as you said in the close, we cannot do this alone um, because these interventions by themselves are not helpful. They're just useful tools in the hands of citizens and the um, government to importantly ensure that all of us are brought to the table to work effectively together. So I now turn to um, Sharon Weber from the British High Commission. In fact, I think the UK is probably one of the longest um, bilateral, one of the bilateral partners with perhaps the longest record in this area. Um, the support has taken the form of um, strengthening the security apparatus as well as building resilience of vul vulnerable communities and individuals. On the institutional strengthening side, the Jamaica Constabulary Force in the 1990s was a very important recipient of um, support from the UK, and several entities currently receive support to tackle serious and organized crimes under the £17.5 million Serious Organized Crime and Corruption and anti-corruption. So the major um, entities in this regard are MOCA, the Financial Institu Investigations Division, and the, the Integrity Commission and the Justice Sector. These programs have been very successful in building the capabilities of Jamaica's security architecture and strengthening their operational performance to tackle various crimes, um, anti-corruption, money laundering, um, for, with um, forensic training has been provided, and also in terms of asset recovery. On the violence prevention side, this is where we have been 
extremely involved in terms of making investments to build communities and investing in vulnerable groups. Many of you might be aware of the Citizen Security and Justice Program, which was funded between phase three, which was funded between 2014 and 2020 jointly by the governments provided grant funding by the governments of Canada, uh, the UK, and through a loan from the uh, IDB to the government. So this $55 million program, dollar program was the largest violence prevention program undertaken by the government along with the donor partners um, during that period. And uh, it represented a significant shift from the community level focus of the predecessor programs to an approach that targeted individual risk factors. So the underlying methodology there was to treat violence as a public health issue. Now, prior to that, we tended to see violence here in Jamaica has been addressed as a criminal matter, a criminal issue, an issue for the police. Um, this um, pivoting have caused, raised awareness to the fact that <coughs> violence is like a disease. You have to catch it before it takes root. You have to treat it. You have to be able to um, prevent prevent it from spreading. So the risk assessment and case management was a very central part of the program and um, it was coupled with integrated services to target individuals according to their risk levels, strengthening nonviolent conflict resolution, improving education and skills levels, and increasing access to community justice services. The Violence Interruption Program using the Peace Management Initiative was ex ex a very successful partnership which was effective in de detecting and mediating potential conflict among community gangs. We also invested heavily in research and the generation of data, and here we just have to acknowledge the significant contribution of Dr. Thorburn from Capri and her team, Drana, um, VPA, um, and also, the, that's the Violence Prevention Alliance, um, and also the Mona Geoinformatics Institute. I think we were very successful in raising a number of issues relating to crime and violence in the society, um, looking at some of the issues in relation to monitoring and evaluation, some of the, the constraints to implementation, which um, Capri provided a platform for the discussion um, of, of some of those issues. The National Violence Prevention Commission was also formed during this process, and uh, um, the Commission is now undertaking very, very valuable, very useful work. It might not have yet had the profile and just as yet, but I'm sure we will shortly see the results of the work that it's been doing. The new phase of the UK's violence prevention um, support, and I'm currently leading the design on, on that program, and I wish a lot of the NGOs who were here yesterday were here today to sort of hear some of our plans because after listening to them yesterday, I, I have concluded that yes, we are on the right track. When we evaluated CSJP, there were a number of shortcomings which prevented it from realizing the impact which we envisaged. Um, there were definite improvements in the risk, value, risk profiles of individuals. We had a number of successes from our parenting programs, from the skills training, 
but the impact to the community, to those 50 communities in which the program was, was somewhat disappointing. Um, we all, there was also weak coordination among agencies. And even though the program had actually piloted a much closer relationship and delivery of services by a number of entities. But most importantly, the successful interventions did not have the leadership by the government agencies. So when we looked at the sustainability and the possibility for sustainability, um, those were not, we were not encouraged that many of the programs could have been sustained. Because unfortunately, over the years, there's been significant investments in violence prevention, but somehow, once the development partners exit, there many come to a halt, many excellent work which has been done, excellent research which, which, which is done during the program cycle. <laughs> Somehow all of that is lost. So drawing on our experience um, from the findings of CSJC, we looked again at how, what value can the UK um, bring to the process. And uh, where we are seeing uh, an opening, um, it's in the context of the citizen security plan, which is a policy framework which uh, Frederick just spoke about and which the government has embarked on implementing. It's a multi-sectoral integrated um, attempt at really introducing a whole of government engagement to the area of citizen security. And so that framework provides an opportunity, um, we think, for the UK to partner with the government in terms of um, engaging and ensuring and supporting greater coordination among the state apparatus, um, also um, improving the delivery of services by the state apparatus to vulnerable communities and to vulnerable groups. And so that is one of the focus of the program going forward. It's more strengthening the systems of government because we're looking more at sustainability going forward so that after the program ends, um, it can be carried forward by the, the, the within the government structures. We understand that there are some weaknesses now in terms of deficiencies in terms of development of, of delivery of services, the case management support, the psychosocial support, and those areas which are critical to the violence prevention um, achieving better outcomes in violence prevention. We will be looking at supporting the government and also working closely with the EU to realize some of those objectives within the 25 schools strategy. Um, the, the partnerships between government and civil society are critical. Civil society plays an extremely important role at the community level in terms of supporting social interventions, violence um, reduction in Jamaica. And so one of the aspects of our program will be just looking at how to encourage greater partnerships and greater strategic engagement between the state systems and also with the civil society and also strengthening the civil society systems as well because it's not only the state systems that require that level of coordination but the civil society structures as well. So the approach during this phase will be basically trying to achieve greater sustainability, greater impact through the um, through the, the civil 
through the citizen security plan, also an important part of it, and CAPRI has done a lot of studies looking at deficiencies in monitoring and evaluation, in data collection, how data is used, um, particularly data at the community level, primary data, so that the communities themselves can, when we speak, we have the data to support the, the, the activities and to support and, and also to bring across the, 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 the situation in relation to um, community and social development. So these interventions are within the CSP policy framework and are aimed at strengthening Jamaica's capability to implement effective strategies to reduce the drivers of violence through enhanced surveillance systems by strengthening the state capacity and also coordinating, supporting coordinated delivery structures and inclusive engagement of stakeholders. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you um, so much, Ms. Weber. I'm very pleased to hear, and I think you've been looking at my notes because I have some questions about sustainability and monitoring and evaluation. For example, looking at one of that report, those reports that Capri had actually um, done about a year or two ago, I think it was. Um, so let's now go to Kevin um, Gihuli, who is from the Canadian High Commission as the Program Manager um, for Foreign Political and Diplomatic Services. Well, thank you very much, and good morning to everybody. Uh, let me begin by just thanking the U.S. Embassy, Fulbright, the University of West Indies, and others that have brought this forum, or allowed me to participate in this very important forum. I'd like to all acknowledge my colleagues as well from the U.K. and the European Union uh, missions. Um, I would also like to say that my High Commissioner, uh, uh, Tudakovic, would have wanted to be here, but she's off island this, this day, today on a well-deserved leave uh, from her job. Uh, let me start off by introducing myself very briefly. I'm a career foreign service officer that has served in Romania, Sri Lanka, and most recently Syria and Libya. So coming to Jamaica was a, an, isle, an oasis uh, in comparison. Uh, but I've learned lessons here as well. I'll talk to you about those in a second. Um, certainly one of the pillars of Canada's foreign policy is, uh, is uh, to promote security and good governance uh, around the world. And nowhere is more important than in our neighborhood. And of course, the Caribbean is in our neighborhood. So we focus a lot of our support here in this part of the world and in Jamaica. Uh, it's, uh, I think Rupert uh, Wilson, who is our RCMP officer in the first panel, I think she, he described very well our operational uh, cooperation with uh, Jamaican police and security forces. And so I won't go over that again. Uh, you know, I'll just say that we have a history of cooperating with, uh, with Jamaica in law enforcement, in defense, and in other aspects. Uh, we've been here for a long time. We intend to be, continue to be here for a long time, and we, um, we see a special connection between Canada and Jamaica, particularly uh, through our diaspora and our history of, of trade and, and interaction. Uh, I would like to highlight uh, just a few areas where, that ta where Canada is providing assistance uh, to Jamaica. This includes the anti-crime capacity building program, which took me a long time to learn, uh, but I'll call it ACCBP. And it's a program that provides both bilateral specific assistance to countries like Jamaica, but also takes a much more regional approach to uh, enhancing security and, and uh, cooperation in the region. Um, it covers areas such as corruption, money laundering, cybercrime, and customs, but that's just a small portion of it. And it operates throughout the, uh, the Caribbean. And I think it's, it's particularly uh, advantageous for not just Jamaica, but for other smaller, even smaller islands in the, in the region who benefit, who don't maybe have the mass uh, to do this kind of training themselves. I think it's a, a very useful uh, part of our contribution to security in the region. We also have, a, a, I think, a, a fairly good reputation in development assistance. 
and we bring that to Jamaica as well, um, particularly through uh, helping to increase the capacity of the judiciary in, in Jamaica. Uh, we also help ordinary Jamaicans access the judicial system. I won't go into a lot of details about these programs. I can talk to you about them in, in another, uh, later on, perhaps. Um, we also take and take a very close look at how impact, how violence and crime impact gender, uh, and it's a growing uh, area of concern. Is uh, that the impacts are differently felt um, uh, uh, between the genders, and so that's one area that we are providing. Uh, um, support um, uh, in, in Jamaica. Also, we support sort of institutional building, which is an important aspect. I talked about the judiciary, <clears throat> but we've also been integral in supporting MOCA, uh, the Integrity Commission, and other institutions, Jamaican uh, government institutions, that have a role to play in bringing good governance and security to Jamaica. Uh, last but not least is my Canada Fund for Local Initiatives. I'm very proud of this one because this is the one I actually manage. Um, and it's one that is generated here. And what we do is we provide uh, small amounts of money uh, to community-based groups to take action in a number of areas, including security within their communities. Uh, it's renewed every year, so we have new participants every year. This year we have a, a, a record nine uh, projects underway, and they deal with some of the issues uh, that, you know, maybe not law, per se law enforcement, but on issues that, that, that have contributed or that, are in, uh, that have an impact or um, that are felt by communities that are sometimes not included. These projects, I'll just give you a few of them. I can't go into the numbers because I frankly don't have them, but <clears throat> we had one we did a few years ago called Gloves Over Guns. It was a project in St. Saint, uh, uh, Saint, uh, Saint James that provided alternatives for young people to, you know, uh, through sports, to exercise and to find discipline. Now, it might be a, 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 through martial arts. It might be counterintuitive to say, well, Training people to fight is, uh, is helpful for ending violence, but they also developed a sense of well, purpose, also di discipline, both mentally and physically. So uh, that program was a couple of years ago. We've also got a, another program uh, called um, Mothers Against Gun Violence. This take took women who had mothers who had been impacted by, by gun violence, who had a, lost a family member. And they were trained up to become champions, you know, as, for, to resist and to, in their communities, to, you know, to talk to the issue and to, uh, and, and they've had, a, I believe, a significant impact. Again, this is very local, and, uh, but it, I think they're beneficial, these programs. The other one is Women, uh, women of Purpose. This is another St. James program we took women with, that have been victims of gender-based violence, <clears throat> and again, like the mothers against gun violence, help train them to become ad advocates, champions uh, in, that, in that area within their community. But let me, th th this brings me to my main point, uh, and uh, forgive me if I, uh, I'll be a bit personal on this. Like Fred, I've been here for four years and it's coming to an end in a couple of weeks. But uh, I'll tell you that four years of experience in Jamaica has taught me or has I've gained a greater appreciation for just how complex this issue is. Look, at, if it was easy to solve, it would have been done, right? I mean, it's obviously complex. And, we, and, and, gov and the international community has a role to play. It will be resolved by Jamaicans, but we, do have a, uh, we both have an interest, and I think to some degree we have a, a responsibility um, uh, in terms of, you know, the guns, uh, the, the drugs go to Canada and the United States. You know, they, we are the money that, that funds this stuff, uh, the, the crime. Um, so it's a complex issue. I appreciate that more and more as I as I about to leave. Uh, it, yes, it does involve governance in, in legitimacy, to some, legitimacy to some extent, but it also involves other factors like culture, history, and social inequalities. 
all of which contribute to the problems. I think it will demand a multidisciplinary approach. I think it, it has to. We can't go all the way on, on, on enforcement. We have to have a, a balance there. Uh, so uh, the answer is multidimensional, involves regular police cooperation, but also it involves cooperation addressing the root causes of this violence. Um, and uh, just to, in, in closing, I believe that uh, violent crime is uh, one of the principal obstacles to Jamaica achieving its development objectives. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily what's happening, but as a colleague of mine just said a few minutes ago to me, it's the impression that it creates which hinders Jamaica just as significantly. So uh, in closing, just let me say it's been, a very, it's been a great privilege to serve as one of Canada's representatives of Jamaica. I'm, I'll miss it. I'm not running out the door, but uh, I, I, it, I do have to leave. And, uh, but thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Kevin, and to um, Sharon and Frederick. Um, so I think we can now open up for um, some questions and have a discussion. I think this has been a very, very good panel thus far. I think one thing that is very, very clear from all three presentations is that there is some amount of coordination across all three entities here, um, but unfortunately for a number of our civil society or NGO partners and other actors who are working around violence prevention, there's a feeling that there's not much coordination among our donors. And so I'd love to um, hear from all three of you what can be done. I recall last year doing some research, and very clearly one person very passionately said, I'm tired because the donors are not talking to each other, they're not working with each other, and they're pitting us against each other. And in one community, you may have several donors, several entities doing the same thing. And so I'd love to hear from you three what you think could be done to address that. Start with any one of you. <laughs> yes, it, it certainly is an issue and um, I think the uh, community also recognizes the, the donor uh, coordination that there needs to be greater coordination um, going forward and in fact that process has started with the certainly through the UNDP they have a coordinating office here and they've been trying to coordinate the international donor community also um, we're also trying to coordinate our engagement as well with other partners who are in the citizen security and uh, space as well. So there is that collaboration at the operational level just to ensure that we're not tripping over each other, particularly since we realize now that, as, as, as Kevin just said, the issues are very complex. Um, there are many persons in the field who are working on the ground and uh, we don't want to get into each other's way. So I think you will see a little bit more um, coordination, a little bit of improvements in the coordination going forward, particularly in this violence prevention space. Any of the gentlemen would like to contribute? Yeah. Okay, yeah, um, uh, coordination. It's important for us to coordinate our activities to identify gaps in support uh, and to avoid duplication. Uh, we have, uh, I've experienced during the last uh, four years that we do, uh, we do a fair amount of it at the working level. We have regular meetings between our our, our, our missions uh, to, um, to coordinate. Um, and we also um, sometimes form, um, I'm going to say, a bit of a lobby group, if you will, called the ABCE group, America, Britain, Canada, and the European Union, um, uh, which we would uh, use sometimes to lobby the government on issues that we think were critical to the success of security in Jamaica. It's a delicate balance, though, I have to say, because at the one hand, you, you don't want to be 
telling Jamaica what to do, but you want to be and 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 uh, enforcing your views because you you need programs to respond to Jamaican needs, not our needs. Uh, although we want them to respond to our needs as well, don't get me wrong. But you know, if you're if you're really insistent and uh, and not bullying is the wrong word, but if you're you know very um, very um, very deliberate and, and strong, you can push people away as well. So it's a delicate balance for us to be. You know, I think instead of telling Jamaica what we can do, we can share our experiences and identify places where we can help, niche areas where we can be of assistance. That's that's where I'd like to see and. That's my hope that my my successor. I'm certainly going to encourage her to do that. Is to work with you uh, again on uh, on creating that kind of ABCE uh, grouping. Thank you. Uh, uh, talking. Hello. Yeah. Okay. I have the privilege of, of, of talking um, after my colleagues. So, so I. Uh, I've, um, I've, um, I agree totally with, with, with what they said. Um, the, the ABC group is, 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 is important uh, and, um, because we are like-minded uh, and we certainly want to achieve a, a, a common goal and that is to, 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 to see a significant lowering of crime in, in, in Jamaica. So, that ha that uh, has, but we, we also, you from the European Union side, we have identified Jamaica as having a, 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 a quite strong uh, public management, and uh, therefore, uh, compared to many uh, other countries, we uh, we have identified Jamaica as one of the countries where we are privileging um, uh, budget support. So it's actually the Jamaican government that is in the driving seat, and we identify what we like inside the Jamaican government and say, hey, we, uh, this is pretty good. Would, would you like us to top up and, and do more together with you? And in that process, we identify uh, benchmarks and, and, and so on. But, but basically, it's the, it's the Jamaican government that is in the driving seat for the citizen security program. Um, in, when it comes to a spotlight, uh, there we basically just provide the funds to, to, uh, to the UN, uh, knowing that the UN ha has uh, four um, agencies working together with a common strategic goal to, uh, to implement the Spotlight Initiative, which is funded, by the way, with 500 million uh, euros worldwide. <coughs> Um, so uh, we, we are fully aware of, uh, of, um, of uh, this serious problem of coordination, of uh, avoiding to, to, to trip uh, over one another. But, uh, so one way is, is actually to, to empowering the, 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 the national government with, with whom you are working. Brilliant. Thank you. So I think I see two questions. Just a reminder to um, keep your questions very brief so that we can have enough time for discussion. So I'll start on my left here, and then we go to um, Joanna, and we can have the answer for both of them. Then I see Diana would like to ask a question as well. Good day again. Andrew, go here again. I just want to use this um, forum to really big up the organization who have been assisting Jamaica with funds and other um, support. I have a concern though. I know especially UK you said you, you, are, go, you are going into another phase of plan. But as you go into your, your phases of plans, I am hoping that you have taken into consideration that um, COVID and high gas price has really eroded some of the um, the good we have done at the community level. The communities are struggling, especially the community-based organization. Um, in some cases, volunteerism is dead, right? So it's dead because a number of persons have made volunteerism their career. A number of persons have volunteered to the detriment of their life, meaning that if some of us would have looked back in hindsight, would have said that, it would have been better if we got rich and donated some of our money to the community. But, but persons are struggling. Persons have gone to meetings, used their own bus fare, used their own resources just to keep the community um, development process going. But it's hurting. And the impact it is having is that their children are looking on and don't want to be a part of the process because they have seen their 
uncle, the aunts, the niece, the nephews who have volunteered so much, but to, to what extent? So I'm asking that in your program, you try to see how we can assist the volunteers some more and how we can strengthen the community-based organization they are struggling. One other thing that I want to propose is that um, COVID has brought Zoom to us. And I think Zoom or any platform, any virtual platform like that can help the community level. Why I say this is because a number of our bright minds at the community level don't want to come to face-to-face -face meeting because they don't want to mix with some persons at the community level. And if we can use those platforms to engage, and we've started it already, to start to engage um, some of the persons at the tertiary level, some persons, some sixth form persons, upper six and lower six, who really want to be a part of the community development process but don't want to come out because how the community is and relates to crime and violence. If we can, in our, in our plan, to see how we can help the community to utilize those platforms to assess the community development process. Thank you so much. Good morning. So I've heard several of the donors talk about gender-based violence. I'm going to play devil's advocate here. So we usually talk about gender-based violence in the respect with the women and girls being the victims. But especially in many of our, you know, a setting in Jamaica where a lot of these mothers are raising their kids by themselves, and women being the main conveyors of social norms in Jamaica, um, Violence is normalized in the household, especially when the absentee father is there. Then the frustration of the absentee father is taken out on the child, especially the male boy child who might represent the absentee father. So going forward, what plans do you have to include from that perspective gender-based violence as it affects young boys in the home who, when they grow up, are the main proponents of violence in our community? Thank you, um, Joanna. Can we get some responses and then we go to Diana? <laughs> That's a, an excellent question, Joanna. And uh, we are operating on the premise that to protect our women who are really the victims of, of violence, we have to deal with the root causes of violence. And the program will continue to do so by, by um, looking at the root causes um, of, of violence in the home and in the schools and also in the communities. Uh, Frederick spoke about the 12th the 20th government's 25 school strategy, which is part of the overall uh, citizen security program. And um, what we are considering is to intervene through that process. The 25 school strategy, essentially, um, the government has identified some of the worst performing schools in the in, in, in the Zozo areas and in about 20 communities. The communities that are affected by high levels of crime and violence. And so the interventions will start through the schools because when you go into the schools, you are getting the children, you're getting the teachers, you're getting the parents, you're reaching the communities. And through that process, through the families, um, a number of the, 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 and I will say that the idea is, because we're not responsible for implementation, but the plans are to provide that holistic support to the community. So the children with um, psychosocial case management support, literacy support, the families as well, um, also the young boys, young girls, and um, looking at social norms, how do they see women, how do they interact with girls. So this, this, this space, the school community will be the start to enter those communities. Um, 
also we recognize that certainly in the Jamaican context, the males tend to be the major uh, perpetuate, perpetuate, perpetrators, ah, perpetrators of violence, and they're also the main victims as well of violence. Um, but women also experience violence in a different way, and that violence is hidden. So we will also be carving out a space um, to support some of the work that the EU is doing as well, just to target girls, women, women as community leaders, women as um, part of the solution to, to, to violence, because women are the nurturers, women, they're the, the, it's their sons who are, are involved. So uh, the interventions will also be looking at gender-based violence, which is a very important strategic objective of the UK's um, uh, development objectives as well uh, globally. So we would expect to, to place a priority there as well. And we have with us um, the, our High Commissioner Judith Slater, the first female um, High Commissioner to Jamaica. And uh, I'm sure she will be pushing to ensure that, that we get that going. So Judith, um, if you want to add anything, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, we have. Very groups. Uh, continue. Thank you for raising the subject of volunteers. Uh, the, the invisible hands, uh, the, 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 the ordinary persons who are in the shadows working hard uh, out of, uh, the, uh, with their own enthusiasm and uh, their internal drive to improve things without demanding anything in contribution just except for seeing some positive results are commendable and they shall always always be remembered thank you for raising it because this is something i will come back to um, in ha half of my of my delegation uh, is composed of project managers in uh, in development uh, issues and um, we, um, we, we attach a lot of importance to CSOs. CSOs, as you know, um, uh, are uh, working pro bono. Uh, uh, most of them, uh, there are just a few that maybe have, uh, are, are paid at a high management level, uh, and they're also working much more than uh, that their salary uh, uh, is requ required them to do. But uh, the immense majority in CSOs are um, uh, volunteers, I would say, and uh, the, the, this is just another example of how the civil, without the civil society, without engaged personal engagement, wanting us to be citizens uh, and participating uh, to contribute to a better society, the society will, will crumble. So uh, we are already doing a lot to help CSOs, um, but uh, con considering the, the, the need is, is, is very, is probably too, too little, uh, but uh, volunteers are also uh, very vulnerable in different uh, citizen security programs. They are the ones who work closely uh, to those who want to get out of there. And uh, there was an incident uh, in uh, the um, uh, uh, in the Spotlight Initiative, uh, I think close to Southern Lamar, when one of the when one of the participants were, was actually killed, uh, um, and it shows how exposed uh, the the, the, um, the the people working on the ground are. Uh, uh, those who are trying to to, to, to to make a difference. So. Uh, I have no ideas on how to do it, but I think that the first thing is to recognize their importance and, and see how it can be seen and how we also um, tell those who are trying to assist how important that these are. We, it's not just us.
providing the money, uh, the government, uh, the officials coming down. The, 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 uh, without the work of the volunteers, we wouldn't achieve anything. So thank you so much for raising this subject. Uh, if I could say a couple of words uh, on volunteers and also on gender-based violence. Um, it's off, the, the volunteer issue brings uh, me the opportunity to promote again my Canada Fund for Local Initiatives. Uh, but the Canada Fund for Lo Local Initiatives, which I just described a bit, was these small projects under a, a fairly short framework, about eight to ten months. And why? And, and, and I think the question had to do with how do we broaden the number of volunteers? How, how do we broaden the number of people involved in, in resolving these community issues? And uh, I humbly suggest that the Canada Fund provides that kind of opportunity because this may come as a surprise, but applying for a, an international donor grant is actually quite complex. Um, it's very complex, but this this project provides you provides you know groups that have never made an application to an international organization. Uh, to do that in a reasonable way where they don't have to uh, fill out a hundred different forms and also provides them uh, mostly with opportunities for success in a, in a really contained area. So I think what I'm trying to put besides the Canada Fund for Local Initiatives is, is, the, uh, is the idea of small independent projects that are community-based as a really good way to, you know, to gain momentum within communities to, to do things. And just on gender-based violence as well, I, I, I say that uh, uh, our, we have a requirement that all projects, that everything we do uh, overseas is examined at one point through a gender lens. And that includes gender-based violence. So I think that, that, that need, that reaction automatically to how does it impact women, and by virtue of that also, how does it impact violence for women. It, it, you know, if you consider that in everything you do, and it will involve women in it, and in the solution, and drawing up the project and programs, uh, it's beneficial for everybody concerned. The, the one regret I do have after four years is I never really felt that we've really tackled how we involve boys and men in this issue. I think we still struggle a bit with that um, in terms of, you know, getting the participation, not just as champions, but as people that understand the issue and also look at their own actions with respect to this issue, whether, they're, whether they actually do are violent or just look the other way when violence occurs. So... Uh, yeah, it's. Are we, are, I think we could be doing a better job, to be honest with you. But it's hard to get. Actually, it's hard to get attention when it's you saying you're doing something for boys. You know, um, it's it's very difficult. It's more difficult for me, to be honest with you, to get that kind of funding. Uh, thank you. I will. Um, I will now. Kevin's enthusiasm uh, prevent me to, to, to go into the gender-based violence I was just about, but so he was eager to, to, to talk. So now, now it's my turn. Um, the, um, what strikes me is um, how important education is. The 25-year school program is a drop in the ocean. In fact, it's all the 70, 150, so some schools of Jamaica that needs uh, to be involved. The, um, the fact that, uh, I mean, elite schools are good because we need elites also. But more importantly, we need a, 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 a more important than elite schools, we need, we need a uniform, high level quality in all schools. And uh, the COVID pandemic showed us how much, in fact, uh, how much discrepancy there is and how much distance there is be between the poor schools and the and Campion and uh, Hillel and we, we know them all, the, 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 the best, brightest schools where the more affluent children are going and succeeding in life. But um, we, need a, a, we need a stable school system that provides stability to all children. We have an indicator, I'm struck. Uh, when I started university, we were 50-50 in my university in London, Sweden. And uh, now it's progressing more towards uh, the 
between 55 and 60 percent. But UE, it's 70 percent. This is an indicator of the failure of integrating boys into the education system. Violence is often a way of finding another way of imposing uh, your own will to achieve a, a, a result. It's a way of bullying, it's a, it's a way of instilling fear, but it's also an expression of frustration. And uh, the, um, if, uh, I mean, where we are going in many countries of the world, increasing, including Jamaica, is that we will very soon have a system where the public service will be just composed of very bright, energetic, and capable, competent women. And that will create even more frustration. So if we want to have a balanced society, we need an egalitarian society where everyone is, is, is participating. In the <clears throat> and I don't see the boys in Jamaica doing that to the extent that it will contribute to stability in the country. So the school system is, uh, yes, it's not just the, the worst of schools, the failing schools. It's the middle range schools and their ability to provide a, a, a proper future for, uh, for, for Jamaican boys as well. I mean, the girls are, are super working super hard. Uh, we, we are just employing one person who came for a, from a disenfranchised school in Black River. Uh, and uh, she graduated from, from UE with the highest, uh, but she did it our own will. You know, she worked hard. She did it. And this is what we need to instill and, and present as an alternative to the boys. Uh, the crime is very much a result of realizing that in my position, I'm so far to get a job that is stable, secure, and able to provide to those I, I love. So they, they many, many choose the, the, the short cut. And, and that, that, this alternative, this decision to go for the shortcut or the, or the difficult path needs to be n narrowed down to, I, it's not going to be too difficult to, to, to go the hard way. Thank you um, so much. Yeah, I think quite a lot has been said, and I know Diana has a question. So um, just to flag, I think a couple important things came from this um, discussion in terms of gender-based violence and volunteerism. And I think one of the things that a number of entities, especially at the community level, talk about is the unwillingness of donors at different levels to provide the kind of support to people in terms of salary, right? They argue that um, in some cases, salary is not allowed or the kind of salary that should be paid is not being, um, there's no room to do that. So I think we ought to come back to that and I'm happy we touched on the whole issue of education because I think one thing that is clear when you talk to people who are working, even the violence interruption program, they talk about boys, for example, and how illiteracy fuels the crime and violence in um, communities. And so perhaps we can talk a little bit more about what kind of support in terms of educational support to the government, whether through budgetary assistance or other initiatives are planned and how that will help in terms of crime and violence. And then I'm going to come back to Joanna's question as well if we don't have any more questions. But Diana, and then we have Horace. I'd like to use the opportunity to well, thank the Canadians. They actually supported a study that Capri is launching tonight on gender-based violence in the media. So tune in. We're streaming online at 8 o'clock. And I'm leaving here to moderate that discussion. Uh, but I want to step back a little bit in terms of what we've been talking about and ask two kind of broader questions. One is, you know, all three of you talked about the many programs that you've been working with, the large amounts of money that you've been putting into Jamaica. How do you explain to your governments, your taxpayers, why despite all of this, Jamaica's murder rate has stayed stubbornly high? And, you know, I don't know if the an actual uh, objective analysis of the data would bear this out, but it seems to be even getting more horrendous. That's one. And two is the issue of ownership and dependency. Um, and this is something that all of us who rely on donor funds have to grapple with. Um, 
which is to what extent are we as Jamaicans really taking responsibility for these problems if we are not putting forward the resources to solve it ourselves? You know, if it is that it, it, if we have to rely on our donors to be doing work that appears to be needed to be done, but we're not funding it ourselves, does, does it suggest that we really think it needs to be done? I wonder how you how you process that um, that idea in in deciding what you're going to do, who you're working with, and what you're going to work on. The, the panel has been focusing on many individual uh, areas, gender base, the, the necessity for education of the, the boys, a very, very important point, I thought, and so on, uh, and the volunteer question. And uh, at the same time, there seems to be a fairly broad agreement in the panel um, about the, the, the whole problem of crime and violence. And Sharon's going beyond the, the crime to point out the, the roots of violence uh, before it becomes crime and the necessity for, for dealing with these roots was very striking. Uh, on the other hand, yesterday it was pointed out that part of the failure of the consensus on crime, which was an achievement in itself, but has stalled, is the absence of a common understanding of the problem uh, in the country and at the governmental level and between the political parties no common understanding and so I'm wondering if the international donors have explicitized have reached an agreement themselves on what that common problem is have you reached an understanding of what the problem facing Jamaica is and if so, have you made it explicit? And if so, among yourselves? And if so, what is the possibility of conveying your conviction to the state, to the main actors here, who are deciding how the problem is to be addressed? I, I'm, I'm wondering if this is a possibility, a way of getting... The, the, the chief actors here, the chief deciders, uh, to appreciate this common understanding which you may have achieved. Thank you, Horace. So let's get some quick responses. Um, I don't know if you want to start, Friedrich. Friedrich, sorry. This is a tricky question to venture out. <laughs> We are, uh, we are here as uh, guests. We are here, we are here as diplomats. Uh, Jamaica is a sovereign country. And uh, it's not our intention, not our purpose, um, to dictate uh, conditions to uh, a sovereign state. We want to partner with Jamaica, especially since Jamaica is a democracy. Jamaica belongs to the community of democracies, and this is why the European Union finds it's really, really, really worthwhile, especially in today's times where we have the terrible Russian invasion of Ukraine, to see that there is solidarity among the, dem the community of, of democracies to stand up for international law, for a uh, world that is uh, uh, governed by human rights, respect for one another. So in there we have a very close partnership with Jamaica and we appreciate what they're doing. We also appreciate what they're doing uh, in many ways in a domestic field, but it is a, a sovereign country. 
And we have taken the approach to do budget supports, namely identifying areas where we think that Jamaica is doing worthwhile uh, interventions and we would like to boost these interventions. And then there is also what is said behind uh, closed doors about what we think and next week European Union is holding its annual political dialogue with Jamaica. We have uh, some high-level officials coming down, uh, both from from development side, from the political side. We have our ambassadors. We have ambassadors from European member states that will talk with Jamaica. But this is behind closed doors, of course. But we will see what we have in common. We will see where we have differences. Death penalty, for instance. But we do this out of in, in a spirit of mutual respect. And there is a certain limit how much you can um, influence. But we are here. And we think it's worth being here. And we will continue being here. The European Union has just uh, uh, um, finalized its next, next development cycle, 2021-2027. So we know what we are going to do. And we are showing to Jamaica we are not letting you down. We will continue, but we will also continue talking, discussing in a, a spirit of mutual respect on what we think is good. So, this is about my what I can say. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I don't know, Sharon, would you like to take the question, tough question posed by Diana? Yes. Well, I'm I'm happy that I don't have to account to the British tax bills. I think Judith has that. <laughs> <laughs> has that responsibility. But I would say, though, that, yes, there's been a significant amount of resources that have gone into um, investing in violence, crime. Um, have we invested effectively? Have we invested efficiently? Have we done the things that have will re result in the outcomes? I think w the and so it's probably not in all cases. And also remember that the donor community, yes, has made the investments, but also Jamaica itself has made those investments. And so if we're going to look at really what is not working, and that's why when we decided to um, enter this third phase, we saw the, 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 the idea was to really look at what is not working. And that was one of the reasons why we decided that even though the systemic approach, even though investing in, in, in changing systems will not bring you a lot of accolades, it's not quote unquote sexy, but um, it's perhaps the right thing to do. And um, I would not say also that there has not been positives from the investments made so far. However, could there have been more impact? And I think, yes, there could be impact. Um, there are obviously governance issues. There are also issues relating to um, how decisions are taken. But again, those are decisions also, as, as Frederick said, really that partnership that comes from the development community recognizes that the government is in the driver's seat. And therefore, it's to supplement those resources that are provided by the government. Whatever resources here that are provided will never solve the problem of, of, of crime and violence. That has to be done through the government, through the system, through Jamaicans. And so this support that's offered is offered on the basis of a program, on the basis it's now the the CSP was, CSJP was looking more at the Unite for Change uh, methodology. This now is looking more at the citizen security plan. Um, in terms of the, the decision making, 
in, in, in the case of the British High Commission, would also look at experiences globally, would look at the evidence globally, and to see what have others done that can assist in moving the process forward. And, um, and this will guide the interventions. Of course, the relations are very open, very strong, built on a very strong foundation. And the discussions can take place very quietly um, in terms of the difficult issues. Those are not usually discussed in the media, I mean, but, but the discussions do happen, those, but with the respect and recognition that there are interests on both sides, and, um, and so far I think they have pro proven to be quite um, constructive. Thank you um, so much, Sharon. So in the break, because I think we've been talking a little bit about sovereignty as well and, you know, ownership of the initiatives to address um, citizen security. And in the break, Diane and I and um, Kevin, we mentioned about uh, a, a strong perception among the Jamaican people that the government is not in the driver's seat, that the agenda is being driven by our donors, um, particularly our bilateral um, partners, and that that is part of the constraint why we are not seeing as much um, impact as we should. And so I'd love to hear from you, um, what can we do or what can you do in cooperation with the government of Jamaica to make it very clear to the Jamaican people who is in charge and who is deciding what interventions are happening. Because I can tell you quite often I go to the gym, for example, and someone says to me, it's your people from foreign who decide what needs to happen and they don't understand the context here, so that is why nothing can be done. So um, I don't know which one of you would love to answer that one. <laughs> I'll answer it just because I think it's my turn. <laughs> but, um, yeah, in terms of whether Jamaica is doing enough, I, I, I'm probably not in, I don't really feel qualified to answer that, to be honest with you. But what I can say and comment on is that relationship that often develops between donor and receiving country over time can, can muddy the waters a little bit. And... Um, and it's important that countries themselves put quite a bit into it. Otherwise, they don't have the ownership of the problem. They don't, they, you know, and also, we need the involvement of the Jamaican government um, to identify key areas that's important to them. We know our, we have a good idea of what our interests are, but we need to see it from their perspective more often. And that's why, like uh, with Frederick here, uh, the government of Canada in, um, undergoes uh, has uh, uh, yearly consultations with the government of Jamaica in which we list, you know, uh, first of all, we have a record of, you know, what we decided before and then we see where we are on that continuum and then there's opportunities to add new things. So that's our main opportunity to get, you know, to get involvement, uh, to get uh, a better idea of what Jamaica needs and from their perspective. So that offers us government to government ability to do that. And uh, I just say that um, one thing I, w I talked about, the relationship between donor and receiving country, it's changing with the government of Canada with respect to Jamaica. It used to be, uh, you know, that very strictly that relationship. And I think it's become much more of a, as Jamaica has, uh, has, 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 uh, in, has found better economic stability and uh, and done a number of really good jobs on a lot of aspects of their society and economy. And it's become more of a partnership. I'd like to describe it as a partnership. But, um, so I think the consultations that we do every year uh, go a long way to, uh, to promote that partnership. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. I think we have five more minutes left, and so I want to turn the last five minutes um, to the whole matter of implementation, because it's very clear that what we have is not a dearth of 
ideas and programs, but how we implement and how do we actually not just monitor but evaluate what is being done to ensure effectiveness. And I, I pointed to the um, Capri report, which was I, I think released last year or maybe two years ago, about some of the social interventions um, for crime and violence and just how right across government there was a dearth of information about how effective these initiatives were and this was millions and millions of dollars. So for the last um, couple of minutes I'd like each of you to really help us understand what are you doing as partners um, in this fight for crime to improve citizen security, to ensure effective implementation, but importantly evaluation of the initiatives being undertaken so we can apply the lessons learned. I'm going to just go in here. Um, the, the, uh, the citizen security program, like all the other uh, development programs that we um, um, that we do together with the government of Jamaica, uh, as I said, are in the form of budget support. Budget support means that we identify what we think is uh, a, a good policy, and then we, we, we see can we do more in order to boost it. Uh, but it's not a blank check. Um, money is provided uh, only after certain benchmarks, certain criteria, uh, certain indicators have been formulated. And there is a yearly um, um, exposed uh, uh, control of uh, um, that, uh, that these benchmarks have been met in order to be able to pay the next charge. So it's not, you know, uh, then check and, and then we leave and we come back after five years and then we scratch our heads of what happened. So, so really, the, 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 and I, I can tell you that I think that I want to that you need the PhD uh, in European law in order to, to, to fill in all the, all the papers and sometimes they wonder if it's really worth doing it because of the amount of time you need to so, joke apart, it's, uh, it, there, there, is, there is a quite a significant control. And there are also, um, uh, and we, we, we would not ne never continue with the program in, in, if many of these indicators were, were, were not met. I'm not just talking about citizen security, I'm talking about many other programs uh, in justice reform, uh, but environmental issues and, and, and so on. So there are a lot of successes. There are a lot of successes. It's just the, 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 the problem is the regeneration of the new criminals. So yes, you can address those who are into criminality, but if you have a, a structures that are just generating more criminals, that supersede the number of people that you ma actually manage to, to achieve and which whom you have very, very good results, but at the end of the day, the aggregate, aggregate figures will show you that not much has happened. But when you go down on, on the figures, you actually see that Yes, there have been very spectacular, good results in certain communities. The amount of, 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 of people that have, have started a new life and, and, and so on. So I think that what uh, some have said here today is how, how, how do we address the, the crime generating part and not just who are engaged in crime, who, are we, who we are dealing with. And that, that's the key to success. What, how do we identify the, 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 the negative uh, generators of, uh, of crime? And, and most likely, many of the programs don't address that specifically enough, but focus mainly on those who are already engaged in crime and see how to get them out from it. Thank you so much. So Sharon, are we just checking the boxes and ignoring the root causes? Because for a lot of people, although so much has happened, it, it, it appears to be even more grimy than ever before. And as they say in dancehall, it brawling. <laughs> well, let me just say that all the programs that are implemented by the UK government are evaluated. There are annual reviews, they're evaluated midstream, and they're evaluated independently at the end of the program. And those reports are public. So, and basically that's really what one uses to develop your programs going forward. So everything that's done by the UK, 
the programs are evaluated as to their effectiveness. Do they achieve the results that we want sometimes? Sometimes not, but that's also learning because it's, there are no perfect answers. This is really a very complex issue, as someone said earlier. And therefore, we're all learning as we, as we go along. There are, of course, there's global evidence and there is even evidence within government, within our own experience as to what works and what does not work. And so you can, um, can, can base your interventions on those. But certainly when it comes to the evaluation and seeing the effectiveness of the programs they work. Now, when you talk about crime and violence, people tend to just focus at the end point, the criminals. But as we heard in the recent report that was issued by the, um, by the, the review of the education sector, the Patterson report, we have to go back at the beginning. So everything affects somebody doesn't become a criminal overnight. So it comes right through the system. Now, some evaluations are very difficult. You have to go over many, over generations, that kind of evaluation. And we tend not to have the capacity and the resources to do those long-term evaluations. But clearly, the interventions that affect crime, when it gets to the police stage, that's really the, where you have lost. You have, but really to begin, it's the underlying factors that we really have to address. And it takes time. It takes time. This, this criminality didn't happen last week or last month. It's going to take time. It's going to take resources. And it's going to take coordination and integration, addressing the problems from various um, angles um, concurrently. So that's really my, my bit on that. And I think we have one or two more minutes. Um, oh, we, we, we are we're done, unfortunately. Um, so we're going to miss Kevin, but thank you all for, you know, so participating. And I think we can continue to have further conversations over lunch. Um, thank you all, and thanks to our panelists for a very, very good discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, lunch is served to your left. Uh, Please enjoy yourselves. We're going to be starting back promptly at 1.20.
Good afternoon. Welcome back after the eight minutes. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> At this time, I I'd like to initiate the morning, the afternoon sessions, and we're going to now have Dr. Jacqueline Roden Trader uh, take the floor. Dr. Trader. Pleasant good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I know that you've had a wonderful lunch, but that lunch was not Bella got pot, so you should be wide awake. All righty. I am a sociology of law criminologist uh, who is an associate professor at Coppin State University in Baltimore, Maryland. But I am a daughter of Jamaica, born and reared, Barton St. Catherine. Barton's All Age School, St. George's Anglican Church, and so I am Medea Yad. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Today, um, those people from foreign, them, <laughs> are here to talk to you about addressing crime, violence, and justice in the United States, looking at the lens of human rights, police reform community policing, and credible messengers, and asking the poignant question of who will develop the plan. Before we start, when I was here yesterday, there were a few queries about crime, violence, criminal violence, differentiating it. And since this is our topic, I thought it was our responsibility to contextualize it for the way that we will be presenting. So crime, a violation, of the legal codes of society, it's just that. Society has said these things are a violation, they obstruct the normal pattern and routine of government, of systems, and that's what it is. Violence, just physical force, threats against people. Criminal violence is the threatening of violence, and I believe that as we have been talking for a day and a half, criminal violence is the output, the manifestation, the way in which people decide to go about their business, to handle their business, their, their problems with each other. And so it's in that context that we bring our presentation. We're academics, so we can't get away from statistics. That's why we got these PhDs, because we took an oath of sorts to look at evidence and evidence. And so I just want to say that we come here today to talk about the United States, but I want to preface it by saying that we do not come thinking that the United States is any authority or has all of the answers. The United States has its own problems. Our cities and states where we reside have its own problems. Jamaica is not unique in many respects. It's a global epidemic of violence that we're all experiencing. And here's some statistics. In the year 2020, that's the year I will use, Across the United States, there were 21,570 persons who died of homicide. That, in fact, was a 30% increase from 2019. In 2020, the state of Connecticut, which is the size of Jamaica, whenever you hear people say Jamaica, well, it's the size of Connecticut. In 2020, there were 140 murders in Connecticut. 182 violent crimes. In Maryland, the state where I reside, in 2020, there were 553 homicides. Baltimore City, which is the second highest crime rate city in the United States of America, had 337 homicides that year. I just said Baltimore is in Maryland. That means that almost two thirds of the homicides that occurred in, Bal in, in Maryland occurred in Baltimore City, the city where I reside. So I've got problems, you've got problems, we've got problems. Jamaica in 2020 had 1,323 homicides. In the year 2017, that number was higher, 1,647. As academics, we'd like to figure out, well, why? What happened in 27, et cetera, et cetera. So, those are just the numbers. Today, we've got five of my wonderful colleagues with me who are going to discuss their work in different parts of the United States. First up, we've got Dr. Bahia Mohammed. Dr. Mohammed 
is a well sought after criminologist at Howard University located in Washington, D.C. She is a founding director of the um, Howard University Higher Education Prison Program, and she will share information about that. She founded an, a phenomenal program called Policing Inside Out, aimed at engaging community, college students, and law enforcement officers with each other to bridge the gulf that exists in Jamaica, in Baltimore, in America, in England, everywhere, people. And <laughs> She also uh, serves as the PI for the Mellon Just Futures Social Justice Consortium Initiative. So at this time, I'd like to have Dr. Bahia Mohammed to speak specifically about human rights as it relates to crime and violence in the United States. Yes, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure uh, to be here. Over the last couple of days, I've just listened into the dialogue and really have appreciated this opportunity for understanding very complex issues, very, very complex. One of the things that I think is very important is that we remember the children, remember the youngest individuals around us. One of the things that we all have in common in this room is that we are all children. There's not one individual in this room, regardless of their origin, their makeup, their religion, their race, their age, their gender, and I could go on and on, that didn't start in that very vulnerable, young, nimble space. When we think about crime and when we think about violence, oftentimes we get caught up in the romanticization of it, which the United States of America does very well. There are hundreds of television shows that romanticize the incarceration of parents, of children, of young individuals, that shows the vicious violence of it that entices individuals to continue to watch, continue to tap, continue to like on social media. What we forget to understand is that the children are a vital component in solving the solution. So when we talk today about this question of who should develop the plan, we must also remember that the children have new minds, minds that are still connected to the gods, minds that are still nimble, minds that can still be formed, minds that we have no capacity to understand how far they can actually go. And they too must be included in the equation for solving and addressing crime. Much of the work that I've done in the United States looks at the special relationship that is created when law enforcement officers arrest adults in the presence of children. Oftentimes we find that there are no protocols in place to identify mechanisms for what to do. There's an article that I published in 2019 called Kick in the Door, Wave in the 4-4. This was an article that looked at how black families were succumbed to the violence of having their home doors kicked in without any protocol and reprimand for what was actually happening to the children themselves. Why? Because oftentimes when you think about individuals who commit crimes, automatically by default we say that their children are going to just go down that same path. Well, my work looks at success and resilience among children of incarcerated parents. And what we are finding across the nation and around the globe is that the children of incarcerated parents are reaching back into generations and communities and helping individuals. And not all of them are ending up on that same path and that same road. When we think about the Jamaican context, it's very important when we think about luxury scammers to understand that when individuals are throwing parties, when individuals are renting hotel rooms, when individuals are purchasing beautiful luxury vehicles, there's a car seat in some of those vehicles. And the children has an opportunity to sit alongside the breeze when the windows are down. And so there are instances where love continues to manifest regardless of the nature of a crime. And so we must always continue to be reminded of ourselves and that childhood. If we continue to make policies that forget about the young individuals, at the end of the day, you're only forgetting about yourself because each of you are all children. When I think about the rights of children, I want you all to consider and understand that children have the right to be kept safe and informed when their parents are arrested. 
Much of the time, education is out of the preface. I have a course at Howard University called Policing Inside Out, where we bring in the families and the children to work alongside with law enforcement to ha ask questions and have them answered. Oftentimes, we think that children should be seen and not heard. But if you don't answer their questions, you create a psychological nightmare almost in their minds. Developmentally appropriate conversations are important when we think about social mechanisms for providing support. And one way to do that is produce children's books. I have seven books for children of incarcerated parents that speaks about reentry, that speaks about incarceration, that speaks about arrest, so that you can educate them. What I found was that my PhD students in the university were asking the same questions that the seven and eight year olds that I was interviewing were asking as well. And so please never forget about the intelligence of the young individuals that each of you were in the seats many years ago. As we watch and look how crime happens, you have to be reminded that what you see, they also see. What you feel, they also feel. What you desire, they also desire. We cannot throw away the children and their future because of what we think of their parents. We are all humans. And let's also be reminded that all of the individuals who are committing crimes, even at 17 or 14, some of them are actual parents. In the United States of America, 70% of incarcerated individuals are parents, which means that the majority of incarcerated individuals are parents. So right now we are dealing with a population in the United States where there are more children that are affected by incarceration than those that are sitting in the seats of incarceration. When we think about the human rights of individuals, there are small implementations that can happen, having conversations with the children. Being able to give them a journal and let them write out what their questions are and find ways of being able to support. When individuals witness an arrest, being able to explain and understand what policing is. There are thousands of books out there on policing and individuals can learn about those sort of things. Not every child that has a negative interaction with police hates them. And I learned that in my Policing Inside Out class where many of the youth in those classes were raised and brought up to hate law enforcement and they started to question it because they saw the humanity in the individuals who were in those classrooms. So we can't just throw away that population because it's a large population that's actually solving solutions, right? These are the individuals that are volunteering for organizations. These are the individuals that are giving back and the individuals that are going up to making millions of dollars through social media and providing money back into their parishes, into their communities, into their continents, and into their villages. Be reminded that children have a right not to be judged, not to be blamed, not to be labeled. They have a right to a lifelong relationship with their parents. Of all of the children that I interviewed, 89% of them wanted a lifelong relationship with their parents. They talked about their parents that were strung out on drugs and prior to going out to committing some offense, they put the food inside of the baby's crib. They made sure that they packed the book bag up for the child that had to go to school. So there are these different dualities of humanality, criminality and crime that intertwined. The intersectionality of all of this is very important and we cannot forget our culture and what we come from. Yes, crime is major, crime is a big thing, but we have to lean in to what it means here and everywhere else to love ourselves and be able to love the children and make sure that we are making new ways and resources for them as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohammed. And I forgot to mention that the Mohammed experience that you see pictured here, this is the Dr. Mohammed of the Mohammed experience. Thank you. Uh, next up, we'll have um, Dr. Tyrone Powers. And Dr. Tyrone Powers will be speaking about police reform. Dr. Powers is a former FBI agent, former law enforcement officer, and a scholar. He's a scholar, he deals with criminalization of blacks in America. He's also an author. He's sought after by the news media across the United States to speak on violence, crime, 
When big things happen, Dr. Powers is on my TV. Dr. Powers, you've got next. Thank you. And thank you all for having me. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for my colleagues and this extraordinary panel. And I am going to respect the seven minutes and 25.3 seconds I've been given to speak. And so if you have some other questions that I can engage you in, we can um, do it in the question and answer period. But I am going to respect our leader because she's trying to keep everything in order. And I respect that. Thank you very much. Dr. Davis here has a clock here. <laughs> to monitor me because once I start speaking, um, God knows where we're going to go with that. But let me see. I think we had a PowerPoint that, um, but let me, let me just say this as we start, as they begin to um, work out the technical difficulties in the next five to eight minutes and 38 seconds. <laughs> Are you serious? You let me get a wonderful introduction out, then I got to pass it to Dr. Davis. Wow. Very well. You know, we're going to pretend, when you're in church, not pretend, when you're in church, they say, not in the Anglican church, because we don't say much in the Anglican church, but in the Baptist and the Church of God church, they say that the, the lines between the um, program or the bulletin or whatever is for the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is working his magic. So we are going to go to Dr. Davis, but let me properly introduce him. All righty. Dr. DeLacy Davis <laughs> is also a very sought after uh, scholar uh, in the United States, particularly even on the East Coast of the United States. Uh, he's a former uh, law enforcement officer. Uh, he started um, a company, an agency, Black Cops Against Police Brutality. Um, regrettably, we need that because although officers have taken a sworn duty to serve and to protect, those officers who are persons of color that are black also experience racism, experience a lot of issues that are sometimes in conflict with their own ethos, yet they have to go on and do the job that they've sworn to take. And so Dr. Davis does not shy away from speaking about the realities of what goes on when you are serving while black. He is results driven, passionate, about community activism for policing that can result to social change. Dr. Davis, you're on. I think I'm getting the same bug that um, Dr. Powers had, so I'm just going to talk until my slide pops up. <laughs> um, let me thank everyone for the opportunity to be here. Certainly, I'm honored to be here. Um, and, and this has been an awesome experience. Uh, I was last here. I was here in 92, 90, 92 as a musician in 95. We came in with the National Black Police Association, and again in 96, we hosted a conference, and I was here with Dr. Powers, so I'm excited to be back. Um, he's gotten a little older. I'm still the same age, but he looks good for his age. I'm going to def definitely stick to the time limit. I think I got nine minutes, Dr. Powers. And so Dr. Powers is going to lay out some things. Um, Dr. Muhammad laid out and talked about not forgetting the children. And so I want to talk about community policing, transformation, and reform in the context of the United States and the experiences that we had to have. And so as a public administrator now and researching implicit bias and police behavior and use of force, um, while on duty, certainly I founded Black Cops Against Police Brutality. And I founded it because at that time in 1991, we had just seen Rodney King. And as a young rookie officer with about five years on the job, I just could not understand what I was observing. I also became a police officer to finance my music career. So I didn't understand any of the violence that I saw by the police. And so I started an organization while on the police force. And needless to say, 17 of my 20 years I spent fighting my own colleagues because they just insisted that if I wanted to do social work, that I should turn in the gun and badge and do social work. And I insisted that power belongs to the people, not to the police. And I took an oath to protect and serve the people, not the police. Now, that was a problem and an intersectionality that didn't exist in terms of the languaging. But what they said was, well, if we catch you in the locker room, we're going to kill you. And I wasn't fighting white officers. I want to be very clear. I am not implying that every white officer is an enemy. And I certainly know that every black and brown officer is not a friend. I was in the blackest city, in the blackest police department, with the blackest officers who were coming after my black self. And so 
I knew that my only safety was going to be in aligning with the community. And that's what we set out to do. So we started realigning. We call it community policing. I know that the, the Major General referred to it as integrated policing, and I'm fine with that. I don't challenge the, the, his um, interpretation of it. But I'll certainly talk about how we were able to infuse the philosophy of community policing throughout the, um, the police department in New Jersey. So community policing, and I just want to define it so we're speaking the same language. It's a philosophy that promotes organizational strategies that support the systemic use of partnerships problem-solving techniques to proactively address the immediate conditions that give rise to public safety issues such as crime, social disorder, and fear of crime. Now that's part of it, but it's not just that because problems should be defined by the community, not necessarily by the police, and every problem is not the same problem. And so I'm going to give you some imagery because um, Dr. Muhammad talked about the children. Well, we designed this several years ago, this image here, because there's some folks in law enforcement in the states who believe children are just criminal from the beginning. And so I took an embryo in a test tube and I had an artist put a machine gun in his hand. When they talk about drugs, guns, and alcohol. And you'll see this theme in the media images that are cast at our community, black and brown poor communities, all the time. And then I picked this image up. Because black boys, even though you see the crown at the top of his head, is a target on his back. And then here, the media impact. This was a commercial for a brew. And this, these are all in magazines. These, I'm sorry, I missed the magazine. I missed the shot. Let me go back. Here we go. So that's the target on the back. And here you have Tupac and Snoop in a magazine advertisement that's actually advertising a special brew, but it's got, and take my word for it because I can't decipher it in this time period, it's got three sixes. It has Tupac looking like the devil. They darken his eyes, they point at his ears, and then they turn the pyramids upside down in all the different imagery. And then, of course, you see Kaepernick taking a kneel, and you see former Sergeant Derek Chauvin kneeling on the neck. And so this is all in the context of community policing, which is a theoretical framework. And the criticism of community policing is that it brings the community closer to police, and they don't treat them very well, that they're going to infiltrate the community, that they're going to um, have people um, reporting information on their neighbors, on each other, on friends. But broken windows theory was the foundation of it as we know it in New York, which is simply the, this idea that um, social disorder and incivility leads to crime. And if we don't attack the small things, then the large things will occur. And we know that that didn't work very well in some departments. And so I took over a community policing unit. We took out, there were 50 cops and a half a million dollar budget. The new police chief says, look, you've been talking a lot of smack. You've been running your mouth. I'm going to give you an opportunity to put theory into practice. He gave me two police officers, no budget and said you have to raise your own money, you have to build your own partnerships in the community, and you have to reduce crime. Well, in a three-year three period, we raised $1.3 million. We developed a program from 150 kids to 2,600 kids. We reduced juvenile crime by 33% over that period, and I adopted four children that I met along the way. And so I'm, I refer to them because I don't want to name them because we're being telecast everywhere. But they were both gang members. One is a girl, gang member, Jamaican female, who I met at 11 years of age. We were arresting her in the police department for theft. Dad sentenced to life in prison, and mom was looking for help and came to the police department. So we initially started arresting, and so we need to think about how do we divert this young person out of the system. And so we put her in the Police Athletic League, that program I just described, and we began to work with her weekly. And she's also one of the children that I adopted. So by 16 years of age, my mom and I took her in. We raised her. She's now 35 years of age and flourishing with three children. But she was struggling. Her mom was struggling. And so we had to figure out how do we save her. She's a gang member. She's gang active. She's shooting at people, getting shot at. She's been shot. We had to give her some foundational skills. In addition to schooling and skills, we had to teach her a talent. Right? How, does she, how is she going to eat? I can't take care of her for the rest of her life. My mom's attitude and our approach was everyone should have some skill. Everyone should have the arts, expose them to a sport, make sure they're going to school, develop their capacity to live on their own, 
and give them a shot and create wraparound services. And we, we'll talk about that hopefully in a question and answering, but the wraparound services is a coordination of all the resources available in a community to solve whatever this problem is that's identified as a problem. And then member number two, his mother was a police officer in another part of the state and also got in trouble at 18 years of age in his senior year, going to school, doing well, setting track records across the state of New Jersey and got involved. His friend said, let's go out and put some work in. And so they went out to put some work in. And what did he do in putting in the work? They threw a Molotov cocktail, retaliating against someone. Someone died. And now they're looking at manslaughter. He was looking at 30 years to life. They offered him a deal of 15 years. His mother held him accountable, spoke at the court proceedings, and said, my son should be held accountable for his behavior. She told him to take the deal. He took the deal 15 years. He did 11 of those 15 years. He got paroled for five years. He came home. She says, I want you to mentor my son. He said, only if he wants to be mentored. He's 30 years old. When he went away, we didn't even have the iPhone. The biggest technology he had was a beeper on his hip with four lines of letters. He says, well, I do want you to mentor me. I says, fine. I'm on the island as long as you want. You don't have to vote me off. I'm out of your life as soon as you like. But you don't get a do-over. This is your last shot at this apple. Moved him two hours away from where he grew up and was banging. Started working with him. Got him into school again, got him into a skill, had him do services at my agency, and then he wanted to cook. We found a community agency to pay the $9,000 tuition for culinary arts, and now we're here to say six years later now, this young man's making about $75,000 a year working in an upscale restaurant in New York City and doing extremely well. Now, how do we do that, and how does that work for Jamaica, and what are the implications? Well, first of all, we need better coordination of the available social intervention programs, as I've heard articulated over the last several days. We need to properly resource programs. If you don't have funding, if I wasn't able to raise $1.3 million, I couldn't do any of the work that we're talking about. Additionally, thank you. Additionally, you have to have a commitment to successful outcomes, collaborative teamwork model, and flexibility built into the program design. If you're going to be rigid and structured, you're going to fail because we have to be able to come back and look at it weekly to see where we are, what's working, what's not working, and we have to not be concerned about who gets the credit. If 15 organizations are working to save one life, if that one life is saved and all 15 did the work, Whatever part of the train is where you get on and off is where you get on and off. But the commitment must be to the successful outcome, not to who gets to take a bow. I'm done. <laughs> and just like that, did you just drop a mic? I just dropped the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. We were going to give you a minute. Dr. Mohammed is going to share her leftovers. But no need. I love it. I love it. All right. Very well. Very well. I trust that you. Oh, the, your time just got up. Yeah. I'm done. That must be for Dr. Penelope. He's already <laughs> Okay. What's going on? The, the moderator is having a hard time. This minute. Very well. Okay. So sorry. All righty. Uh, Dr. Powers, are you now ready, sir? I am. Are you going to start the timer, though? So. It's all right. I'll let you know. No worries. Okay. So I'm, I'm gonna not going to take as long because I'm going to reiterate some of the things that uh, my colleague, Dr. Davis, um, have said um, in regards to um, what we're dealing with. I've been asked to speak on um, police reform. I don't think it's really that difficult. I think it has never been the skill. I think it has always been the will of police departments, police leaderships, and the purposes um, the, the, for the purpose of dramatically reducing crime and increasing life chances, and understanding of the people for the role of the police um, from its history and from its beginning. So I'll be brief in the sense that in order to deal with the issues that we're dealing with, whether they're in the United States or whether they're here in Jamaica or wherever we're dealing with them in the world, I've, I've been working with some other communities of across the world, in New Zealand and other places. The goal is always prevention, intervention, and then there have to be some consequences because, and we can talk about that later, but there's some people who, I mean, if you go out and kill four or five people, slit their throat, there's got to be some consequences because a message has got to be sent. And no group of people, no civilized society can ignore that fact and try to fix everybody when they're causing that much destruction in your own communities. And the people closest to the violence, the lady who lives next door to the people who are killing people, 
understand that we need social programs and intervention and they need help and they need to be rehabilitated, but they also want to be able to walk out their door without feeling like they are threatened every single day. They may not articulate that because they're afraid to say that. They may allow us to pontificate as philosophers and theorists and professors about long-term solutions, but what they're saying over and over again as I go into these communities is, I get that, but stop the bleeding. Just pretend that I've been shot. I've got a gaping wound in my belly, and you're talking about aftercare programs. I need you right now in this emergency room to stop the bleeding and then get me into rehabilitation and then fix me. And so when you live close to that every single day, your outlook and your perception and your view of what should be done first, second, and third is not the same. Now I'm saying we can do them in, we can do them simultaneously. We can do prevention, intervention, and do some consequences at the same time. Reuben Greenberg, who was a police chief in South Carolina when he took over the position there, said that he was not going to implement any more community policing because he said what he realized is that in the communities, the very people that he was having these community events with, whether they were cookouts and bringing people together, were having to stand next to the person who had 15 bodies, he had killed 15 <coughs> people, and they knew it, but they couldn't say it. So you were asking me to be a community with the very predators. You hadn't removed the predators. You just wanted us to be a community. So what he implemented was victim-oriented policing. And he said, this is the idea of victim-oriented policing. There will be no victims in this town, in this city, in this state. There will be no victims of police brutality. There will be no victim of rapists, of robbers, of murderers. Once we keep people from being victims, then they can come together in the community. But I'm not hanging out with the murderer next door in the drive-by shooter just because you want us to come together as a community and promote unity. You are going to have to address that first, then I'm going to give everybody a group hug. But what you are doing from your abstract and distant position is asking me to hug the very people who just killed my son or my cousin or my uncle last week, and that makes no logical sense unless you're doing academic research right. and you want to group hug the world. So I believe in prevention and intervention, but there also have to be consequences and there's a role for the police there. Dr. Uh, Davis indicated again that our children are not born in the womb. You're absolutely right. They're not murderers from birth. They're not have a machine gun in the womb. Every child born wants to succeed. They're supposed to win. The natural instinct of all children are to be successful. They're very curious, right? So curious so much that we're so busy that we don't even have time to talk to them. Ask us why the sky is blue. We have to come up with a lie because we fail signs, so we can't tell them why the sky is blue. So we give them some other notion. But they're very curious, and every single one of, one of them want to live, they want to survive. So there's something to happen once they leave the womb that we don't do, that I think many of you have spoken about, the social interaction, the social intervention, all that is extremely important, and we've got to do that. The DEA did a study to say if young people do not drink alcohol or abuse alcohol or drugs between the age of seven, of 12 and 20, then they will never abuse it. If there's intervention at that particular stage. In the United States, the greatest increase in suicide rates are children between the age of 7 and 13. Now, when you've been on this earth and already by 7, you saying I'm bailing out. Some of you have been on this earth for a very long time, and you don't even want to retire. But if you come onto this earth, and you're not, even, you're not even good at your job anymore, but you keep doing it. But when you come on this earth and by the time you reach 7 and 13, you want to leave this earth and there's something we're missing with the young people, with the children, the intervention, the education that maybe Ms. Manning we were talking about. And, and Mr. Levy, I know you got some questions. I'm waiting on your questions, though. But I know. <laughs> but I also know. So the children are born like this, so we have to intervene. I'm all for that. I'm all for the programs. I'm all for rehabilitation for people who can be rehabilitated, interceding. I visit, visited prisons across the world. I went to Sing Sing in New York to visit some prisoners there, and I wanted to intervene and change some of them. But on the other hand, when I left, I said, thank God for prisons, because some people need to be in prison. I'm just saying that. And I, I don't mean that because I want them there, and I wish that something could have been done to keep them from getting there. But when I'm sitting with you in a prison, and you're telling me about the 37 people you killed, and some people don't even know how many people you killed, I'm saying, ah, you feel me? This is kind of useless. I got some other options for you. Now, 
Along with the prevention and the intervention, Frederick Douglass said a long time ago, he explained it. We're, we're coming up with new theories, writing new research, because we're brilliant people, and we want to show people how brilliant we are. But Frederick Douglass put it simple a long time ago. Where justice is denied, where poverty is enforced, where ignorance prevails, and where any one class is made to feel that society is organized conspiracy to oppress them, then neither persons nor property will be safe. Plain and simple. So if you are not motivated to help the young people or intervene in lives for the sake of them, then intervene for the sake of you. There's something called the Frankenstein theory that, that, that we actually wrote up. And anybody remember the Frankenstein movie? I may be dating myself now. I'm relatively young, but I did see that on reruns. <laughs> Franken Dr. Frankenstein created a monster, and then the monster came up. Whatever you came up says and got him, right? Whatever you create, you will eventually confront. You want lawyers, doctors, teachers, administrators, you better create them from childhood. Because once you create a monster, you are going to confront a monster. So even if you don't want to do this because you have a kind heart, do it so you don't have to confront a monster. It's the Frankenstein thing. Whatever you and we know that in our personal relationships, right? You start giving someone you dating roses and stop about three years from now, they say, well, what happened? You feel me? Because you've created that expectation. So whatever we create, we'll eventually confront. Now, I just want to mention this briefly, Sir Robert Peel indicated um, about the nine principles of policing. And to me, even though they weren't intended for people of color, they're very simple, they're very pertinent, and they should be taught in every police academy, and anybody that can't adhere to them shouldn't actually be police officers. Let's be honest, right? Police officers have reduced themselves to control the mentality of, I'm an insurgency force, I've come in to control the people. Back to, we know the whole history of policing, and we can't get into that now, the patty rollers, slave patrols, things of that sort. And so that's the mentality, the mercenaries. They come in to control, not to help, not to protect and serve. In fact, in the United States, it was called policing up until the 1950s and 60s with the Civil Rights Movement, then we changed it to law enforcement. Law enforcement, the term force, mean that we we're going to use law, we're going to use force to make you follow the law. Damn the policing, the protect, serve and protect. We change from the terminology of policing to law enforcement, and in the terminology of law enforcement is force. So you know what we're here to do. There used to be an old television show with Dragnet. He said nothing but the facts. I don't care nothing about your social issues. So we changed. We, we changed that during the Civil Rights Movement. So these nine principles, which I'm not going to go over because I know I'm about to run I got one minute and 38 seconds. I'm about to run out of time. But I think we should review these. And if they were at the foundation of all policing, policing would work effectively. So it's the leadership of policing agencies. It's the power of police chiefs, leaders, to push back against politicians. Even if you learn, I have never loved the job so much that I was willing to compromise my integrity. I may only be there for a year, but in a year I'm going to raise some hell and change some issues and people are going to want me back even if the leadership don't. These principles, the police role is to prevent crime and disorder, recognize the power, and then look at this. This is his fourth or fifth principle, to seek and preserve public favor, not by, I, I can't read it because people are leading their head back, getting all in my way and all. Thank you, colleagues. Y'all doing well. But you all can read that yourself. For those of you who went to schools that taught you how to read, the rest of you, you can get it later on and have the person next to you read it for you. But these, these fundamental principles of policing, which were created by Sir Robert Peel, technically, as and maybe we're giving him credit for something he didn't do. There's some dispute about that. But the principles are sound. And he was writing sound principles because he wasn't writing them about policing black people. He was writing them about policing people. So the principles he wrote were designed to police people in a way to serve and protect. So if we hold them to the original principles of original Western policing, then we would have good policing. If these were the principles of policing today, we wouldn't have to do a lot of research, a lot of writing, a lot of technical, this is what police should do, this is community policing, or as Ruben Greenberg said, victim-oriented policing. If I make sure you're not a victim, you are going to love me. Trust me. You're going to help me, you're going to participate with me, then we'll have community policing. But I'm not going to be a community with a predator. I'm not going to come out to a neighborhood cookout with a guy who raped my daughter. Damn that. You feel me? I'm staying away from that. You want to know why people don't come out? Because you haven't gotten rid of the problem. Last but not least, you can go through these principles later. Again, 
options, choices, and consequences. The options is developing programs, better education, intervention, making sure they have the social interaction programs, doing all the things that are saving the children of incarcerated um, parents, so on and so forth, giving them options to do better, right? And then once you've given them all those options, they got to make some choices, telling them how to make choices. And then if they make the wrong choices, all of us know there are consequences to bad choices. Whether you married the wrong woman or the wrong man, there are consequences to choices. And there have to be consequences to violent crime. Violence is a part of our culture. It's not just crime, it's part of our culture. Countries who disagree with other countries say that the, 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 the way to solve that is to go to war, to kill other human beings. If, we don't, if you don't listen to me, we are going to war. And we're gonna, so they can't get away from violence as a tool, as a method. But we can tell them that in a civil society, there's some other options, there's some other choices. But if you choose the wrong choices, then police have got to, you can't tell the police you shouldn't be arresting people because there's some people out there who've got to go to jail. I, as an FBI agent, I've watched people slip people throat, shoot people, shoot children, domestic abusers. And I'm saying to myself, you, you got to go. I don't, I hate that you are this monster. But we gotta, it's time to get rid of this monster. This monster gonna kill a whole lot of other people. And we can't be so liberal that we can't understand consequences. My mother used to say to me, when she was about to spank me, this is gonna hurt me more than it hurt you. But don't get it wrong, it is gonna hurt you. <laughs> it is designed to hurt you, and I love you, and after this, we're gonna have dinner and some dessert. But I'm about to be, but we, this is gonna hurt you more than it hurt me. Right? So we've gotta pull all that together. Because that, Everyone, especially young people, understand consequences. Trust me, they absolutely understand consequences. So do not take that out of the formula. With that, is my time. I didn't hear any bells, whistles, or songs. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Dr. Powers. Uh, you never fail to edify, and you never fail to make us laugh, which is all good for the soul. All righty, my next colleague is uh, Dr. Natasha Pratt-Harris. And Dr. Natasha Pratt-Harris uh, has just published a seminal book, uh, an audaciously titled book, called Why the Police Should Be Trained by Black People. And it may, you may think, well, yeah, that's good for them over there. In, in our work over here, so in the we we are one people, holy we one people. But guess what? The same type of policing paradigm is what's being operated here. And so the, what's in that textbook has value. It's value added to what is going on with policing, crime and violence uh, in Jamaica. And so I trust that you may chat with her after our presentation to see how you can acquire, and we're not selling, this is not selling, I just want you to be edified, let's be very clear about that, um, to get that textbook. But in addition to that, she is a scholar at uh, Morgan State University, uh, which is a research university located in Baltimore, Maryland. And so uh, she's very passionate uh, about doing her research, looking at perceptions and attitudes of the community relative to policing, and she is a, a principal investigator with Baltimore City's consent decree, because Baltimore City is under a consent decree for um, unconstitutional issues relative to their policing, and she has been conducting surveys over the last three years uh, to help with that report for the Department of Justice. So at this juncture, Dr. Natasha Pratt-Harris, you've got the floor. Thank you so much, Dr. Trader. Thank you to my colleagues who spoke earlier. Thank you to Dr. Renato for having us all in Kingston, Jamaica. Thank you for those who will follow me. We are here with a lot of energy. Um, we aren't coming for show. We didn't come for vacation. We, 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 we enjoyed ourselves a bit, but this is serious business. Uh, my mother is a Jamaican woman, um, born and raised. She came um, to the States. Um, and had me soon thereafter her arrival. So I was born in the States. My grandmother, Beryl Smith, and my grandfather, Victor George Smith, their energy and spirit are with me in everything I do. They taught their children um, to live a life of pure integrity, to speak the truth, and to act upon it. This is not a game. 
this is not a game. What we're talking about is not a game. And we have a good time, and we'll bring you into the discussion based upon the energies that we're bringing, but this is not a game. When we were invited, one of the things that I asked for is that my family members could be present because I am not an aristocrat. I am someone who's learning constantly. And I know that my family members who are here in Jamaica, um, in the United States as well, um, have experienced some things that I can hear about, but I'm not living it. I am concerned about, I can pray about it, I can offer some support on it, but their voices and their insight is what we need. That's what um, we're talking about today. We said, who are the messengers? The messengers are the people. As a scholar, someone who's gone to school, we've been in college, all, many of us, forever. You know, we haven't even left. Me, Doctor, some of us have not left. We've become professors. We oftentimes can be disconnected from reality because we are inundated or embracing and engaging based upon the scholarship, the language, the written text, the publication, and all that. We have to continue to stay connected to the real stories and the real people. The messengers are the people. So when I'm sharing, I'm talking about the voices, I'm sharing the voices of the people. So Dr. Trader shared um, some work we're doing in Baltimore City at the present time. I have a team of persons in Baltimore who are in the community, knocking on doors, um, canvassing streets in the city of Baltimore, engaging folks on a community survey, asking about the people's perceptions and experiences with the Baltimore City Police Department. But this is a requirement of the consent decree where Baltimore City has a monitoring team to assess what's going on with the city because the Department of Justice is reviewing with a federal judge. Um, I'm not a member of the monitoring team, but I, the University of, um, Morgan State University was asked to actually be in charge of the survey and uh, my colleagues at Morgan suggested myself to be the principal investigator. And then we have a team of folks talking to people. The way you answer some of the questions that I heard during this two-day symposium about how people feel, uh, what are people's thoughts, have things shifted, you actually have, you have to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. One of my philosophies on policing, and Dr. Trader and myself were trained by Dr. Muhammad, where both of us teach a uh, policing inside out class in Baltimore City, um, where we have police community and students engaged on a, during a 15 week journey, and we're engaging with folks. One of the things we talk about is, um, we again have to have these conversations, and we cannot make assumptions based upon you know, something that the news told us, something that we feel um, in, our, in our spirits, we actually have a conversation. My philosophy on policing is law enforcement needs to have conversations. Now, one of the reasons the methodology that I use in the community survey is to actually interview people. We actually interview people over a 25 to 30 minute period. They are compensated for their time, which is a, a discussion within itself. Um, uh, it's because I believe that philosophy should be implemented by law enforcement across the board. So my model, my method, when we do research, it's intentional. That intentionality uh, actually plays itself out in the methodology that's employed. So that's one of the things that's happening in this city, in the city of Baltimore. Another thing is that um, I am, I've done an evaluation of Safe Streets Baltimore. So part of what I'm experiencing while up here is that you see the connections between my beloved Baltimore. I was raised in Baltimore City and my homeland where my mom was born and raised, which is here, I see a lot of connections. We have violence interrupters in Kingston who are trying to step in the middle to uh, reduce or eliminate the possibility of violence, especially related to retaliation when someone has been gunned down, when a family member has been lost. And what I acknowledge is that the work of our violence interrupters is absolutely essential. What you know, or what you may not know, is that the funding and support is limited. There, there may be a handful of violence interrupters doing tremendous work, but we need, we need far more. That's happening in Kingston, that's happening in Baltimore City. We don't have the monies, the funding to support that. There's a lot of criticism of the work that they do, but they're doing dangerous work. They don't have guns, they don't have a baton, they don't have a taser, they're actually it physically, in some cases, interrupting violence, meeting with families to talk about not retaliating. And when we do this work, we should call on the names of those who
give me money from a debit card, snatching a purse, and a variety of other kinds. Couple that statistics with the rise of intrapersonal crimes, these are domestic crimes that are interwoven into our social, economic, and gender challenges that demand intervention before an ultimate violent, violent explosion. That means we gotta get to this before it gets here. Government and police will never, let me say that again, government and police will never solve the inherent problem of crime without the supportive network of citizens on the ground. When you look at it, sometimes it remains it reminds me of the cops and robbers, sitcoms you see in movies. We watch for, movies we watch for entertainment. Sadly, this is not a movie where Batman and Robin is gonna come save the day. Bad guys are winning right now. Furthermore, we can't let politicians use crime and violence as a political football. Y'all know it. When we run and we talk about all the things we're going to do and we do nothing. When violence as a political football brought about when it's time to get reelected. Oh, we have a lot of that in the United States. Every time there's an election, there's a whole lot of things we're going to get we're going to do, we're going to talk about. And then after the election, we don't see, hear, or even talk about things. My experience has taught me over the 30 years that we can't win the war against violence with just police making arrests. We as members of our community have to get involved. 30 years in law enforcement, and before that, most of my life has been activism on the ground in the communities that I've served. From the Secretary of the, Phil from the Philadelphia branch of the NAACP, National Association for Advancement of Colored People, for 14 years. From the President of the Guardian Civic League, which is a civic police oversight organization of black cops, and our mission was to build the bridge between communities that look like us and the police. So I didn't just jump here. I worked my way and fought my way here. We have numerous resources and agencies with the ex expertise to work with our young people. As you can see, part of this symposium, there are a lot of things going on. Dr. Muhammad talked about the children and what they see and what they hear and how they uh, internalize situations and yet we leave them out as though they're, they, they don't hear, they don't see, or they don't understand when they do. The programs need funding to survive. And when people talking about what programs are going on and if you give them no money, no resources, and yet you talk about the programs, you're doing nothing but just that, talking. Otherwise, our children will fall prey to gangs, to gang activity. We know all well of that in Philadelphia. That we're saying, if you're going to have a program and you don't fund it, then our children will fall prey to what the gangs have to offer. If the gangs got a brand new car, and you give no resources to children to help develop them, then what looks attractive to them is that brand new car. Therefore, therefore, they are got by the gangs. You know what to do. You know what the problem is. You have to do it. We're not here to come tell you have to do. You know it. Our children who are our future should not be the poster child of every case study around crime. They shouldn't be. 
We shouldn't be doing studies of crime dealing with our children if the resources was given to them, if the programs that developed for them was activated. One of the things after everything that we do here, now we're talking about law enforcement. And one of the programs I developed in the United States was a steer straight program. And the reason why was to give law enforcement an alternative way of dealing with situations in the streets. That means we would come up there and train them for a whole day. And what we bring to the academy is different organization, community groups, resource organizations, so that when they're on the street, instead of having to lock somebody up, they can pick up the phone and call the resource. I got a family that needs this. Can you come? They have a connection. They develop a connection with a community organization on the ground. This is a minor offense. I don't need to lock this person up. Let me get them some help from the law enforcement perspective. That program is called Steer Straight. I developed and fell off it as a model for policing with compassion alongside of working with community and the city resources. That means we bring about the city resources into, uh, into the community. Where do we go from here? We've done all our research. We've compared our notes. We were, we've had numerous discussions at both the local and international levels. We can't hide from the problem of violence. It's affecting us every day, every night, every aspect of our lives. We've cried, we've prayed, we've marched until souls, of our, of, uh, souls on our shoes have been worn out. Unless we come together as parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, sons, daughters, constables, educators, politicians, religious leaders, activists, entertainers, athletes, yes, as a people, we will never see an end to violence act in our communities, on our streets, unless we all come together and bring this one home for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sheriff Bilal. Thank you to all of our panelists. At this time, Mr. Levi is ready. <laughs> well, we'll waste no more time. And if, you, if you've got queries, same policy. You go to the mic, please, so that this can be recorded. And Mr. Levi has beaten everyone. So Mr. Levi, pleasant good afternoon to you, sir. Good what afternoon, is your question? Uh, Natasha. Levi, I apologize. Uh, <clears throat> having to leave immediately, I'm jumping up to make sure that I don't disappoint uh, Dr. Powers. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> but I do want to first thank uh, Dr. Roden uh, Trader for her dynamic introduction and, and for showing the bridge, the, the, the brotherhood and sisterhood between the U.S. situation and the Jamaican people. Uh, and I really appreciate that very much. But I want to, in, a, in insisting uh, Tyrone on putting away those who have done something wrong, uh, that you are including in that period of restraint from doing public harm, which is what uh, a place of correction is, that you insist equally on the compassionate rehabilitation of those put away, uh, which means not just skills and training, but a completely new mindset of, of, of love for their fellow citizens. And that besides that inclusion, there is a systematic exclusion of uh, capital punishment. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Duly really noted. I don't remember her name. I will concur. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, I'm not opposed to rehabilitating uh, 
individuals who can be rehabilitated. Obviously, not all, all crimes are equal. So I absolutely concur that there should be rehabilitation programs in, in, in of course, in the United States and in other places. The word penitentiary itself comes from the word repentance. Or, uh, so you go there to repent, or we call our prisons the house of corrections to correct behavior. Unfortunately, not a lot of that is being done in those institutions. We know the connection between the inside and the outside. So what we've done essentially is um, it's like putting dirty clothes in a wash machine and never turning the machine on, leaving them there for 20 years and somehow expecting they're going to come out smelling better rather than worse. And so we never really address corrections in the way that we should address corrections because they don't necessarily get better because we don't focus a great deal on that. We have a panel on policing. Um, Dr. Muhammad talked about incarceration and the children of incarcerated, but we don't have a lot of discussions on the exact way to rehabilitate people in those institutions because not everyone can rehabilitate individuals. You're not trained in that skill set. And unless you do that, there is a complete nexus between those behind the wall and those on the other side. There will be a continuation of the violence and the behavior unless it's done correctly. So I believe completely in that as long as it's done right. And yet, on the other hand, I still believe in, in consequences, not necessarily the, the, not necessarily the death penalty, but I do believe in consequences for people who are extremely, extremely brutal and the crimes that they are carrying out because they have imposed their will on the fragile lives of other human beings and sometimes those human beings who they impose their violence on were just trying to live and survive and take care of their family and their children. And so I think we have to say clearly that we want to help you, we want to change you, and we believe in rehabilitation, but if not, we cannot allow you to remove other people from existence simply because you have felt pain somewhere in your childhood. Because I was a victim of rape doesn't give me the permission to go rape somebody else tomorrow. There need to be some intervention, but if I don't take that intervention, if I don't take my medicine, then there need to be some consequences. Thank you all. Yes, sir. Thank you, Thank you Doc. And Mr. Levy, is it Levy or Levi? Mr. Levy had the final word before he walked out. Pleasant good afternoon, sir. <laughs> All righty. Uh, although Dr. Levy, Mr. Levy has left, is there anybody who would like to piggyback or say something about his comment on the panel before I go to the next question from the audience? All right, it's concurrence. Very well. Ma'am, Miss, these Diana, days, I don't understand Thorburn. the pronouns. Diana Lady in the Thorburn lovely colors. Good. You've got next. <laughs> um, so I was really interested to hear from Sheriff Bilal because my sister lives near Philadelphia. So I've always had this idea that Philadelphia reminds me so much of Jamaica in terms of just hearing what the stories are about your very high murder rate. Not as high as ours, but um, still one of the highest in the US. And I was curious about, you said the bad guys are winning. And I wondered, who for you are your bad guys and what's motivating them? Um, and just as an aside, you mentioned um, Dr. Pratt Harris about suicide and gun violence. Interestingly, and I don't know what the explanation is, I think one of the criminologists in the room need to, or maybe one of you, that Jamaica has one of the lowest suicide rates in the world, which considering that we have the highest murder rate in the world, I don't know how that matches up. Um, and the demographic of who commits suicide is also, it's older men is the most, so that's just a little bizarre statistic thing that, you know, just to make us, keep, keep us up at night. But my real question is for Sheriff Bilal. Thank you for that question. You asked me who are the bad guys <laughs> for me, are the ones that pick up guns and shoot needlessly, just shoot it in the crowd. They don't even hit the target, they hit everybody else. They kill children, they kill grandmothers, they kill fathers. Those are the bad guys to me. Whether you got a, a problem with somebody, you don't know how to resolve it, somewhere along the line, you need to learn how to resolve it. But just walking up and standing at a corner and just shooting needlessly and killing grandmothers, children, to me are the bad guys. To me, they need to be off our streets. Now. Dr. Levy said there may be some rehabilitation, but at this time, 
I just want them off our streets. Those are the bad guys to me. If I may uh, add something to your comments about the suicide rates in Jamaica being low, despite having uh, being number two in the world in terms of homicides, I would say that Jamaicans really proud enough. Jamaicans love being Jamaicans. Everywhere you go, you don't have no problem telling people say you're Jamaican, even though we have over a thousand murders each year. Anywhere we go, we brag about it. So we brag a docious. So when it comes to life and our own, on a micro level, micro level, we happy you now. The commercial, when I was coming here, I was in my bathroom, smile, 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 Jamaica. I was feeling real airy. I was, I was excited. And I left Jamaica four decades ago, and I'm still excited. I wanted a window seat in the plane, so when they come up Palisados and they curve, me want to see the water. I saw me proud. So, in America, there's a hopelessness of a different sort. There's an oppression, oppressiveness of the racism and the black and white dichotomy that's, right. that's a chokehold on blacks in America, African Americans, where they don't have the same kind of pride. I, they, they might be vexed with me, but they not walk the same way and they not talk the same way. It's a little different, but we walk even though we still have this anger, going back to, the, in our title, this issue of criminal violence. The criminal violence aspect of us is the, it's probably misplaced aggression. We're angry because, them said if we try, and we try, and we can't get nowhere. And you get tired of trying. You don't have no hope. I'm going to tell the truth. My mother tell me if you come here, I'll watch what I say. I'm going to tell me if you come here, I'll go down there and run your mouth, you know. That's what she said. And she probably <laughs> watched her and her heart a beat fast. <laughs> but I can't go to school and get so much subjects. And when I get the subjects, then, I beg for one security job. You know how much friend me have? They couldn't get a job, man. They can't get no work. And I'm bright. Me shouldn't have to go foreign to make a life when this place so nice. Something wrong with that. Me not feeling a cool. I burn up my lip. I get, um, what they call it? What they call it over there? <laughs> <laughs> me not feel do that when me the paradise day or so. But me can't make it. So me have anger and me have frustration. Merton call it strain theory. The stress of all of that. So me, me know who me gonna take it out pan? Uncle the people them when me live with. I see him like domestic violence. My mother probably I say, oh God, oh yeah, talk the patwa so. Well, <laughs> it's serious. Can, can I add on one other thing? Very well. Um, we know, um, uh, empirically speaking, we talk about um, variation in um, well, mental health issues in general. Um, we know that uh, as a people across the diaspora, it's like undercut, not necessarily recognized as a real reality for us, but there are many of us with a lot of challenges, regardless of which continent or which country we're at. Um, the other piece is that we do want to investigate closely the mental health realities of persons in our beloved country right here, um, because there are many with those issues. And I would like to connect in so much as acknowledging how reassessing cause of death among persons in this island nation. Um, when, I'm, when I'm referencing um, suicide in particular, I'm talking about suicide by gun. So in the States, um, the number one cause of death due to guns is suicide, but suicide we know is like there's so many variations in terms of how people unfortunately take their lives. So we do want to tap into that because we are here to talk about really saving ourselves, right? Thank you.
want to congratulate the panel. I'm deeply moved by the panel and very glad that I'm here today. I just wanted to share a story that occurred while I was involved in a very popular discussion program called The Breakfast Club. And one of the things we did was to visit as many criminal hotspots across the country and do our broadcast live from that area. And the story I want to share is when we went into one of the areas, actually Augustown in Kingston, and we had, I think, about four gunmen, young men, criminals, who had reformed. And the question we put to them right at the end of the discussion was, what was that thing? Because they were giving different reasons. So what is, what is that thing, though, that really made you say no more? You know what each of them said? The children. We don't want, and every time I talk about it, I full up, I'm sorry. We don't want our children to have to do what we're doing. Absolutely. You can go to the mic, please. Thank you. And thank you, ma'am. And thank you so much for a spirited panel. Uh, I believe that, well, I think it's being streamed live, and I believe that the leaders of our nation, it is critical more than any other discussion that we've had, that they have the benefit of the kind of frankness that we were exposed to today. So I want to thank you for that. <laughs> Dr. Powers, I have to smile because, you know, you were brutally honest about something in Jamaica that we've danced around. And so I'd like to ask you a question in the hope that it will get to the leadership of this country. In the face of a politics without will, how do we get the government and other stakeholders to understand that our solutions must include consequences. Wow. I, I think that, to be quite, oh. <laughs> I, I have to be brief because of the time we have. I think they understand it. I clearly think they understand it. I just think that they put in politics over people. I think they understand that they're, they're because they understand that there are consequences for their actions, which is why they make certain decisions to get them reelected or get them put in a more favorable position. So you certainly understand consequences when your decisions are based on a cost-benefit analysis that benefits you. So you have a clear understanding of consequences, but you don't have a connection or a real feeling of how it impacts the people who you're trying to assist. And like I said over and over again, even in our discourse of all the interaction and social interaction programs, the funders that were spoke earlier on the panel, and I think there was a question about the balance and the household and the family and all, these are not numbers and statistics. These are real human beings who want to live until it's over. You know what I mean? It's a very fragile existence as it is anyway, who want to live until it's over. So. We don't necessarily see them as human beings. We see them as numbers. We start, un unfortunately, you can even get in academia and start quoting statistics and numbers, and there are no humans behind them. So I think they understand that. I just think that they, they I won't say that here, but I think they understand that, that, they are, that these are real, uh, that, that their uh, consequences have to be a part of the scenario. I also hope that we understand that, because sometimes we want to save everybody. And, I and I'm all for saving everybody. I'm all saving all people who have gone astray. I don't want to throw people away. But on the other hand, I also understand from very significant an important mother to me that there are consequences, son, for your actions, and you are going to have to at some point face those consequences. Your choices have consequences. Now, you can take the options where they lead to good things or bad things. We talk about education and those particular things.
They, are, they do understand it. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. <laughs> Dr. Okay, Muhammad, I got, I got one thing they, on no, this. No, no, well, what, I got what? one thing, 30 seconds. The one thing I've learned talking to everybody that I've came into here in Jamaica from Montego Bay to here is that those who make the decision need to come to the neighborhoods. You need to come see. You might have got so high up that you don't even recognize what's happening to your people. So come to the neighborhoods. Come see. All righty. Thank you so very much. Listen, I've broken my own rule, but this is absolutely worth it. We've got young voices that have queries, and I'm telling you, they're going to get their time unless you all want to drag me out of here. So, young lady, you've got next, and then you've got next, and then we'll be out of your way. Go for it. All right, so what I wanted to say was thank you for coming out to try to change this world and make things better and, like, promote, like, more black people talking about these problems to actually get to fix them. Thank you so much, young lady. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Nikwa. Um, I live in Augustone, so it really touched base when the lady um, made mention of my community. And I'd like to know, um, what can the government do for us? Because I guess they're in charge of us as a country, as a nation. In regards to um, trauma, I'm not really sure who brought it up on the panel. Kids are traumatized daily by the police, violence, crime, criminal violence. And as um, Dr. Mohammed said, we need to focus on the kids because literally as I've been growing up hearing, they are the future. How can the government um, implement things or how can you guys help us with the government to implement um, things in the neighborhoods, as you stated, to help curb this um, issue that we're having because for me, I grew up hating the police, hating soldiers because of what I saw growing up, how my family members, friends were treated, and it's traumatic to me. As um, Dr. Pat Harris said, it's generalized because we do face trauma generally, but for me, it was like, oh, I don't like police because they did this and they do that, but what can we do trauma-based because it's something that is mental and your mental health is very important especially at that young age where things happen to you. How can we help? Or how can the government help um, our future, basically? Dr. Mohammed will respond. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for your courage in sharing that and bringing it up. I think a couple of initiatives that I've seen happen specifically in Washington, D.C., where I work with the youth and the Metropolitan Police Department for interventions was a youth council where the young individuals come in as leaders and are able to provide recommendations toward policy implementation. So right now they have programs where the young individuals have an opportunity to share those voices. Um, another perspective that I think has been very successful in the school environment, they create safe havens and spaces. There's a social justice uh, school, elementary school in Newark, New Jersey, where they have um, opportunities for spaces and rooms for children to go to. They have chalkboards where they can like write things out so that they don't have to you know, fight for it. They give them journals for free so they have an opportunity to write. And then it's also built into the curriculum. Young individuals have to have what you just had an opportunity to do, get it off your chest because it's gonna make you heavy. It's gonna do that. You have to have the school doing that. And then also the PTA, the parent teacher associations, working with the teachers and working with the schools to be able to provide those sort of resources and of course throwing the money into it um, i definitely believe in giving the young individuals leadership roles and paying them tremendously for the roles that they play in just sharing their narrative the more that we invite you all on these panels to share and guide and lead on what you talk about automatically you have a trauma-informed uh, pedagogy so I hope <laughs> our government hears um, these plans and initiatives that you guys have overseas because the United States and Jamaica were very close in relation. So I hope they really hear and understand that we need to fix this, starting with the smallest and most vulnerable um, citizens of this land, of this nation. 
And, and one quick comment, um, Claudette Richardson Pius, panel four, Youth Education and Mental Health, her quote from yesterday was, we need to enable our children to become peace ambassadors. So she's right here in um, Jamaica, and this is a group that I, I'm hoping, like you were saying, will be engaged with those people on the ground and we can connect as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz Minaya for having us. Thanks to my cousins, Clarice Burlet, Burrell and Annette Clark for coming out to be with me. Jamaica, we lick about with Talawa. All right? Thank you. We did that. Did we? Yeah. Oh. Oh. Okay.
who's going to moderate panel number eight. Dr. Paris, you have the floor, sir. Are we still here? Can you hear me? Do we have um, Deputy Commissioner Blake online? On Zoom. On Zoom? DCP, are you there? Hearing you loud and clear, right here. Great. Good afternoon, panelists. Good are afternoon, you, everyone in the camera? audience. Are you coming on camera so we can see you? <clears throat> anyway, there we go. Good afternoon, everyone, once again. Um, this is going to be uh, another exciting panel discussion uh, late in the afternoon, so we're going to make sure that we keep you guys stimulated. Very important topics we're going to go through this afternoon. My name is Paris Liawai. I used to be the executive director for the Mona Geoinformatics Institute. But for all intents and purposes, today I'm part of the Violence Prevention Alliance. Um, the panelists this afternoon include um, Deputy Commissioner Dr. Kevin Blake. Uh, I don't know if I can call you Most Honorable or Right Excellency yet, but um, Ke um, Kevin Blake um, from the Jamaica Constabulary Force. Um, Dr. Deanna Ashley, who is the Executive Director for the Violence Prevention Alliance, and myself will be presenting a short um, slide as well. Uh, we also have Joanna Callen, who is an independent crime uh, researcher, criminologist and researcher, and Charles Clayton, who is the director for the Community Renewal Program at the, the Planning Institute of Jamaica. Welcome again, everyone. The session is about data and evidence-based approaches to crime prevention and the state of the art in Jamaica. What is important to realize, especially in all of the sessions that we've seen so far and to the visitors to our country, is that we are applying technology and data, data analytics, um, to a lot of how we approach crime. Uh, it, is, uh, it is not just a reactive posture. We, are, we have spent 60 years as an independent country learning and understanding how to be independent in all, in all senses of the word. And, um, and a lot of our top quality researchers have been um, bringing this information and knowledge to bear as to how we tackle the problems here in Jamaica. So with that, we're going to cede the floor to um, Dr. Um, Kevin Blake, uh, Deputy Commissioner of Police. Um, to present for us. Um, we have, um, I think, 15 minutes for each presenter. Um, se what? Seven to 10 minutes. Oh, that's brutal. Seven to 10 minutes, Dr. Blake, you got that? Um, Certainly, I need, I need no more than three. <laughs> Uh, um, and I will be a brutal enforcer, sir. This is the only time I get to abuse the police. But, um, <laughs> but um, please go ahead, Dr. Blake, and you can share share um, your your thoughts on the on the topic. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I'm very delighted to be here. As I said before, it's a very short discussion. I have not so much a presentation. Um, <clears throat> I will leave um, much of the discussion that we will be um, conducting today to the question and answer session. And stuff, but just the weight of our appetite and some of the issue, some of the, the um, tenets around this issue, this particular issue. Um, you know, we're talking about law enforcement, and few can argue against the importance of data and information systems in law enforcement. I mean, this is something that I've been studied immensely throughout the years, and much of what we do, I keep reminding my officers that one of the second most important resources that we have is our information. All right, our people first and then our information. That's what make us who we are. Um, that's what make us the police, not the asset, not the vehicles, but really the people and the information. So much so important is information to organization, which of which JCF is one such, that an entire branch of technology is dedicated towards the management of information. And, and so, you know, that underscores the point um, that information system information technology and data is is extremely important we have long realized that now jcf is one of the largest such organization law enforcement organization in the english speaking caribbean and um arguably we have the most one of the most complex environment within which to deliver policing services the point i want to um make is that in such an environment for every action that is taken by a police officer on a daily basis comes with it the possibility of the generation of one or several records of data. And so we have um, 
we have um, in excess of 14,000 so on and so on members, each their action generate vital um, data, records of data every single day. And so that gives an idea as to the, the vast amount of structured data, not touching yet um, things like big data um, and stuff like that. And <clears throat> likewise, everything that is done by citizens within the environment, being police, can generate data. So the action of an individual in our community itself can result in a record or several records of data that, be that will become useful um, um, in, in the future. It means, therefore, that there is a huge amount of data that exists within the public safety domain that is vital to effective policing. And so we have long realized this, and our operations have always been heavily reliant on data of serving the JCF now for over 20 years. And I was introduced to an organization that uses data for several um, several of its its operations, I mean daily operations, both administrative and an operation. Um, some of the uses that we made of, of analyzed data is to determine things like deployment, where do we put our resources, which is a critical importance in an environment where you have limited resources and where optimization is, is, is key. We also use data to evaluate members' performance um, and this, in, in no way, is an exhaustive list. I just pulled some of the very important ones out just to have a discussion on. Um, also, we do a lot of strategic and operational planning. And, and to manage an organization of this magnitude, it requires um, significant investment in planning, both at the strategic level, the divisional um, formation level, and also the day-to-day -day tactical operational level. Um, we have huge um, um, financial, um, uh, we have a huge asset base, a, a huge number of, of, of motor vehicles and buildings valued at several billions of dollars. Um, and so the ability to track, to manage and track this asset manually um, is, is a um, very difficult feat. So we use data to assist us where that is concerned. In addition to, utilizing of data we have also developed tools and um, internally we have developed tools um, <clears throat> that 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 are used to do predictive analysis with that data so we do some amount of predictive analysis as a matter of fact we are working with one organization a private sector organization now to look at how can we utilize data um, to predict in an, in essence what is what will happen next and, and how the police interaction um, affect um, is, is incorporated within that prediction um, um, using and, and also using things like artificial intelligence and machine um, learning. We also use data and this, um, Paris, I know you would be, um, this is up your stream and very familiar with our um, capabilities in this regard, where we use um, spatially an analyzed data over geocoded maps and, and we have, have been internationally recognized and was awarded in 2019. Um, was awarded the, the, the special achievement in GIS in San Diego. We went to collect that award, a team of our GIS um, um, members. I think five persons went up for that. And so, you know, we have not only just utilized this data, but we also developed tools around GIS um, that manages that 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 data, that manage that data. We have also utilized data um, and apply um, network theories in mathematics to tackle criminal networks. You now there is a particular mathematical theory called the partially ordered sets. And I think um, we may be the only law enforcement entity anywhere in this side of the world who have actually utilized a true math, math theory um, in a real criminal network operation um, a few years ago, so much so that we were invited to present at the fourth mathematical conference in counterterrorism and Rochester Institute of Technology. And I, I did a presentation there that can be found online um, and stuff like that. Um, we have been, we have a vibrant research department within our planning research and development branch that conducts research in policing and technology and other social issues that affect policing. But we also 
facilitate external researches. So a number of researches from other jurisdictions and from other agencies have relied significantly on the data that we collate and that we um, have within the JCF. And given this heavy reliance on data, you, it, there, there has been the need to establish structures and governance systems to ensure that, that the security of the data and um, um, is 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 of utmost um, importance, and we we ensure that it is secured, and also the effective management of it. And some of the the, the objectives of these um, governance system that has been established is to ensure strategic focus being given to technology. And so this other um, type of technology infusion within the organization that we have been experiencing over a number of years, we have. Um, um, fine tune and, and actually properly structured that. The, the other objective is one of the other objectives is to provide high level ownership of this. Uh, and, and so no longer um, these things are, these um, technology projects are um, feature of individuals um, at, at, at a lower level, but actually are owned by the I command itself. And so that helps to guarantee sustainability. Um, in these areas. Um, we have to ensure that managing an organization this size and a technology system is, is, it can be very um, huge. And so several different parts involved in, in our technology. We have technology for our, our um, investigation, technology for our cyber crimes, technology for administration. And so they all must work together. And so with this structured approach, we aim to have unified information systems or parts of which that speak together, um, speak to each other so that we deliver services as a, as a single system. Um, we have to ensure that our human resources are aligned properly. Um, and so where there is need for a particular skill set in a particular area that we, we do not misplace this actual um, resource. And so um, a governance, proper governance structure helps to take care of some of that. And also to align our function areas um, within the organization with, the, with our human resources. Um, <clears throat> the more we advance in the use of technology and data, um, the more vulnerable we can get if we do not ensure that the requisite um, policies and, and structures and systems to protect our data is not taken into consideration. And so we, we um, observe strict adherence to security policy with respect to our management of our information and our data. And we try to ensure that these policies are simple enough so that they are enforceable, simple enough and realistic. Um, and we also ensure that we have adherence to accepted standards. And this becomes even more important, especially given the given our our advancement and our pursuit of ISO 9001, which we have um, been successfully recommended for certification and now currently await certification. I mean, this is a topic that could be a symposium on its own for two days. And so I will just stop at this point and leave um, the rest for any approach to um, further question in the discussion session. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Um, at this point, I um, will switch to the joint presentation of myself and, and Dr. Diane Ashley. Um, we'll be speaking about the integrated use of data. Uh, as we all can understand that data is not just crime data. Uh, it is everything else. It's physical infrastructure, it's social data, it's um, demographic data, economic data, um, dynamic data like traffic movements and so on. I'm trying to bring up my presentation on the screen. Um, I will move pretty quickly through my, my portion and then um, um, hand over to Dr. Ashley very quickly, the remote. The remote. Thank you. So, very, so it's a joint presentation between myself and Dr. Ashley. But um, if we can understand that crime and violence data, violence data coming from the hospitals, in addition to crime data coming from the police, uh, can represent outcomes. Um, but we do have education data, we do have um, political data, all of that stuff could be useful for analysis. You mix that up with infrastructural data on schools, churches, you know, internet, water, and sanitation, all of those variables are also very important. 
um, how people move, a daytime population is very different uh, in certain areas. Look, I mean, if you look at Manhattan and, and Midtown Manhattan in particular, you can see what that population looks like in the day versus, in, versus evenings. Same thing in Jamaica. Um, our dormitory suburb of Portmore empties out in the daytime, comes all the way to Kingston, has a different risk factor uh, at different times of day and night. We do have police operations data, and, and, and Dr. Blake mentioned that earlier. Um, you know, we do have zones. We have zones of special operations. We have states of emergency. We have um, curfew areas, all of which have different uh, uh, represent different data points. Uh, Dr. Ashley will speak um, to um, violence against children later. But again, it's not just showing um, children. I mean, each child has a name. Each child has a has a story. But the the pattern is also very important in order how in order to determine how we reach that that child. Uh, when you look at that pattern and distribution across Jamaica, when you look at their schools that they go to, um, some schools have a certain type of, of, of internet availability or reliability. All of those things are very important. Uh, we see some schools uh, have more students than the schools can actually accommodate. All of those things are reality. Stud uh, young people are moving from their homes to the schools and they're going all over the place and traveling very long distances. All of those things represent a dynamic component of data that can be factored into analysis. We can do hotspot analysis. This is normal. You know, you guys are familiar with hotspot analysis. I'm moving really quickly because Dr. Ashley has to come on now. Um, but when you look at monitoring and evaluation, we can see year over year, month over month, week over week, day over day, um, how does a pattern change over time. And in these two hotspot maps, I'm showing the zones of special operation on the left. On the right would be the zone of special operation at Denham Town. You can see year over year, crime in that zone has gone down, represented by green. There are areas that have gone up around it, but within the zone, it's pretty much gone down. The two zones of special operation in um, Montego Bay also represent a kind of a greening out um, of, 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 of crime year over year. And the pattern is different within the zone as opposed to areas that are outside of it. Um, and then you can begin to you know, evaluate effectiveness and so on. Uh, so there's a very important point I want to raise, and I'm glad to see Sharon Weber here. Um, we, need, we invest in technology. Dr. Blake mentioned that we invest in technology. We must not let that investment go to waste. What we're seeing here is a, is a Jamaica in, injury surveillance system at the hospitals. At tw in 2020, there was more detail and thoroughness of data entry in 2020 than in 2021. 2021, data integrity went down. Nothing changed. The technology is the same. The data is the same. All of that is the same. The entry has deteriorated. Now, we can blame COVID all we want, but it now affects our ability to do analysis um, over time. It's not the technology component. It's the human component that we need to continue to have stamina to support. Again, Project Star, I know Safi was here yesterday and spoke about, I'm sure she spoke about Project Star. But what we are doing is, is, is taking, again, 60 years worth of knowledge, you know, support from our multilateral partners and applying this towards this problem that is existential for us who live here. Uh, and then we're bringing, to, bringing to, uh, a lot of this data to bear in the analysis. In one of the Project Star communities, East Downtown Kingston, we can map all the crimes and hospital -relate, violence related injuries, and we can see the pattern. Um, uh, within the, the community. But we can also do physical asset mapping in that same community. What you're seeing there in pinks and reds are physical assets, homes, uh, shops, uh, any kind of infrastructure. Every single thing in that community has been mapped. The ones in pinks and reds represent um, buildings that are either abandoned or in derelict condition. So you compare that previously. I mean, it's, it's the broken broken window theory. I think uh, you guys have that in the states. Um, you can see rundown rundown infrastructure have a particular association with certain types of crime, and we've done that analysis. Abandoned buildings. Um, uh, derelict buildings and so on are closer to crimes on average than those that are not um, run down and those that are in better condition. Churches uh, have a different risk profile to certain types of crimes than bars. All of these things have been analyzed and assessed um, throughout these communities. 100% coverage, not a sample. We mapped every single building and processed every single crime and violent incident in these communities and are able to create these associations. And therefore, interventions can now become very targeted and focused. Some of these interventions can be police enforcement. 
Some of them would be involved churches, schools, neighborhood associations, and so on. But we're now able to begin to create targeted responses. And understanding different communities have different profiles. So the responses are going to be different in different places. So I'm going to turn over to Dr. Ashley now, who will speak about um, intervention programs for children in particular. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paris. And, um, and a lot of the previous panel uh, discussions, both this morning and this afternoon, spoke about children. So I, I feel that I'm in good company. Um, when, I think, was, I think Sharon said this morning, perpetrators and, and I think was several people said perpetrators are not born perpetrators, um, but children are born and be may become perpetrators. Uh, okay, so I am the, okay. Just to give you a quick reminder of the background, uh, Jamaica has the fourth highest um, homicide rate in the region. Uh, violence related injuries based cost the Jamaican healthcare system 12% of the about of the annual budget, direct costs of healthcare for, for violence related injuries uh, in a study in 2016 uh, estimated a cost at 3.6 billion and the indirect costs um, of, of 5 billion. So it's a costly um, illness. Oops, why doesn't it move? Where is what do I do? <laughs> it's not moving. Oh, okay, so what is it that the data are telling us? You can check. Go ahead. All right, this is just a table showing uh, VRIs uh, uh, summarized for the period um, 2015 to 29. A total of 38. 1,686 violence-related injuries were treated at nine of our major hospitals in the ANA department. You'll see that uh, the children, uh, approximately a third are under the age of 20, and a th another third between 20 and 29. Of that, um, just to say, females, uh, women, uh, both in terms of girls and, and adult wo women, are actually the victims of violence-related injuries, in particular in the home, right? Perpetrators tend to be male. In the age groups 20 to 29, you'll find that the victims and perpetrators tend to be male. Next. Um, it, so taking data, uh, importance of, of, of data, is there's administrative data, there is re data from research, and combining it with scientific knowledge about conditions related to violence and adverse experiences of children will give us the, out, the how we design and implement um, prevention programs. So we're taking data and findings from a multitude of, of research um, studies that were, were done in Jamaica. A birth cohort, the birth cohort in 86 saw 10,000 consecutive live births in Jamaica. And we followed up those, a subset of those children in, when they were 11 years, uh, 11 to 12 year olds, 15 to 16 year olds. We also had a new cohort of children which started in 2011. And using the data from these studies, we, we also, it also inf informed the, the, the follow-up action in terms of that was needed. Yes? Right. Now you'll see that even from the age of six, children are witnessing 
violence, right? Look how many children are at six are, are, are actually witnessing f fighting, right? Over 60% they're seeing stabbings, uh, uh, just uh, almost 40%. And I've seen, we've seen a dead body, almost 40%. As the older they are, then the experiences go up. Next. As victims, <coughs> again, age six, look how many have been beaten, right? And I see beatings, obviously, as you get older, uh, by 60, because they can fight back. You see, they, it goes down, right? But these are children who are victims of, of violence, extreme forms of violence. Almost over a third are, are, are by the time they're six, are experiencing beatings or being uh, beatings and then being robbed, 20% almost being robbed and actually um, 12, by the time they're 12, they're now getting stabbed. Next. Um, exposure to corporal punishment, both at home and at school, right? And again, by 12, they, they are getting a lot of, uh, of, 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 of corporal punishment, right? It goes down, but you'll see that they, they have ranges from minor to se severe corporal punishment, both at home and at school. So the experiences of trauma are, are starting early. Next. As a weakness of domestic violence, verbal abuse uh, is, is a, a serious problem, right? And then more so serious forms of violence at the domain, at, within the home and the family. Next. Intimate partner violence. By the time the, ch the, the, the children, because you're 16, you're still a child, right? But you're now victims of, of viol intimate partner violence. Boyfriend, girlfriend relationships are, are, are the common, uh, it's both verbal aggression as well as, as more serious um, uh, injuries, and in fact, if you look, if we look at the hospital data, you'll see that the commonest reason for injuries coming in in that in this 10 to 19 age group and the 20 to 29, especially in the teenage years, is boyfriend girlfriend fights and arguments, which end up with blunt injuries, and uh, as well as stabbings uh, and. Um, lacerations. Next. So why the focus on children? And let's go back to what happens in the brain. Okay, at, at birth, your brain is the largest organ in your body, right? So, so, but the frontal lobe of the brain controls the cognitive skills, such as emotional expression, problem solving, memory, language, reasoning, judgment and sexual behaviors. That's the front of your brain, right? It is a controlled panel of our personality and our ability to communicate. But the pathways to the frontal lobe develop slowly. And in fact, it's, just, it's said that, they are, as based on studies, that that frontal lobe and those pathways don't reach full maturation um, until you're about 25, 26. And it occurs earlier in, 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 women, in females than in males. Some males I don't think ever mature, but... Uh, <laughs> the mo uh, most important is that the early life experiences affects the development of these pathways, right? Trauma, abuse, and violence blocks the development of the pathways, right? And these are called, if we group all of these things together, they're called adverse childhood experiences. So all forms of violence and abuse have negative impacts on the brain's development. Verbal, sexual, emotional, and physical forms, forms of violence. Exposure and witnessing 
violence is just as impactful and, and so is verbal. A lot of people don't think of verbal as abusive and hurtful. But it is the whole issue of disrespect. To diss somebody is, uh, is, is a, a cause for major violence or in retaliation. This, this may lead the, the failures and the, of, of development of, the, of your, 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 your pathways uh, for the frontal lobe development uh, and, and all of these exposures to, to uh, adverse childhood experiences may lead to the involvement in illegal activities and crime. It impairs elect intellectual and educational achievement. Intrafamily abuse and violence affects the, child, uh, affects the children and leads to the development of intergenerational cycles of violence. Long-term indirect effects on physical and mental health. And it then, this in, in turn leads to the perpetuation of an intergenerational cycle of violence and poverty. So the, the evidence from one of the cohort studies on the 11-year-olds and the 15-year-olds showed that uh, this is based on a cognitive and behavioral assessments uh, uh, using standardized um, test, testing. And so when you put the, all the findings into a logistic regression model, ma uh, model we found that the caring and supportive parents, whether they be biological or surrogate, was important protective factor. So you need to have somebody that cares in your life, in the child's life. The children were numerate and literate. So literacy in particular was a very important as a protective factor. Involvement in structured after school activities. So involvement with supervision and guidance. And you know, the other important act, thing that was found in the, in the model was involvement in church-related activities. So given the, this da the, the data of, that we've seen, the research, and the science of, 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 of how the child develops and, and, and grows and the, and, the, and the brain matures, the, the importance of prevention, it stands out, the focus on the children that address the root causes and risk factors that promotes positive early life experiences, provides support for parents and primary caregivers to enable positive life experiences for the children, provision, provision of supportive school environment and positive approaches to the child's to teaching and children's learning, and special psychosocial intervention and remedial literacy for children with learning and behavioral problems who have evidence of ACEs, or ACEs is the, uh, is the adverse childhood experiences. So let's take examples from Jamaica. Uh, I've I, I reviewed uh, you know, international um, data as well, but I've just taken three examples. This is a program implemented ooh, over 20 years ago um, by the, the chair, that's the Caribbean uh, in Research Institute at the University of West Indies, um, uh, Professor Rantenberg McGregor and um, Susan Walker were the, some of the leading investigators. And it is a home-based uh, initiative which with, with, with home visiting and uh, the working with the child and the parents in the home um, to a, a, a provide stimulation and learning for the child and to get help the parent in, in the process of guiding the child's development um, and how to, uh, how to deal with the issues of discipline. Uh, and this was done in the first thousand days at in the under three year old and they were, they were, they, the women participated started were recruited from during the antenatal period and this go, step go back a little um, 
And, and, and 20 years later, comp there was, it's a randomized controlled trial, and so there was a control group and an intervention group. And the outcomes in comparing the intervention group with the, the uh, control group, the outcomes for the intervention group were extremely positive. Grade levels were obtained. This is 20 years after the intervention. Secondary level passes were, were, were achieved. De less expulsion from school, less depression and violent behavior, and, and they, had, they had employment with income levels 25% higher than the control group. Okay. This particular uh, intervention is developed and targeted the schoolroom in the early, in the basic, at the basic school level, early childhood, uh, helping, helping teachers to uh, interact and teach uh, to, in terms of how to control and improve the learning of children in, in, the, in, uh, in, in the classroom. And, the, and it, the methodology, which is called the IRI toolkit, showed that there was a decrease in fights, improved behaviors, conduct and hyperactive, and peer problems were reduced. Uh, they, there was good interaction and positive impact with parents, and the overall better classroom management. So that, right. And then you take the other thing, as I mentioned, one of the things to protect was the importance of structured after school activities for children in particular who have behavioral problems and who have li learning literacy problems. So the child resiliency program, which we actually implemented starting way back in 2005, and it, came, it, it started actually at Hope United, uh, taking children from the feeder schools in the, in the surrounding communities like Mona Primary and uh, Papin and schools that, in that area. And, it, and then it went to Boystown. The program is still in Boystown, taking feeder schools from the communities around Boystown. Uh, it, so, it's, that, so that was not why resources have been a challenge, but in all of the interventions, it, it, each group of children, it's about 60 children with behavioral and learning problems who have had um, adverse childhood experiences that are in the group, about 60 at a time. And step one, just go back again, and you'll see all the students graduated. They improved significantly in terms of their literacy, 75% improved their literacy competencies, 75% less fights, parent participation, because it has, it's an integrated program which uses parent education and the structure after school incorporates the use of music like drumming, it's sports, in some instances swimming, it's judo, uh, other sport-related activity. Uh, remedial classes as well as using the creative arts, uh, art and other uh, activities to teach uh, the, 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 the life skills, right? So that, in fact, is what actually re results in this type of importance of recognizing the need for to to provide nutrition to the children. So they, they need nutrition to feed the brain and to focus and, and, and take part in the activity. So Dr. Ashley, have so one minute. So what's the challenge is, uh, Dr. Ashley, we one, need leadership. One minute, yeah. one minute left. Leadership, we need to understand the data, the evidence, and the applications for policy and actions, and, and, and scaling up implementation, adequate resources, and proper monitoring and evaluation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ashley. I will now invite Joanna Callen now. Um, are you going to share your screen? Or? Oh, no. Okay. I'm just talking. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Joanna. Uh, thanks, Paris. The data struggle is very real. <laughs> um, one of the most standout examples of this data struggle is the Citizen Security and Justice Program, which ran for it's over a decade. And when I was with Capri and doing the report, a report, and I approached 
the, per the personnel of CSJP to get access to data on social interventions that had been implemented in several communities, they point blank told me two things. One, if I wanted the data from the earlier, um, the earlier years of the intervention, it was going to take three months to get it because it was in a storeroom in Spanish town in some government facility which blew my mind in the 21st century because I figured, you know, they would have soft copies. The second thing is that they admitted that it wasn't until the third phase of the evaluation, uh, third phase of the, of the implementation of the project, that a monitoring evaluation unit was actually created to evaluate the program that had been implemented. So it went for years with programs being implemented by third party stakeholders without proper assessments and monitoring evaluation being done, but more so to be able to have access to the data of previous iterations and previous programs that had been implemented to learn from what it is that had been done in previous, in previous years. And so one of the things for me is that the collection, storage, collation, and access to data is a very real thing. And it's something that we need to be honest with ourselves about. Um, there was a lot of discussion in the room yesterday uh, with the various programs, and some of these programs are really, really good. But the challenge comes is, that comes is the storage and collection of their data. Uh, the access, the transparency uh, for other stakeholders. A lot of the times, the evaluation that is being done with some of these programs is not done by independent third parties that are neutral to the program. And so both governments and NGOs um, that are operating, whether it's in the crime prevention space or the crime control space, because even from a crime control perspective, um, I've had problems in the past accessing data, right? Um, we can sit down here and extol on the great things that um, we've done with data in this country, but the reality is that the access, the access, the collection, the storage is very, very difficult to get. Sometimes people aren't willing to share data. And I say this to say, because when, when I did my gang report in, two th in 2020, in March, thankfully the week before COVID hit, um, we did a panel discussion, but during the course of, the, of doing that research, it took almost a year for me to get data that I needed. Almost an entire year. To this day, I'm still waiting two years later for some of the data I requested. Um, I came across organizations who work with gangs in communities, and some of the, uh, one of these organizations in particular is a very prominent player on the ground in some of these communities. And to this day, I cannot get access to data from them. And it's very hard for people I mean, if we're being honest, yes, there's a lot of great interventions out there. Yes, there is a lot of uh, programs that really should be getting greater funding. But the reluctance to share the data, the transparency, I mean, being able to access it. Uh, Kelly Magnus was up here yesterday. Kelly and I had a very frank conversation um, very early on in my, in my um, relationship with her. And one of the things that she said to me was that when she was started, had started operating in the, um, the, the stakeholder space of social interventions, uh, she went to another organization and just she was not able to get access to the data that they had. And I understand there's a level of competitiveness. Um, it was disagree. It was the point was made yesterday that a lot of these organizations do collaborate with each other, but there's also um, a level of honesty that we need to admit with ourselves that there is a competitiveness that exists within these organizations, and so there is a there is a gap in the continuity and sustainability of data being done. Uh, sometimes to, for another organization to go and redo data collection when the data already exists, but it's not willing to be shared with other stakeholders, or the cost to access that data uh, is just really exorbitant and just, you know, um, not in the spirits. I think at one of our earlier panels, um, the previous panel actually, um, Dr. Yeah. Dr. Davis said that 
it had, we have to remove the ego. So if, it's five, if there's a collaborative effort to solve that one, to, um, to address that one child, it shouldn't matter who's taking credit for that. It shouldn't be about the ego of the organizations that are working to save and make the changes in those people's lives. And so I'm going to be very brief, which is that just to say, we need to be very, have a very honest conversations with ourselves where data is concerned, our access to it, the willingness to share it, uh, the way in which we store it and collect it, um, and whether or not it is something that we are, we can't do evidence-based learning. And a lot, we do a lot of monitoring evaluation, but do we really learn from the mistakes that we've made in the past with a lot of the interventions that we have taken, that has taken place? Where did we go wrong? The data is needed for us to do the learning. And without that, uh, we are going to be sitting down here having these conversations over and over. Uh, we're going to have similar interventions doing, being run over and over. Uh, we have to have a solid database foundation if it is that we're going to bridge that gap between crime prevention and crime control to really start seeing changes that we need to see. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Very important points. Um, right now, we invite Charles Clayton from the PIOJ. Charles. Thanks, Paris. So I'm just going to say a little bit about the community renewal program, what it is, and the manner in which we use data and um, the tools we have developed using data. So first of all, the community renewal program is a uh, mechanism for coordinating and enhancing the delivery of programs and projects in targeted communities. We target 100 of the most volatile and vulnerable communities. The volatility and vulnerability um, component is, was determined by the development of an index of volatility and vulnerability, which we developed using existing data on a wide range of fields, includes things like literacy, um, violence within the communities, um, the, the school, um, att school attendance, uh, and a, a wide range of demographic as well as social data was used. And we divided the data into what we call volatility indicators and vulnerability indicators. Vul vulnerability indicators would include stuff such as the um, literacy, such as the... Um... Oh, you have it here in front of you. <laughs> I share my data. <laughs> we, don't, we don't keep the data here. So she, she has the index in front of her here now. So um, for vulnerability, we looked at literacy, we looked at num child abuse, we looked at things like um, the level of sexual abuse and so on. For, for volatility, we looked at things like number of murders, number of violence-related injuries and so on. And we combined them into a single index, a single measure that was overlaid on the communities within the five parishes that had sustained the highest level of murder over five previous years. Those parishes at that time were Kingston and St. Andrew, St. Catherine, Clarendon, and St. James. And we overlaid the index on these com um, the communities within these parishes. And those that scored the highest for volatility and vulnerability, we chose the top 100 of them as the areas on which to focus. That 100 was not determined by any scientific means. We said we wanted to have a number that could have some impact on the level of violence within the country. So we chose 100 based on the level of, of volatility and vulnerability that was indicated by that index. I should also point out that the program was not a crime-fighting program. It was not designed to fight crime. It was instead designed to address the issues and challenges that could give rise to criminality or to involvement in criminality. So um, it, it was a developmental project rather than a crime-fighting tool. And as an offspin of fighting these issues and challenges, it is expected that crime levels would go down eventually. But this, of course, is a long-term strategy because it takes time to bring about social change and community transformation. So that was the target of this particular program, or I should say, is the target. Uh, when we looked at the issues and challenges, we recognized that uh, a lot of programs and projects were being implemented within these community spaces, but they were one, uncoordinated, two, not necessarily targeted to the most needy spaces, and also not necessarily targeting the best interventions to address the issues and challenges that were needed. And, and so we recognized that there was a need for data to drive the selection of the community spaces 
and the actual interventions that were being done. So we developed a number of tools that we thought would be helpful in this regard. So we developed, for example, a community renewal index that combined five or six features so relating to social, economic, um, environment, and health, and security. And those factors are combined into a single index that is overlaid on the community. And by combining the data on these fields, we're able to determine how this community stands in relation to other communities as far as this index is concerned. So that's one tool we developed. We also developed a community readiness assessment tool, which was developed in collaboration with a number of other Caribbean islands um, um, driven by the CDB. And that tool, is to assist agencies in determining whether or not a community is ready for a particular type of intervention. One of the challenges agencies have is that sometimes putting a particular intervention in a space may not be the right thing to do at a particular time. For example, if you want to do housing, is there the capacity to maintain the houses? Is there capacity to maintain um, mortgages if that is necessary? That sort of question needs to be answered. And so the CRAT, Community Readiness Assessment Tool, is designed to answer some of these questions that an agency could then decide whether preliminary work needs to be done before a particular intervention is, give, is, is put in. The other tool we developed was a database for monitoring and evaluation. We developed around our program a strategic framework, a strategic plan, which has a number of broad thematic focuses and a number of um, outcomes and um, strategies associated with those outcomes. And that particular framework has attached to it an indicator framework for measuring how the results are showing based on the, the, the um, activities that are being done. That is not yet fully implemented because we don't have the number of agencies participating under the framework that we would like to have there, but it stands there. But to support that, we have a database and are designed for the purposes of monitoring, evaluation, and learning. And that database is capable of collecting information on activities that are occurring within the community spaces and being able to integrate them to produce a result that shows how a particular community space is doing in relation to the outcomes we're looking for uh, versus the activities that are taking place in that community space. We have also developed um, uh, mechanism for collecting information for feeding into this database, the baseline study. The baseline study collects a range of information on a, on a broad range of issues that is able to assist us, one, in populating the index and also in determining what direction a community is, is taking in relation to what activities are taking place there. That baseline study has been conducted on 17 communities so far, and it is two more being done in two of the Zozo communities. The hope is that we can have this conducted in all of the community spaces that are being targeted, and there'll be follow-up studies, um, hopefully within a two-year period after that first study, to see how progress is being made. The real challenge with that, of course, is financing because the studies are very expensive. It, uh, it, one study in one community costs somewhere in the region of $7 million. So you know that it, it's, it's an expensive venture and it is outside the capacity of any single agency to be able to sustain that. So we are working with partners to get this done and we have funding support, for example, from FCDO and we have had funding support, that is, that is the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. We have funding support from the CDB to, the collect the, to do the other 17, and we expect to get ongoing support from, from, from these agencies based on what the discussion we've been having. But these are some of the challenges that we have in terms of data collection. So those tools have been developed and are, are now being um, operationalized. The database, right now to be operationalized, we have to ensure um, connectivity with other databases which are supporting the monitoring and evaluation framework. And we also have to ensure that our partners are able to supply the data needed in the form it's needed and to have access to the data that they can have a feedback. They can also have inputs into the database in order for it to be effective. So that's what we're working on right now. So within that framework, what we have six pillars that we focus on social transformation, governance, safety and justice, economic development, um, youth development, 
and physical transformation. We say if we keep that lens in sight, we're able to look at the broad spectrum of issues that need to be addressed, and we can see where more effort needs to be put based on how the data is showing, and where less effort needs to be put based on the, the data that we collected. So that, in a nutshell, is a CRP, Community Renewal Program, and those are the mechanisms that we're using, the manner in which we use data to support what we're doing. Thank you very much, Charles. You brought us right back on, on, on track right now. Um, I'll open the floor to questions from the audience at this time. If I may um, ask the first question, Dr. Blake. Um, you know, when we look at the crime statistics and even the media reports every day, the, you know, it paints a grim picture. Uh, how do you um, um, do the final translation, that kind of last mile between your data and technology to actual outcomes in terms of crime reduction, effective policing, and so on. And what is that last mile like? All right. Um, um, if I understand your question correctly, well, um, first of all, everything that we do um, requires planning, as you mentioned before. It requires planning from the divisional level. And, and so the, the, the common features around the crime and security environment in a particular division um, remains somewhat consistent, and so we can plan for it for the for the calendar year. And um, in doing that, there is a detailed assessment that has been done, um, detailed analysis as to what are the driving factors, and that um, that data is used to determine the, the strategies that we move forward with. Uh, we operate in a very dynamic environment, and so things changes. So we have to build in these plans a level of flexibility. Um, in order to, to to respond to these changes, even though the plan may set out a certain um, set of activities. Um, <clears throat> however, in addition to having that strategy, that, that one year annual, that annual plan um, for each formation, we have to also now look at um, a daily analysis of the data in order to determine um, where do we put our resources um, next in order to, to provide deterrence and, and to um, prevent and to prevent um, further occurrence. And so it, it is done on, on several fronts, several planes, but um, in every aspect of what we do and on every step, it is heavily reliant on the use of, of, of information and data in order to, to treat with that. Um, and, uh, not sure I answered your question. No, no, correctly, that was, that was pretty good. Um, and my next question is... Um, there is also, let me just basically yeah. um, um, say that there is also our plans themselves, our planning mechanism around treating. Our plans are comprehensive, especially the, the, uh, the plans for divisional formations, geographic divisions. And we take a risk-based approach to our planning. Um, and, and it is highly structured. So if you go in one division, um, you see a, a divisional plan, it looks similar in structure and format to um, one in another division. However, the, the things that are of, of, of interest in a particular division may be slightly different. I'll give you an example. Um, so we have a lot of gang um, conflict and gang operation in the Clarendon space. Um, unlike any other space in Jamaica, much of this is driven by pretty alarsony. And so Whilst you may have pre larceny elsewhere in, say, for example, St. Mary, the actual approach to dealing with that um, would be different because you may not have the level of gang involvement in pre larceny in St. Mary as you have in, in, in Clarendon. And so it is really the information that, that, that provides us um, the, 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 the understanding um, so that we can employ the strategy against pre larceny in order to reduce criminal um, violent activities um, in, a, in a somewhat different format as we would do in St. Mary. Um, right, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Blake. I think we have a question from Sharon. Hi, good afternoon. This question is for Dr. Blake. I was very impressed with your um, overview of the use of data in the JCF, um, because I'm always struck when I go to the site that there is so little data on 
um, even break down on the crime statistics. Basically, what you have are, are the, the 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 figures for the community for the police divisions. But there's nothing like this week. I was looking for gender, the number of women who are murdered annually. There's nothing like that on the out, out there on the system. Um, community level type data, again, not available. So is it that you consider this very um, sensitive material or um, can, can it be made available to the public, to researchers, um, just to, so people can understand the depth and analyze some of the issues that we're facing? Thank you. Yes, um, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, we do um, collect data on these um, on these points that you've just raised. And our data, as a matter of fact, um, this is data that we have shared on a on a um, regular basis with our um, several external entities, places like CMOC, um, um, PSOJ, etc. And we have a pretty comprehensive. Um, collection. We talk about gender. Our data is um, um, captured and, and recorded um, and structured in terms of um, gender, age, date, a wide range, wide range. And we have been doing this for, for, for numerous years. I'm not sure I can speak to why you are not able to obtain data of that, but that is data that has been um, with us for quite some time. Um, it's not. It's not a case that we and 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 every level, and every level, everything with respect to crime, and all the data points, the necessary data points, um, for any um, any incident of of crime, um, is recorded and properly structured, and that is available. Um, there are indeed times when the 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 nature of the information has to be withheld, not necessarily um, the ability to share the general aspect of the information. For example, you, we, we avoid sharing things like identity information, um, where people have um, people's names and addresses and stuff like that um, involved for research. Much of the research need really do not require that level of detail. The fact that we don't doesn't necessarily mean that that is not, um, that is not available. And one other thing I also, I, I hear, um, um, I hear at, sometimes um, it said about um, the, the, the ability to get information when data when requested. What I find sometimes, and this is not always the case, this is not always the case, but sometimes I find that many of the requesters do not request data. Some of the requests that comes to us sometimes are then say, to satisfy that request itself requires internal research. Sometimes we really do not have the time to, to satisfy it. It's not um, a requesting um, a, a, a data set of a particular period on a particular on a particular area, but but um, information around the impact of something and something else that will require us to do far deep analysis. And, and, and I would dare say research in order to satisfy these requests. So sometimes we have to look at the requests themselves, especially when we are researchers, bear in mind that sometimes the information that we are asking for are the very same thing that our, or that we are supposed to be doing in our research. And we fuel the data in order to facilitate that. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. We have a question from the audience and then Diana afterwards. Go Good evening, everyone. Good evening, panelists. Uh, I am Alicia Christie, and I have a legal background. I am currently an attorney at law in Jamaica, where I'm currently in correctional services. My question to you, Dr. Blake. It is commendable that we have data available to the wider public in order for them to analyze a number of key features in relation to violent crime and criminal, criminal violence in Jamaica. Um, my thing is that uh, in terms of going to court, prosecuting a person for a crime, 
it is important that evidence is there. Evidence has to be there in order to secure a conviction. So my question to you is, what resources are currently being secured uh, in terms of upgraded the shift in technological forensic science? What is the JCF doing in order to secure uh, those types of forensic science that will aid in solving crime in Jamaica? Um, very good question. Thank you very much. I am very sorry. I really should have had the information here. Um, and I would have presented, I know the commission has presented it, and several fora, the, 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 the extensive use of forensic um, data that we have made um, in in several of our investigations. I think he has, um, for a number of years, I've been making presentation with upgraded, um, updated figures in terms of things like DNA and other forensic. We have the tools that we have and that we continue to use are no less than what is used elsewhere. Um, we have the, the very latest in, in technological tools where that is concerned, and much of our investigations benefit from that. Where we are lacking, and I've been doing some work around it, is the, is a tool to manage the investigative process. And I'm sure if you um, are paying attention to um, the media and, and um, following um, our, our regular update, we have um, commenced the implementation of our our station records management and case management system that will aim to do just that, assist in the management of the investigative process. But with respect to um, forensic, right, we have um, a pretty um, robust um, outlay of, of, of technology and tools, um, um, including, including um, cyber security. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Blake. Um, Diana? Uh, just going back to what um, you were talking about in the previous question and answer about access to the data and the requests being onerous on you. Um, you know, this is Capri's life story, basically, is trying to get data and um, having challenges getting data, whether it's you know from the PIOJ or the JCF or other state agencies. And we did a study of maybe a year or so ago about child mental health services um, in Jamaica. And we were able to come to the conclusion that only 8% of child mental health services are being, needs are being met in Jamaica. And we were able to do that because we had the extraordinary cooperation of the Ministry of Health. And they literally, as you said, they had to do research. They, we were trying to, in order to get to that measure, we were asking for information that they had to go and do the research for. But the end result of it was the creation of knowledge that benefited everybody. And oftentimes when these research requests come in, um, I, so I guess my, my, what I'm trying to say is I'm trying to urge you and maybe to, you might need more resources to do it, but in considering that in your filling others' data requests, you're also creating knowledge for yourselves and for the work that you do, as well as supplying data to others. And the other aspect of that that I think is important is in terms of the perception of transparency. When you are able to readily provide data, and this is not just JCF, this is PIOJ, this is all the other state agencies and, and other entities who are working in areas that data is interesting, important, used for research and analysis otherwise. When you're able to readily provide data and provide it on a timely basis, provide you know, what people are asking for, the, that consolidates a notion of transparency that increases all sorts of good things in terms of public support, public perception, and so on. Um, it's, it's not a good look for any agency, not just the JCF, when a researcher has to stand up and say, we had a difficult time getting the data. It suggests a lack of transparency, and that is a very, very bad suggestion. Thank you, Diana. 
think we're um, gonna... If I may respond to that yeah. um, quite, quite quickly. Very, very quickly, very quickly, Dr. Blake. Yes. Right. Um, the, 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 the importance of, of research, I mean, I myself is a researcher. We have several quite qualified researchers within the JCF. We have a research department. So the, the importance of it and the knowledge gained from doing research is not lost on us. The reality is, though, that some of the researches that we do um, in the, it, well, when we were conducting our research, it, I mean, Charles mentioned the, the extensive um, outlay, financial outlay required to do some of these studies. We do them ourselves sometimes, even without that. that. So you, we, we do understand the, the, the extent. But when there is, is a request that comes in, I mean, given the limited resources that we have sometimes to satisfy um, that request, it's sometimes just not possible at the time and at the pace at which it was it is required, and that's all I'm saying. And it's unfortunate that um, that that would be viewed as lack of transparency um, when when these when when the reality that we live in and the reality that we face is that we I don't know that there is any organization in this side of the world that has the immense amount. Of, of of responsibility and 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 work pressure that the JCF has on a daily basis, and so it is it is not the issue of sharing the, the data, providing the data, but it is the the, the the ability to stop what is that that is being done now to satisfy our research itself, and the fact that we may not be able to do it at the time when it is requested of us, okay. um, um, should not in any way whatsoever be. Um, an indication of, of lack of transparency. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Blake. Um, Nadia, you have a question for any other panelist? Yes. Anyone Anyone can answer. Anyone, anyone, anyone can answer. Except for Dr. Blake. Uh, true, we should give him a rest. <laughs> um, to be fair, though, I think he has given us quite a concrete yeah. as to why sometimes the data isn't forthcoming yeah, sure. capacity. Mm -hmm. We've also heard financing can ultimately be a challenge. And we've heard from Joanna over the two days, you know, ego is there something in the ego in the personalities involved particularly on the social intervention side and i wanted to, to kind of peel back a bit because i think with everything something like data and particularly data for m and e can feel so pedestrian but we know that's not the case in our context historically and socially so i think there's something about the power dynamics involved and i think there's something about trust and respect here that data gives us a critical lens to really get into um, I think, and I want to start with because Joanna's been the brave one to really, you know, put forward a hypothesis, you know, there's some ego scenarios going on. And I think, Joanna, if we take that and complicate it a bit, especially when we're talking about the social intervention space, as someone who has never owned a program but has volunteered on many, contributed in many different aspects of many, as a going and coming volunteer Jamaican who loves where she come from. And when I reflect on it, it's such a broad array that it's difficult to say anything too broad stroke. So I want to nuance it. When you're thinking about the multiple different stakeholders involved in social intervention, I think of some who really would be incapacitated to do the kind of data work that we know is absolutely necessary. And there's a bit of ego, but there's a bit of turfing, but there's also probably a bit of trying to protect the work. You know, when you think of all sides of the argument, I think of in, in another part of the range or spectrum of folks who do social intervention work, the power dynamic around being seen to be doing good work, the kind of moral legitimacy that that gives, and that's a power in and of itself. And therefore the evaluation, yes, you're correct, it's so much more about the person, the personality, even that class of people being seen to do something about a tremendous inequity than necessarily about what it is we need the data for, which is, look, we need to check on if this intervention is working or not. So that was me kind of making a plea for, I love the hypotheses, but especially in intimate spaces like this, it would be wonderful to pull back and to get into some of these things like the trust and the respect dynamics that really hold us back from being able to take things to the next stage. I can't leave out from that kind of nuancing something like CSJP. We have to make the distinction that that was a government multilaterally funded significant program? Do we have different standards for programs funded in different ways? You know, and what are the dynamics again, interagency very different from interpersonality? 
necessary to look, yes, at some of the things that the previous panelists, I think, brought to us that we don't usually discuss, things like class and race and gender, and how all of those things also impact trust and respect. So I think that the data, yeah. fabulous discussion, but can also be used to peel back to look at some of these other factors that really impact how we do the work, especially how we do the work together well. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Um, I just have one question as we close off and ready for the next session um, for Charles. Um, you mentioned in the, in the selection for your CRP communities, um, you have in the indices and volatility indicators, lots of data to justify the selection and the monitoring and evaluation. Could you share with us um, how, how much political interference throws all that data out the window to make something happen that's convenient? Well, uh, the, the, the thing is, it has worked in the reverse, that it has allowed us to sustain the selection and actually support the selection. Um, we have not had political interference because the data has been provided. I remember when we went to St. James to prioritize the communities there, we took data down with us, and we had a panel of experts there, and we had a scoring mechanism for selecting what would be prioritized. And when it was done, a couple of politicians said they knew this was going to happen, but they can't say nothing about it because the data says otherwise. So actually, I think using data actually protects you from political interference, and it has worked well in our favor. Very good. Thank you all very much. Thank you, panelists, and thank you for your participation. Um, I close off. Ronaldo. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon everyone again. Good afternoon. We're going to proceed to our last and final panel. I ask you for at least some mental push-ups as we can welcome our last panel. At this time, I'd like to invite Dr. Jacqueline Roden Trader and the panelists for our last and final panel, panel number nine.
Pleasant good afternoon again. I'm Dr. Jacqueline Roden Trader. I'm a sociology of law criminologist at Coppin State University, located in Baltimore, Maryland, the US. I've been asked to moderate the final panel of the two-day symposium. And we thank you for uh, being here with us throughout those two days. And we trust it has been edifying. The final panel has to do with the justice system, looking at prosecutorial and legislative challenges to reducing crime and violence. We've been talking a lot about one prong of the criminal justice system, the police. But the system is just that, it is a system, it is three-pronged. And so we cannot forget that we must discuss the issue of the courts and the significant role that they play in meting out justice. However, there are significant challenges, just as there are challenges for the police, just as there are challenges for corrections, there are significant challenges as it relates to the prosecutor who has the responsibility of showing beyond a reasonable doubt that the accused has in fact committed the crime. The panelists today are here to share with you some of those challenges that perhaps the populace is not even aware of. You know, we oftentimes point a finger at them. We say they aren't doing this and they aren't doing that. Or we don't engage in legislation by voting and all those kinds of things. So our experts here today um, will share with us the challenges that they face and you'll be able to ask queries of them momentarily. First up today, we've got Ms. Alethea Tomlinson. Ms. Tomlinson currently serves as Director of Legal Affairs uh, within the Legal Affairs Division of the Jamaican Constabulary Force. Her responsibilities include facilitating quality delivery of legal services, managing and supporting legal personnel, lead counsel in major legislative reform, um, across all areas. And so without further ado, Ms. Tomlinson, the floor is yours to edify us. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for allowing me to be here this afternoon. All right, so my presentation, I have a PowerPoint that I'll be delivering, and I thought that it would be good to set a kind of framework for the current legislative environment that we're operating in, particularly the most recent amendments that have been made to some critical pieces of legislation and some proposals that from the JCF point of view still needs to be done in order to increase our effectiveness and capacity. So my presentation today is entitled Legislative Reform, Recent Amendments and Future Proposals. Now, touching on some recent amendments that have been made to some critical pieces of legislation last year in 2021, and just highlighting three of those pieces of legislation that really have an impact in the investigation and successful prosecution of offenses. So these three pieces of legislation are the Dangerous Drugs Amendment Act 2021, and that act was passed in February 22 last year the Criminal Justice Suppression of Organizations Amendment Act 2021 that was passed in, on July 30, 2021, and the Corrections Amendment Act 2021, which was passed on December 24, 2021. Now, in terms of the Dangerous Drugs Amendment Act, now what it critically provides for and what is going to help in our enforcement of dangerous drugs, it provides for the destruction of seized drugs prior to the end of criminal proceedings. And this, is, this was particularly important to the JCF because in terms of our storage capacity, our capacity to continuously transport dangerous drugs to court for admission into evidence, this was something that we thought was a critical tool to aid us in that regard. And this act allows for drugs to be destroyed before the completion of criminal proceedings. However, what's important to note, the destruction can only be done if it is authorized by the court that has jurisdiction to hear the matter. 
and it can only be done upon an application by the Director of Public Prosecutions. So the DPP will be able to look at the particular case, determine whether this is an appropriate application to make, whether the actual drugs in, in its original form, its original quantity is necessary. If it is not, she's empowered to make that application to the court for the drugs to be destroyed. Um, another critical thing to note in relation to this provision, I believe, is that it also limits potential corruption in terms of the potential to tamper with exhibits before they reach to the court. Another thing to note is that before an order for the destruction can be made, however, certain conditions must have been satisfied. Certain things have to be done before the court is going to make that order. And those are three things. Firstly, images of the drugs must be recorded, whether it be by photograph or whether it be by video. There must be a recorded image of how the drugs were found and seized. Also, of course, there needs to be a documented analysis, laboratory analysis must be made by the forensic lab. Of course, we have to prove that the particular drug that was seized, it, well, the particular substance that was seized is actually the drug that we're alleging it is. So that must be done before the court can authorize any destruction, as well as a sample of the drug must be taken and retained. Now, the Act also allows for a certificate from the officer that made the recorded image or that took the sample to be admitted into evidence. And that certificate, what it does is certify that the particular sample is a true sample or the particular photograph is a true photograph of the actual substance. And we find this particular amendment critical in terms of saving court time because this certificate can be admitted without the actual officer having to be called to come to court unless the defendant specifically says that he needs that officer to come. So it saves court time, it saves the need to have the witnesses attend court, which is always a problem in the Jamaican context. And it's especially in light of the fact that about, and DPP can say about 99% of the cases for drugs is not whether the substance is the drug, we say it is, it's whether the person is, it was in possession at the ready button time, right? So the issue is really not whether the substance is the drug. Now it also provides that instead of the drug, the actual substance having to be produced at the trial, the recorded image or the sample can be produced instead. So it acts as the actual drug once the certificate that I spoke of before accompanies that sample. Another critical piece of legislation that was amended last year is the Criminal Justice Suppression of Criminal Organizations Amendment Act, otherwise known as the Antigang Act. And of course, this is something that is very important to the, to the JCF. And one of the amendments that were, was made was the expansion of the type of offenses that the Act applies to. So what happened was the term serious offenses was amended to applicable offenses, and the applicable offenses, the types and categories of those were extended. So now it applies to more offenses than it did before. So the, the scope of the act is now wider. It can catch a wider gambit of offenses. Some of the offenses that have now been included are listed here. Larceny Act, simple larceny, Abstracting electricity, larceny from the person, receiving stolen property, and certain offenses under the Betting, betting Games and Lotteries Act. So this is critical because the definition itself of a criminal organization is based on the type of offense that the particular group has its purpose to, to engage in, to commit. So it's important that we recognize the wide category of offenses that these criminal organizations engage in so that they can be captured under the act. And that was done with the amendments. Another amendment was that there is now an additional factor that the court can take into account in determining whether an offense has been committed, whether a person is actually a member of a criminal organization. And that is where there are any symbols or markings that have been found in possession or on the person, whether it be tattoos, any type of per paraphernalia that has the gang logo, the gang symbols, because we understand even from an international perspective that one of the 
identifying features of gangs is that they, they, in their communities, they are proud to say that they are members of gang. That is what instills the fear in the communities. So they will have their tattoos with their gang name. They will post pictures with their gang paraphernalia. So this was an important f factor that we thought needed to be included in the act that the court can consider in determining the question that it has to answer. Of course, it alone would not be enough to convict anyone, but it is part and parcel of the different circumstances that the court is now entitled to look at to make that determination. <laughs> there is also a new offense, and that offense is where persons, owners, or operators, where they own premises or conveyances, and they knowingly permit and cause these premises or conveyances to be used to commit an offense under the act. So we're not only going after the persons who actually are doing the criminal offenses, we're going after the facilitators, right? So where you lend your vehicle and you know that this person is going to go off and commit a criminal offense, you're going to be caught in this. And the penalty for that offense is a fine or imprisonment of up to 15 years. So this shows Parliament's seriousness in how it considers this category because without the facilitators, a lot of these criminal offenses could not be committed. Now there is another additional consideration that the court can now take into account when it's hearing these types of um, gang offenses. And that goes to money, the benefit, the proceeds of crime. So what the act now allows for is that the court can, can consider during the trial of an offense whether the person is in possession of property for which he cannot satisfactorily account for and which is disproportionate to the known sources of income. Or whether the person had at about the time of the alleged commission of the offense obtained an accretion to the person's property for which he cannot satisfactorily account for. So this recognizes that the real purpose, the real motive for the commission of a lot of these offenses is money. They do it to get its, its financial benefit, right? So where are we finding in a lot of cases that we will see the people with the big cars, with the big houses, and when you check with tax admin, when you check with NIS and their actually known sources of income, it is completely disproportionate, right? So this is another factor that the court can take into account. Again, it alone would not be sufficient, but it is recognizing that this is what is really operating on the ground for the persons who are involved in these criminal organizations. So another important amendment was that there are now certain aggravating circumstances which, if they existed at the time that the offense was committed, the court is empowered to make an additional sentence, to add more time to the person's sentence. And that time is a time period of not exceeding 10 years. So these are particularly aggravating factors which Parliament have seen to be so egregious that it justifies additional penalties. So for example, if the offense of recruiting a child, which is an offense currently under the act, if that offense is committed on premises or on the grounds or within 300 meters of a school or any other educational institution, or it involves the aiding, abetting, incitement, or inducing of violence as a part of the recruitment process. So the parliament is, is saying that where you go into schools, right, and you actively recruit these children, right, you, you lay away them at, at the school gate. This is so egregious that if you're committed, co convicted of this offense, you're going to get additional time, right? So it sends a strong signal as to how Parliament views this type of offense. Additionally, if at the time of the commission of certain offenses, the person has in his possession any item of dress, designation, or description description of a law enforcement officer. So we have heard of examples and stories where persons impersonate police officers, right? And it is under the guise of law enforcement that they go in and they're able to commit these horrible offenses. So this is another aggravating factor that can make the person liable to additional time. And another one is if the person who committed the offense was not a citizen of Jamaica. So this is recognizing the international scope of organized crime. So if someone comes from another country and tries to invoke and get in, right, and utilize what they learn in their country in their organized crime and come and commit it here, 
that is another serious circumstance that will warrant an additional penalty. All right, so the third act is the Corrections Amendment Act, right? And for this act, the main piece of amendment that is critical is that it is now an offense for an inmate to possess a cellular phone, computer, or other electronic communication device without authorization. It is also no offense for that person to use the cellular phone to send data that prejudices the safety or security of any person. So we found that a lot of times we would have young leaders that have been arrested, convicted, in prison lockup, but they're still able to maintain their leadership of the gang and to maintain that stronghold and to continue to invoke fear in the community because they're giving orders from prison, right? So it's like they're really not locked up. They're still able to manage their criminal enterprise. So this is a critical amendment that now makes it expressly an offense before it was an administrative matter. Now this makes it expressly an offense. And the penalties are there. First, well, so it can either be in the parish court or the circuit court. In parish court, you see $3 million for first offense or not exceeding three years. For second or subsequent offense, $5 million or term not exceeding five years. And circuit court, a fine or term of imprisonment not exceeding seven years for the first offense or not exceeding 50 year, 15 years for the second offense. However, we do have a proposal to make in terms of further amendment because we would like the act to go further to say that these penalties should run consecutive to any time period that the person is currently serving. Because as you can appreciate, if the person is serving five years and they're found with a phone within the first two years, an addition, the additional three years is not gonna affect them. It's not gonna have the deterrent effect. So we want that to be something that parliament also considers to express to the state that it should be consecutive. So wrapping up, so some of the further proposals that the JCF have is in relation to the Bail Act. One of the big things that we're promoting is what is known as pre-charge detention. So pre-charge detention is in the current act in the sense that the definition of bail does include pre-charge detention, but the actual substance of the act, the body of the act, does not go into the procedures involved. It does not make any provision for how pre-charge detention can work. Um, so this is a quote here from the UK Home Secretary from a publication where they say that pre-charged bail is an important tool. It allows the police to reduce the risk of harm to victims and witnesses by setting robust and proportionate conditions on those under investigation and supports the timely prog progression of investigations. So one of our main proposals to the Bail Act is pre-charged bail, giving the power to, admit, to the police to administer pre-charge bail to a suspect where we have reasonable grounds to suspect that they have committed an offense, but we have not yet reached the level that we are able to charge them. So instead of growing to the more severe of holding them, physically detaining them, we can impose certain conditions on them. And some of the conditions that we're recommending is that the person has to report, you know, for a certain amount of time to a police station, the person is prohibiting from contacting certain witnesses, interfering with any potential witnesses, and that they're required to inform the police. Ms. Tomlinson, I am so sorry, no but I must do what I do well, <laughs> which is I have to say, hold tight for a moment. Perhaps the rest of your presentation will come out in the queries yes, that will be posed. Definitely. But we're going to give um, the other presenter, Miss. Llewellyn, the opportunity to present. Thank you no so much. Problem. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. In the criminal justice system, you have defined roles. You have the police investigator or law enforcement. You have the prosecutor. You have the judge. You have defense counsel. You have jurors. You have court staff. Now, sometimes what I like to call uninformed commentators, whether in editorials or commentary, which is their right to say, to make, but <laughs> sometimes those of us in the system, when we see some of the commentary, it is quite clear to us that um, perhaps a little bit of CSI and law and order is prevailing 
or what I'd like to call looking at the problem from a cerebral approach, as opposed to where we are in the trenches. A prosecutor or effective prosecution can only take place if you have credible, cogent, reliable, admissible evidence to present. You can either have direct evidence or circumstantial evidence. Sometimes when I hear commentators, oh, we need some more technology. What about technology? And I say to myself, having been in the trenches, having been on the low cost, having spoken to witnesses, their family, victims, having gone into some of these places, and I look around at the little two-room structure where the door was kicked open. What is it that this structure should have a CCTV that perhaps when the community or the neighbors see the gang coming with their M16s to kill and commit arson as well, they should say, pause. I have my recorder on my cell phone because it just may happen that I'll be called to give evidence later. And the judge may want to see a recording to corroborate my viva voce evidence. It doesn't happen like that in real life at all. Okay? You are lucky if you are able to get DNA um, evidence, as I was in a case that I recently prosecuted, where in the first time in my career, I, I did a case where a 13-year-old boy was quite well built for his age, strangled, buggered, and raped a nine-year-old child. And talking about going on the trenches, in the preparation for the case in West Milan, I went on the scene in the hills of West Milan with the police and the father of the deceased who had discovered the body lying on his back with her tunic above her waist and her legs apart, her panty and her, on her tights on one ankle. Her neck, according to her father, looking as if it was broken and her tongue protruding out of her head. Now, great violence was done to that young child. But luckily, we had not only two children who were eight and nine at the time, but now are 12, who gave evidence showing that the accused was the last person to be seen with the young girl who he lured into this area on the pretext of picking apples. But he decided to become the serpent in the garden. And we had DNA evidence coming from semen that was found in her anus. So it was quite clear when one looked at the evidence of the doctor and the DNA expert that ejaculation had taken place in her anus but we had DNA and we had excellent police work that that night and by 11, 12 o'clock he was in custody. But what a lot of members of the public don't know is that several of these types of matters, you have the astute police officer engaging the prosecutor from day one. And I say from the murder case in Clarendon with the five, unfortunately, five persons, to several gang cases, to several high public interest matters from sometimes the night or the day after we are engaged. We are using a lot more plea negotiation, and that is how we have been able to break the back of some cases where we use cooperating witnesses, to give evidence against other um, criminals. And we do it successfully too. Now, in order to get the evidence, you have to have witnesses for the most part. No matter how much technology 
you are going to have. By and large, in the great majority of the cases, you are going to have to have witnesses to give the evidence, to create the nexus, to put in exhibits, and to give the narrative. When you have a lot of violence in a community in Jamaica, you have to understand the community dynamic. The police are our eyes and ears on the ground. And I say to myself rather cynically, when I see some of these uninformed commentaries, there is not one editor and most commentators who have had the experience of having to convince a witness who has been totally and thoroughly intimidated to come and give evidence. And I say again, unlike the impression you may get watching CSI or Law and Order, if you do not have witnesses to give cogent, credible evidence, then you don't have a case. And no matter how much suspicion you may have, you don't have a case. It's as simple as that. So you find that the police and the prosecutors have to be very innovative. We have to think outside the box. And witness care has to come front and center in respect of being able to engage and maintain the interest of that witness. Unknown to some of you, there are witnesses, if they are on the program, based on the risk assessment, they may have to be kept abroad. There are so many things that go on in respect of law enforcement and prosecution. No judge who is up there in the clouds would be aware. If you are not careful, they too are prone to the CSI and law and order effect. Okay? Because it is the prosecutor and the police who interface in the trenches with the victims right there. And happily, you're talking to a DPP who doesn't like to reside in the clouds or at the top of the Eiffel Tower. I'm right there in the trenches, which is why I spent four weeks in Westmoreland where there was no air conditioning on in a sauna in my suit, prosecuting. But guess what? It keeps me grounded. I speak to the police. I go on the scene, and I actually prosecute the cases. So I rem remain grounded, and I know what is happening in the trenches. Okay? So I just want to make sure that you all know that when we have the editors and some of the commentators, oh, we need more prosecutions. And I say, look at them. And probably... If somebody said boo, they would jump out of their skin. Who can know when you are in court and you see an accused person staring you down and you dare not drop your gaze because nobody must ever feel that they can intimidate the prosecutor or the police investigator, right? But very often they are fortunate because very often... Due process says that you are innocent until, until proven guilty. And as a prosecutor, we must be fearless but extremely fair because the public interest that we operate in, while we try to be effective, says that we must make sure that as ministers of justice, everybody's rights is attended to. The pendulum of justice, however, must not only swing in one direction, it has to swing in both. And for your information, this phenomenon where we have prisoners in custody who have access to cell phones is a great violence producer in itself. And I'm very happy to hear about the amendment to the act, but what we need to see is a situation where the corrections department, like the police, have a re-enlistment program so that you, from time to time, every four or five years, you have to re-enlist. Because as I understand it now, even if it is that that person, a warder, is caught giving contraband, it is the most difficult thing to get that warder out of the system.
but yet you will have the guys. I have done cases. I did one case. We are in the middle of prosecuting the case for wounding with intent because the witness survived and murder. While the witness is giving the evidence, the police call me in the night. Say, Miss Llewellyn, the witness called me to say that the accused called him from jail, begging him not to continue to give the evidence the next day. But guess what? As a prosecutor, if you get a threat, if your witness gets a threat, you cannot indicate that to the judge. And that ensures that the judge remains in the Eiffel Tower or in the clouds. We have to deal with it on the ground. And all we can say, because we are in trial, be courageous and continue to be true to your oath to speak the truth. Well, in that case, we got a conviction for both. So it is not the prosecutor's duty to reduce violence. We are operating in an antisocial environment in certain communities where criminality is accommodated. And it is not only accommodated in the community who sometimes the suspects and the accused, they're all relatives and all related. But unfortunately, it is accommodated by people in the community going up the scale, even to some elements of the political class, who are willfully blind and look the other way. So they have plausible deniability. Because you get these things, you know, in your statements, you see all sorts of things. Witnesses and their relatives, they tell you all sorts of things and you're able to put three plus two together to make five. But we have to act with high integrity and we can only be guided by the evidentiary material that is available. So our duty is to put forward the best available evidence. Luckily, we have had some amendment to legislation that ensures that by evidence special measures, we can have live link for witnesses who do not um, wish to be in court. We are utilizing the Plea Negotiation Act to great effect, and we have to keep that confidential most times because otherwise it would attract um, perhaps a negative to the family of the cooperating witnesses. But in respect of Tesha Miller, that is how we were able to get that witness, a top lieutenant in the Klan's organization, to give the evidence. We also have agreed facts where we may have a case with 15 witnesses. I had that in Westmoreland with that same case. And we got agreed statements with six of the witnesses with the defense. Also, sentencing, we now have the right of appeal. And we are awaiting a particular judgment. I dealt with the first such appeal. And um, I have every confidence that it will be successful. So the administration of justice has its challenges and will always have its challenges. But it is a question of us giving service above self and not working in silos and making sure that there's effective communication, certainly between the prosecutor and the police investigator to make sure that we have effective prosecutions, which if you have more and more of that happening, will perhaps help to enhance the confidence of the public in the administration of justice and, by the way, also help to reduce violence because we will be able to put away, once we have the evidence, more of the violence producers in the society. Thank you. Thank you, Director Llewellyn. Thank you. Alrighty, our last presenter is the troublemaker, Dr. Tyrone Powers. <laughs> who he knows the rule. Dr. Powers, uh, for, for those who have just joined us and are not familiar with Dr. Powers, let me give him his kudos. Uh, Dr. Powers is a former uh, FBI agent, former law enforcement uh, officer, well sought out across the United States, and he does uh, provide a lot of insights into this topic of uh, the challenges for prosecuting and legislation. Dr. Powers. Yes, and I'm, I'm going to be brief, despite my reputation. Um, I agree with uh, all the comments about prosecution. 
But let me just let me just add this to it. Let me go from the back end and add a little bit from it. Judges are not born judges. So everything that you just discussed in terms of what the prosecutor has to go through, the legislation, judges know about that. And so after you do all of that work, you prosecute, you find witnesses, we create new legislation. If, in fact, the evidence indicate that a horrendous crime had been committed, then judges have to complement that system by sentencing people to sentences that they deserve. And it's not that they don't understand. If, if you have all the evidence, you, you, you talked about the difficulty of, of getting witnesses, uh, putting a case together, of getting the facts together, of getting this before the court, because deterrence is not just the threat of being prosecuted. Deterrence is the threat of being convicted, and sentence. The criminal justice system is a system, police, courts, and corrections. And individuals who are in the process or thinking about or considering, after we've done all the intervention, the social interaction that we've discussed over the last few days, individuals who are making a decision, a conscious decision, despite all of that, and despite the assistance, and despite the options, and despite the intervention, to do this have to know that you have competent prosecutors, and clearly we've been explaining that process strongly and clearly, that you have legislation that backs up or that gives prosecutors the tools they need and the finances and resources so you have enough prosecutors so the cases can be adequately pursued, and that at the end of that, if everything is done right, if the police are appropriately trained in gathering evidence, I know they work closely with the prosecutors, but the prosecutors and the police don't work together every single day. So your police must be very well trained by prosecutors to an extent and the kind of evidence that they need to successfully prosecute a case and how to collect that evidence in a proper fashion by working close with the prosecutors. And then after that is said and done, judges who, are, who, and we understand they should not be influenced by any other part of the system, but again, they didn't come out of their mother wounds being judges. So they do know the society in which they, in which they exist, exist. They do know the problems of this particular society. They do know the murder rate, not only here, but around the world. And they do know, and they do read um, legal processes, even legal processes that, is not, that are not identical or even equal to the process here. And they understand in order for a system, it is called a system, in order for a system to work, all three components have to do their job and do it well. And then we, the legislation about corrections and cell phones and things of that sort, all of those things um, are wonderful. Legislation is always wonderful because it is put in place. But then it has to be implemented to be effective. It has to be impacted. And when it is, and when, when the entire system works in accordance to the way it's supposed to work, when the police do their job and the prosecutors with the proper evidence are able to get a conviction and the judge do not succumb to excuses and representations and, and mitigations that have nothing to do with the horrendous nature of that particular crime, then that has to be publicized. Because people will not be deterred if they don't know that the system is now in a different mode. We're being educated today in this particular group about the new legislation, but the citizens need to be educated about the new legislation. The individuals who you think do not pay attention, truly pay attention, as I said before in the earlier presentation, consequences do matter, and individuals understand consequences, maybe not on the same level you and I understand consequences, maybe the education system is bad, but people do clearly understand consequences, and if the if if the the direction, the trajectory, the cooperation, the fact that this is a system of justice is explained to people, then there will be individuals, not all individuals, because there's some people who are going to commit crimes no matter what. They're going to take a chance. It's like the stock market. They're going to take a risk and they're going to play it out to the end, and then whatever the consequences are, they're willing to accept. And we've got to make sure that they do accept and get those consequences just like we do when we invest in certain relationships or invest in homes or monetary relationships. They have to understand that. 
But it has to be broadcast to the public that this legislation exists, that these kind of prosecutors exist who are determined, undeterred, unafraid, and that judges in this particular system are not willing to hear excuses after cases are put together in this particular manner. So it is better for you to accept the options, the intervention, the social interventions, the social engagements, the education. It is better for you to accept that route than this route because it is a calculus. It's a cost-benefit analysis. There was a, a famous rapper, Tupac, said the reason why so many individuals commit crime because 25 of life never crossed their mind. They don't believe even if I commit this, that 25, that doesn't even cross my mind because even if I'm caught, that's never going to happen. They have to believe that's going to happen because that's the deterrent. And without the real thought of real consequences, all of us, no human being is innately to the core, a good person, trust me. If you are extremely hungry and you go in the store and there's no consequences for you picking up a sandwich and eating it, they don't call that theft, and you're hungry, you're going to eat it. What keeps you from eating that or going to get money another way is the fact that there are consequences for you picking up something that doesn't belong to you and taking it out. So we all understand consequences. That's why we have laws, because none of us are innately good. I don't care who you are sitting out there today. I know Dr. Davis thinks he's an angel, but even he, even he had major, no, I'm just, he had flaws like the rest of us. So I do believe, I, I, I truly believe the education that we're getting on how prosecution works is important because television have tainted our view or our understanding because they solve crimes within an hour and people confess half an hour, okay, considering commercials, and people confess, right? And people tell on other people despite the threat to them, but that's not how it worked. However, once it is all put together correctly, and once this legislation, which is excellent, because legislation on paper always look good. It's the implementation of that legislation that makes it different, not just the legislation, because that really doesn't mean anything. It's like your significant other telling you they love you and then domestically abusing you. Don't mean anything, right? Even though on paper you're married to them. So the system has got to work together. And, and no one gets a pass, not prosecutors. They're good, but they can be better. Not police officers. They've got to know in detail how to put a case together, a strong case together, exactly what the prosecutor needs to prosecute that case. They've got to work at it as hard as she does. And the public has to know, right? Because you can't charge in a legal system what you feel you have to charge what you can prove. I may absolutely believe that that little scroungy bastard did it. I may have some intuition. I may have said a prayer last night, and it came to me by divine intervention that he's guilty. But none of that will work because now the prosecutor has to do the meticulous work of putting, that evidence, or putting the puzzle together and presenting it in a way where everybody can say, yeah, you know what? They did this. And then the judges had the adequate, now I'm not saying draconian sentencing, I'm not saying send every black person to jail for minor violations, but proportional to the crime, the judges have to say, listen, I, I really don't need, if, if, if the prosecutor have presented a case together to say that you've committed this brutal act, I really don't need to hear about any mitigation because whatever rehabilitation, whatever will make you a better person is gonna make you a better person while you're sitting in jail. You feel me? I really don't need intervention at this point after you committed this brutal crime because if reading a book or reading the Bible, the Koran, the Torah is going to make you a better person, I'm going to give you some extra time to be alone with yourself to make a change in your life. I'll never forget, and I'll shut down with this, a case that I worked on where a gentleman was about to be sentenced to 25 to life. And he came before the court at the pre-sentence investigation with mitigation clauses about how he had changed his life. He said, Your Honor, I have absolutely unequivocally found God. I know the error of my ways. I had a difficult childhood, but I know the error and the justice. That is so beautiful. And you know what? I need you to go into the prison for the next 25 years and help people come to the same moment that you came to. You are gonna be part of the justice system for the next 25 years and an advocate for God. 
So today we are helping you with both of the issues you brought before the court, your conviction and your ability to become a prophet and recruit people to Jesus Christ. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Powers, thank you for never failing to offer such illuminations and with laughter, although your words are so poignant. Thank, thank you. Thank you. You really would be uh, akin to being a scholar of that classical school, as Cesar Beccaria would say, yeah, yeah, from the grave. Because Thank you're you. talking certainty, <laughs> celerity, and severity. And perhaps that is the way to go. But those persons who are anti-filling up the prison industrial complexes would say, put the brakes on that. Until, so, until they become a victim. So true. All right. All righty. At this juncture, we'd like to entertain some questions. And we see there's somebody at the mic. So. Good afternoon. Good evening at this point. Yeah. Well, it's good evening. An hour. Uh, so Sorry. this is for Alethea and Miss Llewellyn. Is uh, whether there's a gap between the communication and of the JCF and the DPP's office. So what I'd like to know is what, from your perspective, is the gap that is there for us to be able to successfully prosecute uh, violent criminal gangs so that we can have that uh, reduce the level of gang violence that are in many of these communities. We've seen some attempts that have taken place. <laughs> um, some have been successful, some not quite so successful. Um, so just from your perspective, what it is that is needed to kind of bridge that gap to have more successful prosecutions in that area? But um, um, I think that the, the Anti-Gang Act, as it's popularly known as, is still a fairly new piece of legislation. Um, I believe we're in our third trial now, so we still have a lot of lessons to learn. Um, I think the first trial, I think it was Carlington Godfrey, right, it taught us a lot of lessons, particularly in relation to the need to have corroborative evidence. And so I don't, I don't know that it is a gap, really. I think that as we go forward and as we learn more, as we learn from the judges as to their interpretation of certain things and to what they expect, it will obviously improve the way we do things and result in more successes. So I know we have a big one now, so we are awaiting you know, what happens and the lessons that can be learned from it. I have to be very careful in what I say. For your information, the office of the DPP has had an anti-gang unit for the last maybe three or four years. When we realized that although we had the legislation, it was not being used in the way it ended, we decided to put together this unit so that we could work closely with CTOC, who is the prime mover of investigations of gang matters. So, and that has gone well. We have both grown together. We have been pioneers. And both Deputy Commissioner Fitzbailey and I have had the will not to give up irrespective of the slings and arrows coming from the uninformed com com commentators. Because let me make it quite clear. Whether you're in America, England, Canada, or Jamaica, it takes a lot of patience and time to investigate a gang case. As I said, this is not a cartoon. And it is a dangerous activity for the investigators. It is even more dangerous for the cooperating witnesses that you will find who
on the ground. <laughs> Let me assure you that notwithstanding what you may have heard elsewhere, there is a lot of very, very hard donkey work, as in going into the night, the wee hours of the morning, that has gone into the preparation of the gang cases. And it is so detailed that after Carlington Godfrey et al. Well, I can say this now. That I indicated to my team and to the police that if we can even get supportive evidence of even the color toilet paper that the accused use, try to get it. So we have tried our best to get. Corroboration is not really necessary, but supporting evidence is desirable because you would appreciate that if you are going to be using as your main witnesses, cooperating witnesses who are former gang members, and I believe the anti-gang legislation anticipates that in terms of how it is framed. So if you're going to be using somebody who, as we said, come from river bottom to tell you about the sharks down there, usually they are going to, there's going to be a credibility issue. Now, what we have also discovered and what we have to be careful about too, I heard my learned colleague here talking about the judges coming from you know, a place before they became judges. Well, I am here to tell you that to my certain knowledge, there is no judge that is on the bench now who has ever in their former life as a prosecutor prosecuted a gang case. Because by virtue of the fact that the gang legislation was promulgated within the last five years. So it's a fact. So the thing is that they are coming as judges to assess a matter, first of all, interpret new legislation, and secondly, to hold the prosecution to the standard of proof, which is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, what the police used to do, why I had to form the gang unit and to work very closely with them, is to focus on the predicate offenses. So, for example, if a criminal organization or somebody, A, who is a member of a criminal organization, facilitates, which is one of the offenses, a murder, the easier way would be just to, if you have the evidence of the witnesses, you just prosecute the murder. But what we realized that in order, as my friend here was saying, to make a dent in the psychology of gangs, it was important that we really seek to utilize the legislation. Now, it would appear to us that it is almost as if you are being asked to also prove the predicate. That is how high the standard would appear to be. Now, as to the legal issue there, as usual, we will have to wait until one of the matters go to the Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal can weigh in on it, as they do in so many other areas of the law. But we cannot wait for that. Both the police and the prosecuting authority have to, once we have the evidence and the material, we cannot wait to make a perfect case. There is no perfect case. May I repeat that? There is no perfect case. Whether it is a man bite dog or dog biting a man, wounding, <laughs> rape, kidnapping, there is no perfect case. You know why? Because there is no perfect investigator. Because they are made up of human beings. There is no perfect prosecutor. There is no perfect judge. There is no perfect defense counsel. All righty. Good.
Thank you. <laughs> I believe that we have actually, we have heard you. We're all humans and we're all fallible. You've got the next question, ma'am, and then you've got the next question. And the final question will be from the gentleman who's to my left. Go for it. Say, Madam DPP, I love when you come to one of these things because you bring us down to earth, which is where we need to be. I have I'm two a very questions. Tired woman, I can assure you. Very <laughs> well, tired. you you fooled us because you look full of energy, <laughs> and we're grateful for it. Thank um, you. I have two questions. Over the past two days, one of the things that has come up repeatedly is the need for us to strengthen our unexplained wealth um, legislation, that that would contribute a great deal to resolving some of the crime problems we have which lead to violence. And I noted Ms. Tomlinson said in her presentation that that's part of the anti-gang legislation. So it's two questions really. Can, somewhat, can that provision be used outside of a gang situation, A, and B, what are the other um, things that we need to do to get that kind of legislation, whether it's in place or stronger or to move towards what, as I mentioned, this consensus would help us to, to get to the roots of crime. And then a question for you, DPP, which is another thing that we talked about quite a bit yesterday, and I wish you had been here, is especially from where you are, this distinction that's being made between crime and violence, this, what we, what we called yesterday, a discursive shift. Just would love to know where, how you see that, if you do see that there is a distinction to be made, and how that distinction would then play out in the work that you're doing. Yeah, okay, for the unexplained wealth question. So there, we do not currently have legislation concerning like unexplained wealth orders. However, the provision I mentioned as in the Anti-Gang Act, there is a similar provision in the Proceeds of Crime Act, but it really only can be utilized after a person is convicted. So after a person is convicted of a certain category of offense, um, and we, the DPP or the Assets Recovery Agency can make an application for what is known as a pecuniary penalty order. So it's really an order for the person to pay a particular sum of money to the state and that sum is the representation of the benefit the person received from their criminal lifestyle. And one of the assumptions that the court is entitled to make in determining that benefit is that all expenditure made by the defendant, because remember he's now convicted, came from funds that he got from his criminal conduct, and all assets that he has, that he has obtained, I believe it's a period of 10 years before the offense was committed, came from his criminal conduct. And those are assumptions the court is entitled to make and the burden is on the defendant to rebut those assumptions to say, no judge, look, I got it from that, my legitimate income, this is the evidence, etc. So we do have that in the Proceeds of Crime Act, which has been a very useful tool. We have had successes in terms of getting pecuniary penalty orders against persons. Crime and violence. Hmm. Well, perhaps one could say that violence in, in the context of the fact that we are so seeing so much manifestation of what I call antisocial behavior, which seems to draw first for violence to solve conflict. Perhaps if that is the universal set, then within that, a, it, an, of, well, an action becomes a crime when something illegal is done with intention to do a particular act. So you will have crime where there's no violence in it, but it's still a crime. And you will have elements of violence where it does not rise to the threshold of, of a crime, depending on the situation, unless there has been an offense against the person committed. There may have been talk or a threat 
but there was no actual crime committed. Now, I, I must confess that I and my officers, I have never really heard any of us, because perhaps because we are in the trenches, this sounds like a discourse between academics, <laughs> with the greatest of respect. In our neck of the woods, it's just about, because let's face it, when we went to Westmoreland, we are going with nearly 200 cases. 200 cases, um, a, two significant um, um, criminal matters would be murder or lottery scam matters. So lottery scam matters, you don't have any violence, but you still have crimes being committed. And crimes being committed, although without violence, but eventually, according to police investigators, it can lead to eventual murder because there's conflict over lead sheets and their customers. And then I understand that there is an investment made once they have a certain amount of money. Some people, just like how most of us, if we have the money, we invest in land, they invest in guns. So it can lead to violence, but um, the lottery scam, the original activity, was the crime. For us, in terms of murders, wounding with intent, any offense against a person, usually violence is involved. Look at this young girl um, in terms of the matter I prosecuted, the nine-year-old. There was severe violence that was done to this child. And if you saw the accused, a most handsome, um, very calm, but he's 17 now. You know, and they were neighbors, they grew up together. And yet still that sort of violence was done. So you have, what is it now, social, psychological factors that perhaps may be causing antisocial behavior. But I'll be frank with you, Dr. Thurban, in our neck of the woods, that's an academic discussion, which we do not, we don't feel obliged to indulge in. We don't have the time for it given the type of work that we do. And in the final analysis, we find that the average victim and their relatives, they don't really care. Because whether it is crime or violence, or crime and violence, it affects them in a toxic and negative way. And they want to see their concerns validated. And they want to see, you know, that same case. When we got the conviction in that case, because of course you would realize that I have to prove buggery and rape without the benefit of a witness to those activities. So what we had to do is use circumstantial evidence by virtue of the doctor's evidence, the expert on DNA, and the positioning of the body to show that clearly, as the doctor said, only an aroused penis could have caused the lacerations to the vagina and the three lacerations to the anus, then you had the semen. So what is the irresistible inference to be drawn that these activities took place? Now, can I tell you, for a prosecutor, we'll be talking about these things over a meal. You're not even tasting the meal. You're concentrating on your case. You can only relax after the case is complete. So this is why a discourse... Between, about I don't know how it is for a police officer crime and violence that is not a that is not a discussion that we would have. Let me just let me just very very quickly say violence though for example if someone comes in here and attack Dr Ortiz and the police use violence to stop them that is violence but it's not a crime. Precise. So okay. violence could be used in the concept of self-defense self -defense. for us or someone else, and that is violence. So I did understand the concept when I arrived and we began to discuss oh, that, I that see. there is violence that is not criminal activity. In fact, there's some violence that I would reasonably expect if somebody tried to do something to me and the police had to intervene, or if I had at least one friend in the room who tried to help me and protect me and use violence against the attacker. So I do understand that in that concept was beyond an academic discussion, because you wouldn't charge a police officer with violence in defense of Dr. Ortiz. Well, no, because then we are called upon as the office of the DPP to do what we call rulings. So we will get a file from the investigative authority or INDICOM, to, and we look at it to see whether 
there was a viable prosecution. If on what would be the Crown's case, self-defense clearly arises, then we would recommend that nobody be charged for any offense because there would be no um, basis for prosecution. So um, I'm so I sorry. I have got to stop and go to those two persons who have been waiting patiently. But we thank you both uh, for the response and the rebuttaled rebuttal in some ways. Um, they're all edifying, and I can see that the audience is being contemplative. So we've done our jobs. I'm your next. Yes, I'm going to just be quick. But I hear a contradiction in the discussion so far. So Dr. Powers, you were talking about consequences and consequences being important, uh, but somehow corrections not being important. I hear the call for more powerful legislation to deal with gangs to deal with uh, what's happening with the proceeds of crime and um, lottery scamming. When we are effective, where do these people go? How do we actually treat with that problem? And I see a continuous disinvestment in our correctional institution. I see a discussion like this and the correctional institution uh, is not represented. How do we actually solve this problem? So we are saying we want to have both custodial and non-custodial uh, sentences. We want to say we want stronger communities. I see 44% recidivism. People going in the institutions, in my interview with them in 2018, are saying we're going back to the communities we're coming from. So those people who went in the institution, who have access to the phones, who are still violence producers, are in those institutions. How do we solve this problem? Well, it's funny. I, last week I was in St. Kitts taking part in a, a program on prison reform. And I gave the prosecutor's perspective. We all know that sentencing um, for a judge is one of the most difficult um, activities. And they have to balance the factors of punishment, deterrence, retribution, and rehabilitation. Now, when somebody is incarcerated, given a term of years, that is them commencing to pay their debt to society. But... As was stated there, and I do believe it, if sufficient is not done when they are in the correction institution in terms of rehabilitation and equipping them to be reintegrated into the society, then unwittingly when they go back into the community, they may not be psychologically um, prepared sufficiently because if the community breeds violence or it accommodates criminality, then they are at risk in terms of recidivism. But at the same time, they, there still has to be enough resources placed on them to make a good attempt to equip them to reintegrate. Because if this is not done, as was stated at the forum, they will unwittingly become a conduit to a public health emergency because they'll become a toxic force and they'll become a force for possible violence or to repeat a repeat of it. And I have seen them, you know. So it's, it's, it's a constant, um, it's a policy issue because the political class who have the responsibility for framing policy are aware that within the Caribbean context, the cry will be, but look how much money we need for education. Look what we need for hospitals. And you are spending your money on criminals? No. So it's a balance that the, the policy makers also have to have, but notwithstanding that pull by their constituents. Because long term, you will recognize if sufficient rehabilitation is not there. Because remember, them spending 20 years or 25 years, that is a debt to society but they have to come back out. So it is part and parcel, I think, of the governance structure and the public interest that sufficient resources be placed to make sure that they are able to reintegrate successfully. And I wouldn't have any problem with a new facility being built that will make sure that no phones, 
No phones. No, you laugh. I have prosecuted a case. I, I prosecuted a case a few, several years ago, a six-count murder case. And this accused man, I think he was a psychopath. And the prison authorities told me, Miss Llewellyn, we have to put him near a jammer. He became violent in court, even towards me. Not that I was intimidated. My two CPOs were right there. <laughs> right? But they had to put him in a position because he was known. And the prison authorities told me this to have access to, to phones. So you can't have a situation where as a prosecutor or you have witnesses, next thing they are going to make a call. You know, you would be at risk. So I don't I wouldn't have a problem if the policymakers came up and said that in the public interest, we have put together some funds to build a new facility which will be so high security that you will have CCTV everywhere to watch everybody and that phones will not be able to work there because that too is an idea and by the way let me tell you when you when you talk to persons in law enforcement or prosecution in other caribbean countries let me tell you something jamaica is a trendsetter you know they come to jamaica to look to see what we are doing in terms of corrections, to look to see what we are doing in terms of our anti-gang efforts. And that is why I, I, I try not to be detained by naysayers, because I know in terms of certainly the Caribbean, we are the trendsetters in terms of some of our reforms. The only th it's not shocking, not at all. Because they look to us in respect of what we are doing in terms of our... And the whole Caribbean is watching our efforts in terms of the fact that we are doing these cases. Because what you all don't understand, I tell you, it's not a cartoon. Whether it's in America, Italy, Europe, wherever, Latin America, to put together a gang case, to investigate it and prosecute it, is not an easy feat. Isn't that so? That's absolutely so. The only right. the only thing I would say is that with the judges, you say the judges have never prosecuted a gang case, but they can talk to other judges because in the United States they have RICO, Racketeering Influence Organized Crime Act, and for the first time that act came into existence, there was a judge that had to convict people or look at that case for the first time. So while they may nev not have <laughs> prosecuted a case or had to judge such a case, they are very educated people, and I want to oh, give yes. them credit oh, yes. for that oh, so yes. they can talk to other people. They don't have to be fearful of the new gang law in order to deliver justice. Thank you. Yes. All right. Okay. We've got one last question, and I'd like for the question to be a 30-second question, and I'd like the response to be no more than one minute, because we are going to finish on time. Thank you, sir. Shorter than that. But, um, two things. I know we talk about um, prevention and reduction. Could you talk to me a little bit about um, capital punishment and talk to me a little bit about um, using um, acts of terrorism? Because first, I'm saying that there's certain crime and violence that we need to look at. They are, they should, it should be an act of terrorism and not the, similar, uh, not the simple crime and violence. You know, sir, I love the game of cricket. And I'm going to assume the guise of a master batsman batting at number three. I've read the line of your delivery. You have tried to bowl both a googly and a pace bowler at the same time. And I'm going to leave that one alone. Thank you. Not at all. Not in the slips. Not... Leg before. Excellent. Very correct. Excellent. Leaving it alone. I love it. Okay. Thank you. Thank all of you so very much um, for the insights that you've provided. The laughter, again, laughter is good for the soul. Thank you, audience, for staying with us this entire day. I trust that um, we are leaving you contemplative and feeling a sense of urgency to act.
because we don't just want to talk about these issues, we need to see some results. And so in your communities, perhaps you can start to organize, you can empower people to speak up and speak truths and not dance around and also live in the reality that the director Lewin just talked about, that we're not living in a television show, that's why they've got producers and directors for that, we're living in real life and real time and we've got a crisis on our hands that we must solve. Pleasant good afternoon. I would remiss if I did not ask you all to stand to your feet and applause this Dr. Ronaldo for a fantastic job that he's done for us. Thank you. Okay, so. So our next speaker, Diana Thornburn, she's Director of Research for the Caribbean Policy Research Institute, Dr. Thornburn. Okay, I'm sure you're wondering why am I here and why are you still here because it's time to leave. Um, Reynaldo has this, as probably many of you here know, Reynaldo has this remarkable ability to get people to do things for him. And you find yourself doing these things and you're like, how did I get here? So this is why I'm here because he has convinced me to try and give some kind of a wrap up. And I'm gonna do it quickly because I think what has come out of these two days is actually quite clear. And you know, you might also wondering why am I here, not just because Reynaldo convinced me, but this is really good, uh, good networking for me as Capri's director of research. This, an occasion like this, these two days, this is how knowledge is produced. This is how we learn when we hear from the people who are on the ground who are in the trenches, in the field, whose work it is to be thinking about these things as their ongoing daily activity. And we don't do this often enough. Um, and we certainly haven't done it for two years. And it was time for us to come together to really get an understanding of where we are now, because if we don't know where we are, we're not going to know where we're going. And it's occasions like this that allow us to avoid being uninformed commentators. <laughs> <laughs> and to look at the problems that we study entire, not from entirely cerebral approach and to come down from what somebody said yesterday from the Eiffel Tower to get a better understanding of where we are, where we're going. So having said that, I'd like to propose that these two days have brought about what I would like to think of as five pillars, five areas that all of us who work in the space of Violence prevention, violence reduction, crime reduction, crime prevention can, co can concentrate our efforts on as we go forward in the immediate future and the work that each of us do in each of our spaces. I think there's two issues of consensus. One is the uncomfortable fact that all of us benefit from this violence that we claim to hate in the sense that much of the, of the crime that fuels the violence that we claim to hate benefits us directly or indirectly, whether as a society, as a business, or as individuals. I think we really have to come to terms and sit with that 
and understand that there's going to be a trade-off. You know, um, the, somebody mentioned yesterday about the president of the Montego Bay Chamber of Commerce lamenting when someone from Montego Bay was taken out of circulation because of the impact that would have on the local economy. These are some of the, that's one of the things I think we need to get a better grip on and more, more truth with ourselves about that. And then kind of um, leading on from that is another matter of consensus, which is uh, strengthening legislation towards source of funds and unexplained wealth beyond POCA, beyond the Anti-Gang Act, that can be used by investigators not only after someone is convicted that they're able to carry out these investigations, but that that kind of a process, which obtains in many other countries, so it's not, a, it's not unusual, it wouldn't be unusual for Jamaica to do that, for us to move towards that. And you know, some of the work that Capri has done over the years in this space, we've heard a lot that there are, is a lot of politics against that kind of legislation. And again, some of the uncomfortable things that we probably need to be confronting with more um, clarity and bravery than we have to this point. Uh, so that's two. First, is one and two, pillars one and two. I would say two of the other pillars relate to the transnational aspects of our crime and violence problem. We like to think that mon some, of, some or much, depending on where you sit, of the issues are out of our control because they take place outside, so we're victims, and all these things that happen here is because of the terrible people somewhere else, and it's not our problem. And I think that these two days have helped us to clarify what our transnational issues really are. Uh, one of them, I think, is quite straightforward. And again, if we're one of the areas where we can think about focusing our efforts, which is the seemingly ad hoc, but so ad hoc, so frequent that there we can almost start to think them as structural relationships between violent gangs, the smaller violent gangs, and their overseas affiliates, contacts, um, outposts, if you want to have them, that are providing resources that fuel that. Um, you know, that's not as simple as straight investigative efforts. There are jurisdictional issues, territorial issues involved in that, and also just straight intelligence. Information is hard to gather and to put into a, into a, a frame that can be used to move forward with. But I think that is an area that needs more understanding, more work. And then the other is with the current dynamics of the structure of the drug trade and organized crime. Too many of us, you know, I'd like to think are, are uninformed, uninformed when we think about the traditional narrative of the international cocaine trade fuels violent crime or, va or the violent gangs and the crime that they commit. And while there is a transnational aspect to gang violence, it's not that traditional, oh, the cocaine comes from Colombia and the violent gangs here control it and that's what fuels our violence and it's not our problem, it's not our fault. Yes, there is a, there is a connection between our violent gangs and the transnational drug trade, but it's far more, it's evolved to far more than that um, at both the outside level and at the inside level. And the real transnational trade that is an issue to our violence problem is the marijuana for guns trade. That is where the real problem lies. Not, not so much in the international cocaine uh, trade um, that is involving players that avoid violence, that eschew violence, that don't want to have anything to do with, as, as Dolan, uh, I don't remember who it was who put it, but the, the skinny jeans and tattooed um, people who uh, would cause them more problems and help their business along. And then finally, the fifth pillar I think that we should be focusing our efforts on is the issue itself of violence and keeping firmly in my mind DPP's point that this is an academic discussion that has no bearing on the actual work on the ground. I still think that there is work for us to do on better understanding our violence problem. You know, we can agree that Violence is at a sustained high while crime is trending down. That's a fact. The data tells us that. Um, and we can also understand that in many instances, 
much of the motive, many of the motivators are val of violence are, or sorry, while many of the motivators of violence may be different from the motivations for criminal behavior, there is a great deal of criminal behavior that fuels violence, right? So they, you can't entirely separate them. But I think there is still work for us to do on understanding the violence. And I think what came out of these two days with all the pan different panels was that we lack a consensus on what are the root causes of violence. So is it rational homicidal behavior that requires greater resources towards deterrence and uh, auxiliary police force to strengthen the street? the state's monopoly on violence? Is it antisocial behavior? So should we be training more police personnel in social work? As the commissioner told us, he was his, his police officers are now social workers. Is that, is that the direction we should be heading? Or recruiting more social workers into the JCF? Um, is it systemic education and mental health issues? Um, as a good portion of our civil society and donor partners are putting their resources behind, that seems to be their um, understanding of what the, the root cause is. Um, and I don't think we came, well, we certainly didn't come to a conclusion of what that is, but we have to, because the lack of a consensus understanding of what the root causes are is that all of us who are in the business of trying to reduce it are working towards different goals. And oftentimes, and it wasn't said, but it was implied, we're working at cross purposes with each other. And that to me is one of the, you know, maybe an academic discussion, but I think it also has practical and policy implications for the work we're doing in this space, is having a better understanding of what that is now in Jamaica and how we work with that understanding so that we're all working together. You know, one of the things that has really struck me about all this interaction with Reynaldo towards preparing this, you know, he's coming to this from a global perspective. He's working on these issues in other countries and he has said to me so many times, Dana, Jamaica can fix his problems. Your problems are small compared to some of the other countries that he's working in. We're a small enough country and we understand our problems well enough that we actually have the potential, there's a potential for change here. And I think we should not lose sight of it. Our problems are not unresolvable. Many of our problems are what I like to call unresolved, solvable problems. But we need to do the work and we need to do it in a coordinated way and we need to do it together working towards one common goal. So this might be a good time to tell you we have one more panel. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so here we are. Hopefully this is not the end of this discussion and more like a beginning. Um, I first like to thank a number of key individuals and institutions. Without their support, this would not be possible. Clearly, the U.S. Embassy, the Fulbright Commission, the Institute of Criminal Justice and Security Studies, Black Cops Against Police Brutality, the Dr. Muhammad Experience, and the Powers Consulting Group. Individually, there are a number of key individuals in Jamaica who have definitely assisted me in many discussions, disagreements, heated arguments in Patois that I'm still trying to learn. Um, <laughs> And that's Dr. Anthony Harriet, Mr. Horace Levy, Dr. Nadia Figueroa, Nicola Sacho, and then there are three individuals, and obviously Diana Thornburn, three individuals that without their help, this will not be possible. That's clearly Shamoy Kane, she's not here right now at this moment, Nikita um, Robinson, and lastly, Joanna Callan. Without their support, this will not be possible. So I was trying to think, how do I share last remarks or closing a moment? First and foremost, I want to thank the Jamaican people for allowing me to come into your house and share honest conversations about the fears, the confusion, the hurt. So Jamaica is the sixth country that I come to studying the same thing, the sixth country. So I'd like to share that there are many issues here that are not unique to Jamaica. It is always much easier to focus on the negative than to also acknowledge the positive. And that's really hard to do when you're bleeding. But that's, that's very much needed. I hope that this event has served to give rich information to de-clarify 
or to more like put into vision some information that's going to help people, motivate people to keep on fighting. But I'm not going to be idealistic here. I'm going to be realistic. There's a huge difference. Is this turnable? In my opinion, yes. Is it going to be easy? No, it's not. I want to make that very clear. That said, I think that there are tough roads ahead, given global patterns that I see, from which Jamaica is not unique, and I'm speaking to you from the United States of America, as you very well know, the saying goes that when the United States has a cold, the Caribbean has pneumonia. So we got to wake up to that reality, especially as it pertains to gun violence. There was a question asked this morning as to documented data as to guns exiting the U.S. and where they're going. That question went unanswered. That said, um, there are many, many thoughts, confusions that I still have to ponder and think about, but I want to thank you for taking two days out of your time. And most importantly, I do believe and strongly have faith in the collective humanity to fix our problems in the United States and in Jamaica, and for that, I thank you.